So good morning, everyone. Welcome to day four of the November council meeting. We are on schedule. And before we get started, uh, I will turn to Executive Director Merrick Burden for any announcements. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and council members, and members of the public. Um, like you said this morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, we're, we're on, on schedule, doing quite well. Um, thank you all for agreeing to stay a little bit later last night for our closed session. I think that was very helpful. Um, today, we do have a full um, agenda, um, starting off with coastal pelagic species, going through some administrative matters, and ending the day on groundfish. Um, quite a few things on your agenda this morning. Um, I'd be happy to take any uh, questions or comments, Mr. Chairman. Otherwise, I would encourage us to get right into business, uh, starting off with Mr. Kerry Griffin. Well, I don't see any hands, so we will get started directly uh, with CPS matters, uh, agenda item I-1, and Kerry Griffin, let's get started. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Burden. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is agenda item I-1, preliminary review, review of new exempted fishing permits for 2022. Uh, in your advanced briefing book materials, there are three proposals for uh, EFPs for the next calendar year. Uh, these are proposals that you've seen before. Um, and when we have repeat proposals, we uh, typically don't include uh, presentations on those to the council. Um, so you're not going to hear um, any detailed description um, of those proposals. But you do have supplemental reports from both the CPS management team and the CPS advisory sub panel. Um, the uh, action today is to adopt these preliminary EFP proposals for public review. Um, the three are uh, attachment one in the advanced briefing book is from the California Wet Fish Producers Association. That's for biological sampling in California. Attachment two is also from the CWPA, and that is for um, point sets for the aerial survey component um, or the aerial survey. I guess it's not a component. It's uh, it's independent survey. And then attachment three is from the West Coast Pelagic Conservation Group um, for uh, biological sampling, and uh, that's to accompany the NOAA Acoustic Trawl Survey. Um, after this overview, we'll hear the two reports from the CPSMT and the CPSAS, and then public comment, um, if there is any. And then again, the council action is to adopt the preliminary EFPs for public review, uh, and then final action would be in April 2020, 2022. And that concludes my overview. All right, thank you very much, Carrie. Are there any questions of uh, council on Carrie's overview? And not seeing any hands, we'll go to our reports. Uh, Kirk Lynn will provide the report for the CPS management team. Welcome, Kirk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, council members. I'll be reading from uh, supplemental CPSMT Report 1. The Coastal Plastic Species Management Team reviewed three notices of intent to reapply for exempted fishing permits for 2022, two from the California Wet Fish Producers Association and one from the West Coast Pelagic Conservation Group. Both parties intend to reapply for exemptions from any potential restrictions on directed fishing for Pacific sardine during the 2022-2023 sardine fishing season. The CPSMT recognizes the value of this work and endorses adopting the three AFPs for public review. All right, thank you, Kirk. Any questions for the management team? Thank you, uh, thank you, Kirk. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from the CPS advisory subpanel, Mr. David Crabb. Welcome, David. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, council members, and also uh, congratulations to Executive, Executive Director Merrick Burden. I haven't had a chance to uh, congratulate him. So I'll be reading from um, the CPS AS report, uh, agenda item I1A, the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel Report on Preliminary Review of New 2022 Exempted Fishing Permits. The Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel 
discuss three notices of intent to reapply for exempted fishing permits for 2022. Two from the California Wet Fish Producers Association, agenda item I-1, attachment one, and agenda item I-1, attachment two, and one from the West Coast Pelagic Conservation Group, agenda item I-1, attachment three. All collaborative projects intend to address the continuing need for data to assess CPS biomass inshore of current National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administrative Acoustic Trawl Method Surveys. Both the WCP and CWPA are working collaboratively with the Southwest Fishery Science Center in an effort to improve survey data collection that will lead to better informed stock assessments and fishery management. The CPSAS urges the Council to adopt these EFP proposals for public review with final approval scheduled for April 2022. And that concludes our report. Thank you very much, David. Uh, are there any questions of the AS on their report? All right, I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, David. Uh, we have, that concludes uh, the reports that we have and will take us to public comment. Uh, the last I looked, there were two public comment cards. We'll hear uh, first from Diane Pleshner Steele and then followed by uh, Jeff Shester. So, Diane, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, thanks. Thank you very much. And, and, and uh, thank you, uh, council members, for considering uh, our renewal requests for both. Uh, I uh, uh, wanted to explain that we are. We're a work in progress on our 2021, and we don't have the age data yet, but we will be submitting uh, revised, you know, uh, EFP requests with, with the updated data in, in April. Um, also, just wanted to kind of highlight on our request for our directed, or I guess you'd call it uh, biological sampling EFP. We were encouraged and strongly encouraged by the reviewers to submit an SK grant proposal. And so we're working with Juan, Juan Zwolinski that, uh, uh, from, from the Southwest Fishery Science Center to take a look at sardines, both in Monterey and the Southern California Bight, throughout the entire year. And, and we're going to try and get, get to uh, some answers on stock separation between northern and southern sardine stocks. So uh, I, I, we're really excited about this proposal and it's gonna be hinging on our ability to have uh, continued access to sardine to collect biological sampling. And then as far as the EFP for uh, point sets, we're still uh, needing to do some more work in Monterey, but we also need the 100 ton set in Southern California. So we uh, hope to have some, some more evidence for you in, in April. And we need to keep continue. We just need to continue doing, doing that work as well to, to validate the, the aerial survey uh, estimates. And um, so if you, if you have any questions, be happy to answer them. But that, I just wanted to kind of give you the heads up that we're still work in progress this year and we need to continue next year. So we appreciate your uh, support for these, these two EFPs. All right, thank you very much, Diane, for your public comment. Are there any questions of Diane who's the applicant for some of these uh, EFP renewals. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Diane. Thank you. Uh, we'll next hear from Jeff Shester of Oceana. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, members of the council. This is Jeff Shester representing Oceana. Um, we, uh, we wanted to start by uh, supporting the uh, West Coast Pelagic Conservation Group's uh, EFP proposal. Uh, this will help continue uh, the acoustic uh, trawl methodology transects into nearshore areas to help improve survey estimates. And we appreciate the, 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 the low uh, limits of 10 metric tons in terms of the cap on potential um, sardine mortality as a result of the EFP. Um, we are 
extremely concerned, as, as you're well aware, of the, the low uh, population status of uh, the, the Pacific sardine stock off of the West Coast. Um, the, the population is extremely low and has uh, essentially collapsed. Um, last time there was a collapse, it took many, many years, uh, and there was continued low levels of fishing that did con uh, continue to delay the recovery of the sardine. And we are very concerned that removals on the order of even hundreds of tons uh, can uh, and will come at the cost of, of slowing the rebuilding process for this important uh, coastal pelagic species. Uh, therefore, we, we do strongly uh, continue to oppose the, the two um, EFPs put forward by uh, CWPA. Um, in particular, the biological sampling, uh, we're aware that uh, the actual biological samples needed are uh, you know, a few hundred fish in fact, um, not uh, hundreds of, of metric tons. And that uh, I think it's important to, to clarify that the, the hundreds of metric tons that are being proposed, I believe it's 520, are being used solely for the purpose of, of paying fishermen to, to go commercial fishing and sell their catch to, to pay for the, that research. So um, if there's a way to collect those biological samples, for example, through uh, other methods, um, that is extremely important, particularly as the data sets and the the, um, the 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 time series of those biological samples uh, we heard from the SSC uh, at the at the last specs does not play a major role in getting better estimates of sardine biomass. So while it's always great to have more science, if that science comes at the cost of harming an overfished species and its ability to recover, uh, we don't believe the value of the information is is worth that cost. Um, uh, we also are uh, concerned about the, um, the, the, the level of take in the aerial survey EFPs. Um, and we would much rather see the, the industry focus its, its research efforts on improving nearshore biomass efforts by continuing the acoustic trawl surveys rather than uh, through the aerial surveys, which uh, as, as we've seen, uh, cannot be directly added uh, uh, because there's, there's overlap and, and it's essentially in, in apples and oranges cannot be added to the, the ATM estimates directly. And so it, you know, it, it sort of gives you a qualitative uh, only sort of approach. And again, um, to, to remove uh, and, and harvest uh, you know, hundreds of tons of sardines uh, for that purpose, we just do not, again, see the value of information. If the sardine population was healthy, we would absolutely have no problem with this. We are, we are always supportive of, of more science. Um, but when that science, again, comes at the cost of, of uh, harming this, the, the resource, uh, when it's in its extremely vulnerable state that it's in, um, it, it, we, we just don't believe that it's worth it. So we, we urge the council either to, to, um, to, to urge um, strong changes to these EFPs or oppose them in their current form. Uh, but the, the main concern is the high level of take in the, the hundreds of tons um, of, of sardines at a time when the, the population just cannot, um, uh, cannot support that. Uh, thank you very much and would be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Jeff. Any questions of Jeff Shester? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, that concludes public comment and takes us to our council action, which is there on the screen. So I will look for a hand to either commence discussion or to bring forward a motion upon which discussion may be had. Brianna Brady, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think I can just offer a few thoughts by first expressing my appreciation to Diane Pleschner Steele of CWPA and also my go from the Pacific Northwest, along with the fishermen and the Southwest Fisheries Science Center for all their time spent in improving the data sources for sardine management. These EFPs will continue to provide data to help inform the status of Pacific sardine and CDFW is supportive of these exempted fishing permits and we think they should be adopted for public review. Um, thanks. Thank you, Brianna. Further uh, discussion on the matter before us?
And if there's no further discussion, uh, a, a motion would be in order and we can have further discussion then. Brianna Brady. Um, thank you. I uh, have a motion, but I haven't sent it to anybody. Um, if you want me to send it, I can, or I can just read it. If it's brief, you can just read it. Uh, I move that the council adopt the preliminary exempted fishing permit proposals in agenda item I1, comma, attachments one, two, and three for public review. All right, thank you, Brianna. Is that language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes, it is, thank you. All right, I will look for a second. All right, seconded by Maggie Summer. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. These EFP proposals provide for opportunities to help maintain time series for biological data that have been used in the stock assessment. And these EFP proposals also help to address data gaps related to nearshore biomass by allowing for the industry to run acoustics and aerial surveys and then to collect the corresponding biological data to inform the species and size composition of the nearshore schools. And also, as we heard from our advisory bodies, the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team and the advisory subpanel, we have support from them for these proposals to be adopted for public review. All right, thank you, Brianna. Are there any, I'm not sure where that's, that's coming from. Let me mute. I know where some of that sounds coming from. So are there any questions for the maker of the motion or discussion on the motion? I'm not seeing any hands for questions or discussion. So uh, I will call the question. All those in favor of this motion? Well, Phil Anderson, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry to be slow on the draw here this morning. Uh, Brianna, we, we heard in public testimony an expression of concern about the level of mortalities that would occur associated with these EFPs. And I, I was wondering if, if, if you could um, comment on your perspective as to whether or not the amounts that are contemplated uh, in these uh, EFPs pose any kind of a concern, a conservation concern relative to the ability of this resource to um, rebuild. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, simply no, however, I would just note that um, there is a specifications process in which we will look at what the biomass is at the time that these would be approved and um, we would get a corresponding ACL and can evaluate that question better at the time in April. All right, thank you, Brianna. Any further questions for Brianna on the motion or any discussion on the motion? Okay, then I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Brianna, for the motion. Uh, let me ask if there's any further action uh, from the council or discussion on this agenda item. 
and uh, not seeing any hands, I'll turn to Carrie to confirm we've done our business here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that concludes your business and uh, we will bring this back in April. All right, Carrie, don't go away because we have uh, our next CPS agenda item, I2. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is agenda item I2, fishery management plan management categories. Uh, the, the council has been exploring the possibility of eliminating the active and monitored management categories that are in the CPS FMP for some time now. Um, the purpose would be to clarify the management intent, but also preserve the flexibility that's embedded in the CPS MT and remain consistent with national standards. Um, the CPS MT has spent quite a bit quite a bit of time working on the language that um, that achieves these goals um, and you'll hear uh, some more detail about that in a few uh, moments here um, for materials on this agenda item there is a CPSMT report in the advanced briefing book materials CPSMT report one uh, it includes background information and then it includes uh, underlying strike through FMP text. Uh, you also have a supplemental CPSAS report um, one that is in your supplemental materials. Um, your action today is to adopt the preliminary FMP amendatory language and then provide guidance as appropriate. And that guidance uh, might include uh, what are the next steps because we don't have this currently agendized um, for another meeting. Um, after my overview, we'll go to the reports and comments of the management entities and advisory bodies, and then uh, we'll go to public comment, and there is public comment in the, um, in the materials for this item. And then again, the action is to adopt the preliminary FMP and mandatory language for public review. Uh, that concludes my overview. All right, thank you very much, Carrie. Any questions? Uh of Kerry on uh, his overview. All right, we'll get started with uh, reports. And we have a report for, and a presentation from the CPS management team. Uh, Lorna Wargo, welcome. Uh, thank you and good morning, Mr. Chair and good morning, council members. Um, I'm Lorna Wargo, chair of the CPS uh, management team. And today I'll, we'll be providing the council an overview of the management team's report one under this agenda item. Next slide, please. Um, so for several now, years now, the council advisory bodies and others interested in CPS management have been thinking about the FMP and the category framework um, that was originally implemented under Amendment 8 um, back in 1999. Um, that category framework includes three categories, active, monitored, and prohibited harvest. Um, prompted by a perceived lack of clarity regarding the meaning and use of these categories, particularly the monitor category, the Council began a process in 2018 asking the team to provide options for revising the FMP for council consideration that would provide more clarity around the use of the active and monitored management category terminology um, that's in the FMP. Following that, um, in June of 2019, the council provided more specific guidance on draft revisions, um, directing the team to develop FMP language uh, that retained the existing management approaches for CPS stocks while removing the references to management categories such that the FMP would present stock specific management descriptions. And at this meeting, the council is to consider the proposed language to revise the FMP and approve that for public review. Next slide, please. As mentioned, the revisions are presented in the CPSMT report one under this agenda item. The report provided a brief background regarding the intent or purpose of the management categories, and then lists each section where a change has been proposed and a brief description of the change. And attached to it is the underlying um, strike through draft FMP language. In developing the draft, uh, the team 
took a, a parsimonious, a very careful approach so that the revisions we proposed were done in an efficient manner, um, making as few modifications to the FMP text as possible while still accomplishing the council's directive. Um, as proposed, the revisions are intended to remove management category nomenclature and eliminate the concept of categorical species assignment as active, monitored, or prohibited while retaining the types of approaches by which the counts, by which CPS may be managed by the council in maintaining existing harvest management policy for each stock. Further, the revisions um, do not alter the council's ability to make changes and establish management procedures on a stock by stock basis. Because the category concept was enmeshed in the FMP, we'll, we'll note um, the team made some ancillary changes um, and that these were also included in that summary, um, section by section summary of changes. Next um, page, please. Thank you. So getting to the heart of the matter here on um, slide four, the CPS management use unit species are listed on the left-hand side as they are currently organized in the management categories. The categories um, may be thought of as bins or boxes that were intended to facilitate efficient use of agency and council resources, recognizing that not all stocks require the same level of management to achieve um, conservation and harvest policy objectives. So specifically, the active category designates stocks where management entails periodic assessment and harvest specification. And this category includes Pacific sardine and Pacific mackerel. In contrast, the monitored category has been used to designate stocks using MSY-based harvest policies, and which may be, but are not necessarily assessed on a regular basis or subject to periodic changes in harvest specifications. And lastly, the prohibited category, which only includes krill species. Um, and a special note on this last category, initially it was not part of the, you know, discussions on management categories and on its own did not raise concerns, um, but the management team found in accommodating um, a single category in the FMP was awkward um, and that removing the pro prohibited harvest category could be accomplished with no impact to the policy or regulatory pro prohibition on the harvest of krill species. Um, so shifting now to the right, the proposed revisions are represented, showing the CPS management unit species individually, representing the stock-by-stock -stock organization that results with the categorical bins removed. The descriptive text that previously was associated with each category heading is now repeated by species um, and is intended to represent that the body of harvest policy or regulations associated with each stock remains unchanged. Um, and then Finally, so what's achieved with these proposed revisions? Um, in organizing the stocks individually in the FMP, um, clarity should be improved um, and the council would no longer have to consider a stock's categorization um, as either active or monitored as a factor, you know, to potentially have to consider when contemplating management changes. Um, so the council would have the ability to just look specifically at a stock um, and not have to consider the categorization of that stock. Next slide, please. Um, and that concludes the presentation and I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Lorna. Uh, are there any questions on the management team report? Corey Niles. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I don't, Lorna, I have a, just maybe a question that we could look at slide four. I believe it was slide four. Yeah, um, just, yep, thank you, that one. Um, and this is a question, but I guess looking at, looking at this, um, this really, this, this slide here, um made clear how and i know you all have been working on this for a long time and thank you for all the, the work the council's asked you to do 
but this really boils it down to um, this, this is a, a pretty minor change. It looks like a minor change to the FMP. I'm looking at anchovy on the left. It says MSY based harvest policy. I look on the right. It says MSY based harvest policy. The only thing that's different is there's no more monitored above it. Um, but with with the anchovy in particular and NCPS generally, you know, we we've the council has been working towards a new way of doing things. Um, you know, with with the work of the science center, you know, and we're talking about regular, you know, the framework we'll be talking about at the end of the meeting here. You know, we'll be looking at taking regular looks at biomass relative to to, to harvest specifications, deciding whether they need to be changed. We're having a stock assessment um, priority process setting priority setting process. Yet, I think if you look at at the FMP language you're proposing or this. It, you wouldn't know any of that from from looking at the FMP, um, or maybe I'm missing it. But could you? My question here: Could you elaborate on how the team, you know, sees this FMP language um, linking up to the to the other pieces we've the council's been talking about for anchovy and CPS? And if that was long winded. If I can restate the question, happy to do so. All right. Uh, thank you, Corey. I, I'll. Um... I think I tracked your um, question. Um, so yeah, I would say the um, FMP language um, isn't inconsistent with the management for anchovy. It may not be as detailed um, given all the work that's um, been undertaken to develop the framework for anchovy. Um, I think we still have an MSY, MSY based harvest policy um, and that that framework adds, does have add a level of detail, uh, but I don't think that um, there's, I wanna say inconsistency there. Um, in developing this draft language for the, you know, relative to the categories, um, the team did try to take an approach, like I said, that was parsimonious. Um, I think over the intervening maybe year and a half or two, comfort has developed or some, I don't know, better understanding of how this might look. Um, but previous, there was a you know some concern about removing the categories, and so we were trying to be very careful and keep the actions, I guess, somewhat separate or at least in parallel, and thinking that. Up until this point, that was a, um, a more practical approach, um, and that going from this point forward, you know, it's the first time the council's been able to see the draft language um, to know whether or not they, you know, supported this. Um, There's just concern about introducing too many changes. Um, so I think there's, you know, certainly that could be considered or discussed as a next step. Does that answer your question, Corey? Uh, yeah, yes, sir, yes, and thanks, Lorna. Okay, are there any further questions on the management team report? All right, thank you very much, Lorna. Thank you. All right, we'll now hear from the CPS advisory subpanel uh, Diane Pleschner Steele. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll be reading from agenda item I2A, Supplemental CPSAS Report 1. During the November 16 Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel webinar, Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team Chair Lorna Wargo presented a summary of the CPSMT report on Coastal Pelagic Species Fishery Management Plan Management Categories, Agenda Item I2A CPSMT Report 1, November 2021. The CPSAS also reviewed the report and related materials and commends the management team and council staff for their efforts in drafting an administrative amendment to the CPSFMP to address the council's request to remove references to active and monitored categories 
but not to revise the manager uh, the man manner in which CPS stocks are managed. Chair Wargo and council staff clarified that the management team approach was to address administrative aspects of the council's request. Under the proposed revisions, the council maintains the ability to make changes and to establish management procedures tailored to each stock without amending the FMP. The CPSMT proposed replacing active, monitored, and prohibited management bins with definitions of those categories, placing all stocks on the table to describe management. The CPSMT report explained that under the CPS framework, framework management approach in the FMP, quote, it is not necessary to amend the CPS FMP in order to develop or modify harvest control rules or definitions of overfishing, close quote. The CPS FMP amendment now proposes to include two primary forms of harvest control rules for CPS. The default control rule supplants monitored and the general control rule replaces active with new definitions of those rules provided to explain management policies. The CPSAS supports the management team's overall approach to this administrative FMP amendment, which removes terminology perceived by some to be confusing while providing the council the flexibility to make changes and establish management procedures on a stock by stock basis. We suggest that the management team explore adding a footnote to the FMP for the purpose of informing the public on where to find additional information on management of the central subpopulation of Northern Anchovy presented in Council Operating Procedure 9 and the CPS uh, Stock Assessment and Fishery Evaluation document. Thank you very much for considering these comments. And that concludes our statement. All right, thank you, Diane. Are there any questions of the AS on the report? Uh, Corey Niles followed by Brianna Brady. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Diane. On that last paragraph there, I mean, I guess, um, can you, could you, the question is, could you elaborate there a bit more? I was, that's, I think maybe what I was asking Lorna about a second ago. If, if you just read the FMP proposed changes, you wouldn't know that the council is contemplating anything, anything different. Um, but are, is, is that what you're getting at with that last paragraph, making the connection? How, yeah, could you just please elaborate on the, the AS's thoughts behind that last paragraph? Thank, thank you, Mr. Niles, and, and through the chair. Uh, we had some discussion on what is possible and what is what is allowable under, uh, you know, an administrative amendment. And council staff suggested that there had been some precedent by including a footnote with regard to sardine when they changed the, the you know, the, the temperature control rule. And some some of us, and I know, um, you know, some some of the some of the team members thought it might be helpful to just provide a footnote referencing the COP and save. Um, and so we're asking the management team to consider if that's possible, and mm -hmm. in, if so, where they might where they might be able to do something like that. But uh, without without uh, disrupting the flow and, and the you know, the ability of the um, the administrative amendment to to proceed, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Brianna. You had your hand up and then down. Do you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, it's my understanding that this is Diane's last statement that she'd be reading officially for the AS. Is that true, Diane? Yes, <laughs> it is true. I'm, I'm uh, stepping down from the advisory sub panel. And so I, I just wanted to express my appreciation for the many years you've been part of the council process and um, I'll, I'll miss having you here. Thank you, Diane, for all your work. Oh, thank you, Diana. 
I appreciate your efforts as well, and I, I'd uh, like to take this opportunity to thank the council for listening to me for, I don't know how many years I've, I've lost count, <laughs> but, but uh, it's been a, an enjoyable, sometimes frustrating process, and um, I will think of you fondly <laughs> in, in my semi-retirement. I guess I'm not going away altogether. I'll still... I'll still be uh, managing uh, our research projects. And so it, at some point I may come back to bring you uh, information on, uh, on our findings. But, uh, but thanks, thanks, Brianna. Appreciate, I appreciate your support. All right, thanks. Uh, Chuck Tracy, followed by Frank Lockhart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Diane, I, I just wanted to say thank you also for uh, your uh, your tenure here on the on the uh, CPSAS. It's been 18 years. Uh, we've benefited from your uh, your wisdom and your passion, and uh, just really wanted to thank you for your uh, you know unyielding support uh, for the council process, um, and not just uh, you know not just advocating for your industry um, and the resource, but also uh, you know kind of putting the rubber to the road and, uh, you know, you mentioned your research, you know, and, uh, your, uh, your association's, uh, commitment to, uh, to getting better science, to advocating for science and then going out and trying to make that happen, uh, has been, uh, you know, it's been great to have that, that level of commitment and passion and, uh, we will miss you. And, uh, so I just wanted to say thank you for all of that over these long years. Thank you, Chuck. You reminded me how long it's been. <laughs> I lost count. All right, Frank Lockhart. I'll just um, uh, make this pretty quick by echoing everything else that everyone said, but also I just wanted to uh, personally thank uh, um, Diane for the uh, help she gave to me personally and getting up to speed on CPS issues uh, when I took this on. Uh, she was just amazing at um, helping me understand the industry and getting me in contact with people and and maybe just to, to echo one of the things, it's hard to imagine anybody representing her industry better than, than she has over the years. So thank you, appreciate all you've done. Thank, thank you, Frank. And thank you, Diane. I hope you're blushing. Uh, yeah, a little bit, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anything further on the AS report? I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you, Diane. Thank you very much. All right. That concludes reports and will take us to public comment. I have five public comments uh, on my uh, screen here. And we'll start with Jeff Shester, followed by Megan Flaherty. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Jeff Shester uh, representing Oceana. Um, I'd also like to weigh in and, and thank Diane Plesher Steele for her service uh, for many years in the council process. Uh, while we may disagree on several issues, we, we do share a love for the ocean, and I've always had a deep respect for you, Diane. And I'm sure the council will miss the, uh, the ongoing entertainment of the Diane and Jeff show. Um, so uh, Oceana submitted a letter under this agenda item However, we do have some updated thinking as the result of some recent discussions during this meeting. Uh, so to summarize our request, um, first, we, we ask that the council adopt the current FMP amendment language that removes the monitored versus active category nomenclature as provided by the management team for public review so that the council can adopt that amendment as soon as possible, uh, hopefully uh, in April of 2022. Uh, second, we ask that the council uh, initiate a new amend FMP amendment uh, by scheduling a scoping meeting in April 2022 to incorporate and describe the new anchovy framework in the CPS FMP uh, with a two-year uh, biennial specification cycle. Uh, 
the, the council spent many years contemplating uh, a new management regime for uh, the central subpopulation of northern anchovy to replace the outdated management regime that has been described as monitored. Uh, our fundamental concerns uh, are not limited to the, 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 the monitored nomenclature and the word itself only, but with the associated management regime that allows annual catch limits to be set for multiple years, as particularly for a species whose population is prone to rapid collapse due to climate and ocean conditions, and for which there is now new scientific data every year available on abundance through the ATM surveys and other uh, sources of information like the Cal Coffee data. Uh, anchovy is uh, hugely important in the marine ecosystem as forage for seabirds, mammals, and larger fish. And new research supported by the California Ocean Protection Council shows anchovy are extremely vulnerable to climate change uh, off the West Coast, in particular due to uh, the increase in hypoxia events. Um, Climate-ready ecosystem-based fishery management uh, it requires a responsive approach to changes in anchovy abundance. So uh, uh, again, it, it's really not the, the word monitored. It, the problem is that setting specifications without a requirement to regularly review and respond to changes in anchovy abundance will not ensure that overfishing is prevented and, and, and fails to respond to the best available science on the current population size. Um, it, the, the, the new anchovy framework, however, that was uh, essentially uh, adopted and moved forward in June 2021 and included in the, the draft COP9 language at this meeting, we believe can address the fundamental shortcomings of the FMP if it's implemented through bi biennial specifications. Uh, the parameters have been uh, vetted, uh, they've gone through modeling and a management strategy evaluation and have wide support across state stakeholders. Uh, the, the, as you know, FMPs are required to describe the harvest policy, harvest control rules, and the process for setting annual harvest specifications. And we have previously understood that at this meeting, there would be an opportunity for the council to add to th this framework to the scope of the current FMP amendment, as this FMP amendment was never formally scoped. However, after conferring with council staff and executive directors, we, we certainly understand that there has you know, been a lot of challenges associated with uh, COVID since the, the FMP was uh, initiated. And, you know, and therefore, we, we can support the current FMP language for adoption at this time, provided that a new uh, amendment process can promptly begin to adopt the framework. So uh, we do support the removal of the monitored and active categories as an interim step. Uh, however, to address the concerns with the anchovy management as currently described in the FMP, including in the, the, the modifications that, that have been put forward by the management team, we, we still believe that it is essential that the, there, there be further amendments to adopt that framework because the FMP language uh, is, is not clear. It talks about vague MSY proxies uh, and does not reflect uh, the, the responsiveness and the, particularly the ability to respond to triggers and lower catch limits uh, rapidly if there is a, a change in biomass. There, there's simply not that requirement in the FMP language, and that's the fundamental problem. Um, so uh, it is our hope that the council can adopt the current language for public review so that final adoption can occur in April of 22, 2022. Um, and, th and that the council immediately began amending the FMP to include the anchovy framework with a scoping uh, meeting at the April 22 meeting, which can also uh, include other cleanup actions that were, have been raised by the management team, but were not in the, the current amendment before you. Um, lastly, we, we did want to ensure that the krill prohibition in Amendment 12 is maintained which we uh, understand is the intent of the CPS management team, uh, but it would be helpful uh, today if the council could, could confirm this uh, just to make sure there's no ambiguity about whether or not that that, that, that is changed. Um, so uh, in summary, we, we think the council does have the ingredients before it to, uh, to really address the fundamental uh, legal and conservation concerns that uh, we, we and others have raised over, over many years. And, and we're very optimistic that the council uh, can, you know, take a stepwise process, uh, starting with the adoption of the language at this meeting, uh, but as a as a as a as a step toward uh, completion uh, of of a, a new a new management regime, rather than the conclusion of, of the of the discussion. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to come uh, to comment, and we'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Jeff. Are there any questions of Jeff? Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jeff. I guess um, my question is, I'm not quite connecting to what you're what you're saying. I say if in, in going along the lines of what I what I asked uh, Diane and Lorna already, uh, the council has been working towards in, in a, you know a different way of, of um, managing anchovy of uh, looking at how we, we set priorities for assessment. And to me, those are ways of, of achieving the control rules that are in the FMP um, and, and doing it in a way that's um, you know preferable for anchovy than, than we've been doing. So if, if we follow that process and it's consistent with the FMP, I'm not understanding what you're seeing as as the issue and um, not disagreeing. I'm just could you could you elaborate on what you what the precise issue is that you see? Um, thank you uh, through the chair. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Niles, for that question. Um, yeah, uh, I think it is actually worth reviewing that language again, which we've done uh, quite a few times. The, for example, the language refers to general uh, EMSY or MSY proxies as the way to set uh, overfishing limits. Uh, first of all, that 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 specific issue uh, that we were not the council is no longer using that, and 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 now the SSC has provided a way to actually use biomass times uh, an FMSY that's been newly calculated. So that that itself differs from the the default control rule that's described in the FMP. Uh, I think the general uh, concern with the FMP language is it, it's not very specific as to how the council is to respond, how how often it's to respond. On, uh, what the actual triggers are for reducing uh, annual catch limits uh, below any sort of default levels. The, the FMP is extremely vague and does not provide the, the confidence to ensure that best available science is incorporated and that overfishing is prevented. Um, it, it, uh, for example, the the, you know, if you look at sardine or mackerel management, uh, the, the harvest control rules are specified clearly. There, the, you know, there are biomass thresholds that trigger uh, changes, and in those cases, closures to fisheries. Uh, and I think in, in this case, we, we don't see uh, the, 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 the level of specificity necessary to really understand the current harvest policy and the harvest control rules that are included in the new anchovy framework uh, that that's been uh, developed. We don't see any of that in the FMP itself. And so the, you know, the, the, the FMP currently allows specifications to be set essentially once and really never revisited again. And there is, you know, there, there is no uh, sort of trigger or requirement when biomass changes to update uh, annual catch limits. And that's what the framework does accomplish. And, and that's, that's, the, that, that's the critical element that, so that the FMP requires that NIMFS and the council uh, evaluate best available science on a frequent basis and make changes when the stock goes below a certain level. And those, those requirements are not currently in the FMP. And that's what we see is, is essentially the fundamental concern. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, further questions of Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. We'll next hear from uh, Megan Flaherty, followed by Sri Kondadai. Hello, members of the council. Um, this is Megan Flaherty with the San Diego Audubon Society. Um, glad to be here today talking with you guys. Um, it's been many years of talking with you, uh, with the council about updating the, the management uh, for Northern Anchovy. Um, and I'm very happy to be here today talking about kind of continuing this process and, and hopefully um, ensuring that Northern Anchovy management is more reactive to the realities of, of what the stock is looking like out in the ocean. Um, as you've heard from me before in previous years, this is a very important forage fish for a lot of birds that are really important to the Audubon network, including endangered birds such as the California leaf tern, as well as species like the brown pelican that while no longer considered endangered are definitely still dealing with the impact of um, not enough food to eat. Um, with our oceans experiencing dramatic changes due to climate change, it's, it's 
extremely important that we are cautious and um, take into consideration impacts of uh, reductions in forage fish to all of the different parts of the marine food web. I'd like to join, uh, we also signed on to a letter with um, Audubon, um, as well as Portland Audubon, CN Sage Audubon, um, and it stresses a few things. Um, while we are very happy to be here and see this change in management categories going forward, we do want to stress a few things. Um, we want to make sure that um, any changes to anchovy framework uses the best available science in terms of anchovy biomass. We want to make sure that the biomass estimates um, are, be, are doing a formal check-in every two years as anchovy does fluctuate on the short term and that has very big implications for all the different food, uh, all the different dependent predators out in um, the marine environment. And we want to emphasize the fact that regularly scheduled specifications are the only way to ensure that this framework actually meets its intention. So kind of building off of what Jeff was saying, we want to make sure that, again, this isn't kind of just set it and forget it, but that, we're, but that the council is really checking in on how anchovy is doing and ensuring that it's not being overfished. Um, anchovy comprises more than 20% of California's total commercial fishery landing, and it, it's good to be cautious when, when thinking about how the catches are impacting the other parts of the marine food web. Um, so thank you guys so much for all of your hard work um, go, getting to this point um, and really appreciate being able to be here today. All right, thank you very much, Megan. Are there questions for Megan? I'm not seeing any uh, hands. Thank you very much, Megan. We'll now hear from Sri Kandahai, Kandadai, and I'm, please correct me on pronunciation, followed by Bob Waller. Hi, thank you so much for um, the opportunity to speak today. My name is Sri Kandare. I'm a junior in high school and actually I'm calling in from school right now. So I'm sorry if there's any background noise or Wi-Fi issues. Um, but I have been volunteering with the San Diego Audubon as a turn watcher since I was eight. So I've seen the declining populations of the already endangered California least turn, which are nearly exclusively dependent on anchovies for food. I called into the meeting in June to discuss these regulations, and I wanted to thank you for taking steps to adopt annual catch limits for northern anchovy that reflect how the stock is doing. Uh, just to reiterate, we need our northern anchovies not only because they account for more than 20% of California's total commercial fishery landings, but they also play an essential role in the food web, especially for seabirds such as the California least tern and the brown pelican. There really is no time to waste as seabird populations have already decreased by 70% since the 1950s. So I request the committee to adopt the proposed changes to the fishery management plan as soon as possible. Thank you so much for your time. All right, and thank you for taking time out from your school day. Um, are there any questions? Thank you very much, Ray. We'll now hear from Bob Waller and Anna Weinstein. Is, is Bob Waller not present? Well, we'll go to... No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm here. I didn't unmute. All right. Very good. I just see you on my screen as Robert. I didn't see your last name. So uh, go ahead, Bob. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, again, my name is Bob Waller. I am a member of San Diego Audubon. And uh, like Sri, I am a turn watcher. So my principal interest in being here and speaking is the California least turn. Uh, it's been very interesting to listen to Jeff and Megan uh, discuss the, the, the current issue of uh, categorizing the northern anchovy to ensure a stock assessment yearly and enough food for the least turn. Um, it's, it's encouraging that the, the council is dealing with this issue, and I'll 
make it short by saying simply that I uh, am one voice in uh, support of stronger language in the management plan uh, for the maintenance of the northern anchovy as a forage food for uh, uh, seabirds, such as the least tern. Um, it's a rapidly changing environment with COVID, with climate change, with everything else going on in this country. But I think uh, one of our basic principles is to do what we can to support uh, the environment, number one, and even those, all of God's species that are here for our consumption as well as enjoyment. So I just uh, want to add that strong voice in support of the council uh, to continue this process by adopting the proposed changes to the fishery management plan and taking care of the needed administrative tasks as soon as possible, uh, but by no later than the March 22 meeting. Thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Bob. Are there any questions of Bob Waller on his testimony? Thank you very much, Bob. We we'll now hear from Anna Weinstein. Anna, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Members. It's good to be here. Um, I'm speaking for National Audubon Society, Audubon California, Portland Audubon, and the Pew Charitable Trust, uh, as well as the over 2,600 members of Audubon who sent a separate letter, also included in the public comments. Um, so um, following on my, my Audubon colleagues and um, Dr. Shester, um, uh, we recommend the council adopt the CPS FNP management categories amendment language. Um, we would like to see um, also, you know, per the advisory sub panel suggestion uh, to the management team and the discussion earlier, um, a linkage included um, between the, this FNP amendment and the, um, the language, the COP9 uh, modifications that, that update the, the, um, the flow chart that process to update uh, anchovy management. So um, there's been consistent public support for removing these arbitrary management categories, um, which had created a roadblock to updating TSNA management. So it's really great to be here today. Um, so while this is a narrow FMP amendment and more, and the entire anchovy framework and biannual specs must be included uh, in the FMP in the future, in the near future, this is a critical step for updating the CPS and FMP and making it climate ready. So we really thank the management team for its hard work, um, as well as the great work of the SSC and CPS subcommittee. Um, um, I appreciate the CPS for uh, its collaboration. Um, and of course, I wanna deeply thank Diane um, for all her service. I've overlapped briefly with her on the CPSAS, but have worked um, with her for since 2012. And have really, I've learned so much from her, from her um, and I've appreciated our always respectful dialogue um, and her dedication to science. So this is too bad it can't be in person. Um, so thank you, Diane, and thank you, Council. All right, thank you very much, Anna. Any questions for Anna on her public comment? Thank you, Anna. So that will complete public comment on agenda item I-2. And will take us to our action here, which is uh, on the screen. So I'll open the floor uh, to discussion. Brianna Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I wanted to say thank you to the management team for their work on revising the FMP language and also to say thank you to the advisory sub panel and the members of the public for their continued discussion on the topic. 
I'm supportive of adopting the draft language put forth by the management team. And I also can agree with the request made by the AS, the advisory sub panel, that the management team explore ways to refer to the COP9 and the SAFE. Thanks. All right, thank you, Brianna. Further discussion? Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and first, yes, uh, I want to echo all the nice things said about Diane and Diana. Hope to see you in the hallway and, and talk in person sometime. And I don't want to re repeat what Brianna just said, but I, I do think um, adopting adopting the language with the small ask of the team to to think through how um, a little more could be added to make clear that the council intends to stick to um, trying to apply the anchovy framework and imply, a, you know, go through the stock assessment priority language. I don't want, I don't think we're wanting anything to be overly prescriptive, um, but, but some connection um, from the FMP to that process um, we've been working on. I, I would hope the team, I expect the team could come up with something concise um, to that effect. And that's that pretty much, you know, other than the thanks for all the hard works would summarize my, my thinking here. All right, thank you, Corey. Uh, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair Grolnick. Uh, I agree with Brianna's and Corey's comments uh, and support those as well. Um, also, throw in my thanks to uh, Diane. I have, I have learned a lot from you about CPS as well and CPS fisheries uh, and we'll miss seeing you at council meetings. Um, I do want to, to acknowledge the tremendous amount of work that this council has been undertaking in recent years. Uh, council as a whole, including our management team, our advisors, uh, members of the public to um, bring some improvements to both the way we manage stocks uh, Northern Anchovy in particular through development of the framework approach, as well as to improve um, how we communicate about that and how uh, anyone interested is able to uh, understand our management approach and can find that information. And uh, I do think that this, these proposed amendments to the FMP to uh, remove the monitored uh, and other category designations and instead describe them by individual management unit species um, is a great step in that direction. I think it makes it much more clear uh, the approach we take for each species and just wanted to appreciate that and not um, let this go uh, being characterized as, as just a simple administrative uh, amendment. It, it may be, that certainly is a fair word, but I think it does more than that. It is, um, it is a valuable part of our overall process and I appreciate the work the team has done to bring it to us. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Further discussion on this agenda item or perhaps a motion to make uh, the council's the direction clear. Brianna Brady. Mr. Chair, um, I have a motion. I just need to send it to Chris and Sandra. All right, we'll stand, we'll stand by a moment while you do that. Thank you, it's on its way.
Uh, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I had a question maybe I could ask while oh, we're waiting for the for the motion. Sure. If that's permissible. Um, so I'm interested in in understanding, uh, first of all, I support the notion uh, that we uh, link or footnote the FMP uh, to the Council Operating Procedure 9 um, and, but I'm I'm wondering what the process is to, uh, to accomplish that, and perhaps it's in the motion. We'll wait and see. Um, but just leaving it to the to the team to do. Um, I, I don't know that from a process perspective that they can just arbitrarily add something to the FMP, such as a footnote. So I just wanted to. Um, um, Make sure I was clear on what, uh, how we, we would go go about accomplishing that if if that was the will of the council. <clears throat> was that question directed to Carrie or the team management team? Well, I, I guess it'd be a, a, a Carrie. Carrie's probably a good place to start, and maybe. Maybe uh, National Marine Fishery Service has some thoughts about that, or or Mr. Tracy. All right, uh, we'll start with Carrie then. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um, the we have one precedent for adding a footnote to the FMP to reflect uh, it was the change in the temperature component of the starting harvest control rule when we moved away from the Scripps Pier temp to uh, an average of sorts of the Cal Coffee sea surface temperatures. Um, the, FM, the CPS FMP is um, you know, written into it uh, are many statements um, emphasizing the flexibility, the need to be uh, adaptive um, as necessary, but, the, but it also includes some um, uh, you know, values like how do you, uh, or specifics, you know, like how do you uh, calculate the temperature for use in the sardine harvest control rule? And so um, that was something that uh, we added outside of a normal amendment process um, just to sort of clarify that this had taken place. Um, and um, so that's where, that's where that notion came up. Um, you know, I haven't, uh, we don't have the motion on the screen, so I don't know exactly what it would mean, but in my mind, this is something, this issue has been, um, uh, is discussed, I think this is the fourth time on the council floor, and uh, and it's very important, and so, um, you know, I think the most important thing would be when we get to a final action, and just a reminder, today's not final action, this is to adopt it for public review, the language. Um, you know whether you know whether whether staff and the team and nymphs you know thinks it would be better um, you know, where where the explanation would happen. I think it's something that you know we still have to discuss. Uh, so I being a little bit vague right now, not having seen you know exactly where we're going with this, but um, but there's some precedents to you know clarifying actions that the council and or NIMS has taken, um, you know, in the FMP, um, you know, without going through a formal amendment process. Uh, and I'm not saying that's how we would do it, um, but, uh, you know, that's a possibility. Or we've also talked about including some language. This, again, this is adopting the preliminary FMP language. So there's certainly an opportunity for some minor modifications as long as it's, you know, consistent and doesn't sort of change the nature of this action. So I guess that's what I can offer at this point um, as far as moving forward. Thank you, Carrie. Is there anything uh, that Chuck or Merrick may have to add? Chuck? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, um, I, 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 yeah, so we're, we're, the stage the stage of the process we're in now is uh, to adopt some language for public review. So I think there's some opportunity there to, you know, again, depending on what the motion, uh, how the motion's constructed to uh, to address the uh, management uh, framework issue that uh, that's 
scheduled to come up for approval uh, later in the council meeting. So I, I guess I would just point out that that uh, that step hasn't been taken yet um, to to uh, formally incorporate um, that flowchart into uh, COP nine. But uh, but presuming that that is uh, is accomplished, then uh, I think uh, I, I think the council could. Um, address that uh, here at this point, uh, recognizing that there will be an opportunity for uh, further uh, discussion and final action um, sometime next year. All right. Thank you, Chuck. Um, any further discussion? I, I don't know if Chris or Sandra have the mo language of the motion yet. I, I believe they do. Okay. So why don't we put that up and use that as a basis for uh, further discussion? So, Brianna? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the council adopt the preliminary fishery management plan amendatory language as proposed by the CPSMT for public review and direct the CPSMT to explore adding text into the FMP language to reference Council, Oper Proce Council Operating Procedure 9 and the Coastal Pelagic Species Stock Assessment and, and Fishery Stock Assessment and Fishery Evaluation document for final Council action in April 2022. All right, thank you, Brianna, for the motion. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes, it is. Thank you. All right, I will look for a second. Seconded by Phil Anderson. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Removing the categories has been a major priority for some of our constituents. And I, I think it's okay to move this amendment forward with the language drafted by the management team and to ask that the management team review the draft text of the FMP to see where a reference to COP9, which outlines in detail the management and activity cycles for CPS, and also where a reference to the SAFE might work best. We have spent a substantial amount of time talking about this topic over various meetings, and I'd like to see the final proposed language brought back to the council during the April 2022 meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you, Brianna, for the motion. And um, I'll see if there are any questions uh, for Brianna or discussion on the motion. Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Brianna, for this motion. Um, I'm going to support it. Uh, this is um, CPS stocks are just so vitally important to the ecosystem. And I think that um, this motion moves us in the right direction. Uh, I want to recognize and appreciate the council's long-term discussion on anchovy and the public comment that we received under this item, um, especially Sri. Thank you for taking the time away from school to come, come speak to us. We need more younger folks engaged. Um, and regarding anchovy, I look to discussing this item further um, under the COPs. So thanks. All right, thank you very much, Corey. Uh, is there any further discussion on this motion? And not seeing any hands, uh, I think it's appropriate to call the question. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Brianna, thank you very much for the motion. Uh, let me see if there's further discussion or action on this agenda item from around the table. And I'm not seeing any, so I will go back to Carrie and see how we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, that does complete your um, 
Your task for this agenda item, you've adopted the draft FMP language for public review and provided some direction to the CPS management team to uh, look at uh, the possibility of including some FMP language to reference um, the COP9 uh, business. As Mr. Tracy mentioned, uh, that hasn't been uh, adopted yet uh, in the council operating procedures. Um, but um, I think that should work fine. The management team is planning to have a uh, meeting on their own in early 2022 to um, prepare for CPS business for the year. And so uh, this is something I think that could be put on their plate um, for discussion and advice to the council. So uh, that does complete your uh, business for the item. Um, I. I will also like to join in the sentiments uh, about Diane Pleschner Steele. It's been great working with her uh, on the CPS advisory sub panel for uh, well ever since I've been here, which is about 12 or 13 years now. And um, she's a passionate advocate and she walks the walk. And uh, a little known fact is that she is a, a, um, a very active. Um, um, uh, voice for uh, fighting climate change and ocean acidification. And um, while we were in person meetings, she uh, would almost always ride the train to meetings because, again, she walks the walk and, um, you know, puts her money where her mouth is and uh, doesn't want to contribute to global warming. So anyway, it's been a pleasure and lots of fun. And um, I do look forward to seeing her around uh, now and then. So with that, I think you are done with this item, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much, Carrie. We've got one more short agenda item and then we'll take our morning break. This is agenda item C3, final regional operating agreement, and I'll turn to Chuck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so regional operating agreements describe roles and responsibilities of the regional council staff and its corresponding NIMFs and uh, NOAA uh, General Council Regional Partners in planning, developing, and approving fishery management plans, amendments, and regulations. The Pacific Council and uh, NIMS West Coast Partners uh, have a uh, regional agreement that was signed in 2017. The NIMS operational guidelines require parties to review their operating agreements periodically and provide the opportunity to revise the ROA to update procedures and make any desired changes. At the June 2021 meeting, uh, the Council and uh, NIMS staff discussed potential revisions to the ROA with the objective of finalizing it at this meeting. Uh, in, in the meantime, uh, the Council staff has coordinated with, with NIMS and our uh, NOAA General Council partners, uh, and we have recommended some changes to the operating agreement for the Council consideration at this time. Um, there's uh, two attachments. Uh, attachment one and two are uh, both uh, the uh, revised regional operating agreement, attachment one is a clean copy, attachment two is a strikeout underlying uh, version. Um, so the council action here is to review and provide final comments uh, on the West Coast Regional Agreement. Uh, and uh, I am just gonna very briefly uh, summarize uh, the changes in the regional operating agreement since the last version. And then I'll turn it over to National Marine Fisheries Service for some, uh, for some comments from them. So um, the first section uh, deals with uh, council staff uh, responsibilities. Uh, the changes essentially just clarify um, the council staff's responsibility to ensure council direction is addressed by the advisory bodies and also clarifies the role of advisory bodies in producing some of the analytical documents. Uh, for example, uh, the management teams um, will typically be responsible for developing uh, analytical documents for routine management measures. Um, so these, again, just kind of reflects our current practices. Um, the next section is the meeting record. Um, so this used to be called the administrative record and um, with in consultation with general counsel uh, we thought that this was a more appropriate term since there's um, you know there's a legal uh, administrative record that consists of more than what the uh, the council produces the council staff is responsible for um, so uh, we, we renamed it um, 
we uh, do note that the meeting record is the staff responsibility and we changed uh, what, what was in that section um, to reflect only uh, sort of official documents. Uh, so things like uh, meeting notices, FR notices, uh, NEPA analyses, uh, documents um, used to, for decision making and the transmittal uh, letters and documents um, as required by the MSA. Um, so we have taken out the newsletter and the decision summary document, uh, which are uh, items that are not approved by the council. So these are, so what's in there in terms of uh, official uh, meeting record are uh, items that are reviewed and approved by the council or otherwise filed um, for the public record. The next section is interstaff workload planning. This uh, is uh, how the how the partners all work together towards achieving these uh, council objectives. Um, so there's some uh, updates on our uh, pre and post meeting coordination. Um, there's a commitment uh, to use and to further develop some planning tools to uh, help help us all understand uh, the implications and, uh, and make sure that we've got uh, people assigned and uh, uh, schedules and uh, deadlines and uh, understanding what products uh, people will be responsible for. Um, and then uh, there's some more on the rules and developing, analyzing and documenting actions. Uh, for example, council staff are, are, uh, are the default lead for most actions and for developing FMP language. Um, but uh, NIMS uh, may be the lead for uh, some of their administrative priorities um, in, instead of the council staff taking the lead. And then um, finally, just to note that uh, the management and technical teams, uh, uh, interstaff project teams, uh, ad hoc committees and work groups are all uh, tools, I guess, or, or uh, are all uh, groups that uh, can help contribute to uh, to developing these uh, actions and uh, analyses. Um, in the NIMS section, um, the uh, headquarters, uh, we had a section in there on headquarters uh, that was removed because they are headquarters is not signatory to the ROA. Uh, for the West Coast region, um, there's some uh, updating on, uh, on the transmittal procedures, uh, reg regs for uh, deeming and consultations, et cetera. Um, the, their uh, analytical support and review for council staff products and uh, also their role in determining NEPA level and sufficiency. Uh, the Northwest and Fish Southwest Fishery Science Center uh, primarily uh, changes focus on the BSIA framework, um, which as you know, uh, we are still uh, uh, finalizing the next agenda item will be the um, first uh, first look at the recommended framework that's scheduled to be completed in uh, next year uh, needs to be completed by May of next year, um, but that's that's about uh, the only changes in those sections uh, for NOAA GC. <clears throat> uh, just a note of their <clears throat> excuse me their uh, roles for uh, and responsibilities for determining conflict of in interest and recusals. And then uh, the last section is the NIMS Office of Law Enforcement, um, just details their participation and coordination with the um, uh, enforcement consultants. So that's just a quick overview of, of the changes. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there. If there's any questions, uh, I, I'll uh, try to answer them or, or uh, National Fisheries Service can, uh, can help answer them. If there's no questions, then I'll uh, turn it over to Ryan for his comments. All right, well, let's just see if any hands go up or maybe people hold on to their hands until after we've heard from the National Marine Fishery Service. Uh, um, Maggie, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Thank you, Chuck, for the overview. I just have a, a brief question. You mentioned uh, removing the newsletter and decision summary document uh, from the, the list of meeting record items in this, um, this document. Uh, but just some clarification, is there any intent that the council will stop producing those items separately? We've had some, uh, asking for some interested stakeholders. Thanks. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Maggie, for the question. Uh, we, uh, we will continue to produce the decision summary document. Uh, that seems to be the most uh, um, useful and, uh, and most accessed uh, uh, source of results from the council meetings. Uh, so we will continue to do that. Uh, we, uh, at this time, we are not planning to continue the newsletter. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, well, there's been a, a number of uh, internal, I guess, issues uh, with, with getting that um, produced, uh, getting the product we want and doing it in a timely manner. Um, so, um, so at this point, um, uh, my, my plans were not to continue it. Uh, of course, uh, Merrick will be uh, probably, uh, like any administration change, some of those policies uh, may, may get a, some more scrutiny, but that, that's, uh, that was my intent. Thanks for the information. Phil. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I didn't, uh, if I'm asking questions at the improper time, let me know. I have a couple um, that I think referenced, uh, is, it, it relates to what Chuck um, went over. Um, on page, I'm working on looking at the uh, uh, underlying strikeout version. And on page six, um, second to the last paragraph, it says, during the meeting agenda and workload planning portion of each Pacific Council meeting, the party shall strive to define the primary party responsible for major blah, blah, blah. And I, um, while I appreciate the, the need to, to do that, uh, my question, question was this seems to suggest we would do this on the this would be done on the floor in conjunction with that agenda item which um i i question whether that's that's wise or not but it, so i was just wondering is is that uh, definition of who is primarily responsible for all of those pieces meant to be done between nymphs and Council staff on the floor during that agenda item. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um, that that's a that's a good question. I think that I think we would like to be able be able to uh, be prepared to to answer those questions if uh, if they came up. Uh, I don't, I guess I'm not expecting that we would, you know, have a a, a checklist, uh, you know, with uh, blanks to fill in for each uh, for each agenda item. During workload planning, but I but I think the intent here is that uh, that our uh, internal discussions would be sufficient that uh, um, to the extent that we were able, uh, we would be prepared to to uh, to you know to to identify those uh, those roles and and responsibilities at that time. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I have one other. Uh, I have a couple. Two that I'll probably ask um, Brian, but if if you'll Go ahead. Allow, allow me here on the bottom of page eleven is where and you referenced this Chuck where the OLE West Coast Division um, is is identified, mm -hmm. and the language there left me a little bit um, puzzled as to whether or not OLE intended to be a member of the enforcement consultants. Or whether that was left open, um, you know that, that, that there's a possibility they wouldn't be a part of that. And I just, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm not reading that correctly. That that there is an intent for the West Coast Division of OLE to be a member of the enforcement consultants, and there isn't a suggestion within that language that it's it's a discretionary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Anderson. Uh, well, I I won't answer for uh, for OLE or for NIMS, um, but uh, but uh, I I would uh, hope that that's not the case. That there that it would that we would continue to um, have the support of OLE uh, as membership on the enforcement consultants. But again, I, I will let them uh, speak for themselves. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Ryan Wolf. Yeah, just to that point, yes, I can confirm OLE would, would have been made a member of the enforcement consultants. All right, are there, are there any further questions of Chuck? And if not, we'll uh, turn to Ryan. All right, go ahead, Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, to Chuck, for uh, the overview. So I won't walk through the various sections. I think he did a good job. I, I just do want to um, kind of say from a higher level, you know, my appreciation uh, for the work the council staff leadership has put in with NIMPS for the past two years on this um, and the discussions that we've had that have culminated with the document that's before you. Um, and I wanted to highlight that, that kind of the first guiding principle of, of regional operating agreements is that NIMS and the council are partners uh, and, and that we should cooperate in working towards the common goal of, of managing our fishery resources consistent with the MSA and other applicable laws. Um, and that's uh, really something I didn't want to be lost in here and, and really underscored all of our discussions. Um, Again, Chuck provided the detail over, overview on the draft changes. You also had a um, uh, breakdown when we previously showed you this. Uh, I can answer questions on specific topics if there are any, um, but we are very committed to working together productively. Um, and we believe these proposed modifications help address both the changes that have occurred and how we do our work since the current ROA was signed. Uh, also updates it to be consistent with some new uh, regulations and policies, but also provides some changes to current practices for the future that will help us efficiently and effectively carry out our respective roles and responsibilities in this process. And, and getting kind of to Phil's first question, right? It, if this works how we envision it, uh, we foresee that um, NIMS and council staff would be better coordinated to answer questions uh, from the council uh, on anything related to uh, how an action might be implemented, uh, but also to ensure that they have the analyses and the, the information they need to take the action, uh, to make decisions effectively in workload planning of what's reasonable and feasible based on council staff and NIMS workload. Uh, and then of course, to help ensure that we uh, are able to implement the things we have on the year at a glance uh, in the timeframes that we are projecting. Um, so that's the overall goal here. And uh, with that though, I'm happy to answer any specific questions that folks have. All right, thank you very much, Ryan. Are there questions of Ryan at this point? Thank you, Ryan. And uh, with that, um, we'll go to uh, the reports. We have one from the HMS MT. Mr. Chair, sorry. Yes, sir. Sorry, I believe Phil had a hand up. Oh, Phil, I'm sorry, Phil, I didn't see your hand. Go ahead. Well, that's okay. Um, thanks. Um, and, and Ryan, thanks Thanks for your comments there. And and um, I'm not trying to be nitpicky, um, but I did, I did uh, spend some t time, you know, going through this and I, and I do think this is an improvement. Um, uh, and I appreciate your comments in terms of the overall approach and intent about uh, that, w that we have a partnership here and and our our independent success depends on this partnership being successful. So um, there were just a couple of places that uh, um, I wanted to just... Um, make sure I understand at the bottom of page six and I, and, and Chuck spoke to this a little bit, but at the bottom of page six, it says for new action specific council staff are the default leads. And then later on, it goes, talks about WCR leadership may provide staff capacity, but consistent with NIMS priorities. And so, you know, I, I, and, and then there's another place, um, 
um, actually there's a couple more places, but there's another place back on page nine where it says based on, this is under uh, uh, West Coast region, based on agency priorities, taking the lead, blah, blah, blah. So it, it's basically, it's leaving it to the discretion, the way it's written to, to National Marine Fishery Service, West Coast region as to whether or not they're gonna do that work or not. And, and so um, I'm just, um, I mean, all of our, you know, our ability, whether it's council staff or West Coast region staff or state staff, we're, we're all, um, we have to operate within our capacity, right? And so um, uh, uh, I don't even know how to put this as a question, but it just seemed that there was, a number, several different places where it was re repeated that the 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 role of NIMPS, the role of the West Coast region was dependent on it being consistent with NIMPS priorities. Uh, and I just, well, I guess I just wanted to ask, is there anything I should be reading, reading into that that um, departs from that general uh, philosophy that you that you represented at the outset here? about this being a partnership. Yep, through the chat, thanks, Phil, for the question. And I understand um, your perspective. And I don't think there's anything you should read in. I mean, the, the fact of council staff being the default leader, I mean, that was in the ROA from the beginning. And maybe it would, it would be better to just uh, couch this a little differently. And, and when you look at the word lead, um, I would think of that a little bit more as a as an overall project manager of an action. Um, you know, well, while and, and if council staff are the lead, that doesn't mean that NIMS is completely not a collaborator, or not a partner. No, we, we retain that commitment. We would also have our own um, regulatory lead that would go with that for a council staff lead. Uh, we would be potentially a primary contributor, um, just like the management teams could be or council staff on the analyses. Um, but that's kind of how this is set up and why we talk about action planning and tools is to have someone who's designated the overall lead and, and those roles and responsibilities understood to help efficiently get us through the action and make sure that we have all of the work that's needed uh, for the council to have what it needs in front of them to take final action for NIMS to implement after that. Um, but it, all of this does have layers of collaboration coordination that are, may not be as visible there, but would be there constantly uh, between NIMS and council staff. And, and the reason why you see some of the NIMS priorities put out there, it was really us trying to acknowledge um, the basic fact of how we work now, right? There are some items, you know, take the Southern Resident Killer Whale issue recently where, where NIMS uh, has made it a, a top agency priority and therefore has a, a, maybe has attributed more significant resources to it and therefore has the capacity to take on uh, the lead role and um, some larger support for that action in particular. So it's really just highlighting that there are some cases where that happens um, and putting that here just for transparency, but it wasn't intended to have any ulterior motives or anything. I think that we're trying to hide between the lines. Just a quick follow-up, if I may. Of course. Uh, um, th thanks, Ryan, I appreciate that. I, you know, what What? what uh, got my attention was for the, just for new actions, council staff or default leads and, and, and uh, 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 what if the new action is brought forward by National Marine Fisheries Service, such as Southern Resident Killer Whales or Salt Coho, or, you know, there are some other examples that are very high priorities of, of National Marine Fisheries Service and need council attention. Um, and so in those cases, it wouldn't necessarily be um, the burden of being the lead wouldn't necessarily, necessarily placed on the council staff. So there's, I'm just looking for make sure we have balance here, and I know you're you're striving for that, and to be as clear as possible as to who's going to do what. But so that'll conclude my my comments. Thanks. If I may, Mr. Chair. First. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. And that's 100 percent right. That's exactly the case we were trying to capture. Right. We're, we're very clear. If NIMPS is telling the council this is a priority, 
the council accepts that, puts it on its agenda, um, we understand that in that case, we would be stepping up to provide all resources necessary to ensure that um, that action is, is led and, and carried through efficiently since we are uh, pushing it as a priority. So yes, that's the exact intent. Thank you. Okay, is there any, are there any further questions of Ryan or Chuck? And if not, we will go to the uh, HMS, pardon me, um, yeah, the HMS management team, and Steve Stoes is with us. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, members of the council. Uh, the team decided to put a, re a report in under this agenda item um, related to one of our concerns. Uh, we discussed revisions to the um, regional operating agreement and took note of the duties of the council to address federal review requirements, including the uh, National Environmental Policy Act, Magnuson-Stevens Act, Executive Order 12866, and Regulatory Flexibility Act. The team discussed the possibility of increasing its contribution to the federal review workload. While the team sees the potential to increase efficiency with this approach, some members of the team questioned whether they have adequate access to necessary training and guidance to effectively interpret and navigate how relevant federal review requirements apply to council action. To this point, the team suggests that the council, NIMPS, or both, consider whether trainings or docu uh, guidance documents could be provided to council advisory body members in an effort to foster a proficient and shared interpretation of what the federal review requirements are and how they apply to council actions and future agenda and workload planning. And that's the end of our short report, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Steve. Are there any questions of Steve? Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Uh, I don't believe we have any public comment here. I don't see any on the screen, and I don't see any... Um, no public comment. No public comment, great, all right. So that takes us to our council discussion and action. Um, and I will open the floor. We had a lot of great discussion and questions already. Uh, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, I'd also like to appreciate the introductory uh, description of the partnership between NIMS and the council. Uh, I th think that was a uh, much appreciated and I see that focus uh, throughout the document. Uh, in particular, I, I think that the uh, description of collaboration on a lot of the, the behind the scenes planning and the development of project planning tools uh, and, th and that uh, inclusion in the regional operating agreement will be uh, um, very effective means of improving overall some of the council's some you know some of our efficiency through the process and appreciate it. I know that I have heard and share uh, quite a bit of interest in uh, overall council process improvements and in looking for ways to become more efficient, more effective, uh, uh, more strategic about how both how we accomplish our work and in fact what work we prioritize. And uh, I think, you know, not maybe straying uh, just for this part from the regional operating agreement, I think there is a connection and, and the, the elements I just spoke to will be helpful in that area. But also as we're moving uh, to a, a transition of administration of the council itself to a new executive director, um, I think gives us a, a good opportunity to consider overall uh, some strategic thinking and, and planning for the council and its work itself. So just encourage that to be on people's minds uh, as we move forward even beyond adoption of this regional operating agreement. Thanks. 
Thank you, Maggie. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And, and um, uh, I just, I guess, want to emphasize from my perspective that this is a really important document. And it's not, it's the, the importance to me is certainly in part what's written down on paper, but the fact that the that when we're in a partnership like this, that the leadership has sat down and, and worked through and talked through the roles and responsibilities and and to the, to the degree possible, have that clarity um, and detail and clarity to me is really important to, to having a, a really sound a partnership and, um, and positive relationship. Because we all know as we go through time, we're going to come into situations where the workload is overwhelming, um, the demands uh, are, are, are such that it really puts stress on, on the system, not and on the partnership uh, as well. And to the degree that you can have worked through and talked through these issues and have them documented on a piece of paper, I think just goes a long ways to to ensuring that you got a solid foundation for a good partnership that can withstand uh, the stresses that are going to be put on it. Um, so I just really want to to uh, thank um, uh, council leadership um, staff uh, leadership from the West Coast region. Uh, for putting this together, spending the time to to walk through it, to talk through uh, how we're uh, dividing up the work, because in the end, I think it will pay big dividends to us when when the, the chips are down, so to speak, and and we have a high level of of workload uh, that we're trying to keep the council operation and the management of our fisheries working as effectively and efficiently as possible. I, I don't, uh, so I, I don't have any uh, specific comments for changes. I, I was able to ask my questions and get clarity where I had some questions. Um, my looking at the situation summary, the council action um, is to review and provide co final comments uh, down below under C3 C, it talks about adopt a final regional operating agreement. And my understanding was that the adoption of the agreement or the, the signing of the agreement, if you will, is left up to the leadership of the West Coast region and the and council uh, and the executive director. Uh, I may not have that correct, but um, so I'll, uh, the, those are my comments. Thanks very much. Thank you, Phil. Further comments, discussion? Uh, I don't know if we need a motion here. Uh, if everyone around the table is fine with the proposed changes to the ROA. And I suppose if there are concerns, we could raise them here, Chuck Tracy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, so so Phil's correct. The, uh, the you know the uh, parties to the agreement will will uh, pass this around for signature. That will complete the process. Um, if there's any, I think if uh, the council is satisfied with the uh, uh, revisions as presented in the in the materials, um, I, I don't know that any uh, further action is uh, necessary. As I think certainly if they if there's some changes that people are contemplating, I think that would uh, uh, probably should be the subject of a more formal action. All right, and I've not heard any suggested changes. Um, and I'll pause for a minute to make sure folks have an adequate opportunity to raise their hand here. And not seeing any hands, uh, Chuck, I'll go back to you and see if we're done here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, I believe we are. All right, great. Thanks very much. Well, um, it's 9.55. Um, let's uh, take a 10-minute break here. Um, we'll be back at 10.05, and we'll pick up
our next agenda item, and you'll have the pleasure of uh, being gaveled by our Vice Chair Brad Pettinger. So we'll see you back at 10.05. Yeah.
All right. Welcome back. Um, we'll now go to our next agenda item, and I will um, hand this off to Vice Chair Brad Pettinger. Brad? All right. Thank you, Chair Grelnick, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, John, I'll look to you to take us, uh, get us started on uh, C4. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. Agenda item C4 uh, concerns development of a uh, West Coast Regional Framework for determining the best scientific information available. The uh, Magnuson-Stevens Act and National Standard 2 guidelines that interpret the act uh, require um, regional councils and the National Marine Fisheries Service to use the best scientific information available in making any management decisions. Um, to that end, there was a NIMS policy directive in May of 2019, which directed uh, the NIMS regions to work with their respective councils to develop a transparent regional framework for determining BSIA and, and document it um, clearly in terms of uh, how stock status determinations are made and information that informs catch specifications to be used in any management decision making. So the uh, policy directive was very clear that um, th this this process was uh, really just documenting the current processes used um, in each region for determining BSIA, and it, it's very clear that this isn't a national. Uh, there's no intent to have a national uh, policy or process for uh, determining BSIA. These are regional region specific. Uh, documents. And in this case, um, the uh, West Coast region and the science centers have been working uh, uh, fairly closely with our SSC to help develop this draft framework. And we've had, uh, previous to this meeting, we had three uh, meetings with um, <clears throat> NIMS representatives to um, discuss the framework uh, with our SSC and uh, the draft that you see uh, before you is um, uh, been informed by those discussions to, to some degree. So uh, we have uh, for your consideration in the advanced briefing book beyond the uh, situation summary, we had attachment one, which is uh, a, a very concise summary of uh, the regional framework. Uh, document and the reasons for it, and then um, an accompanying uh, workbook with FMP specific spreadsheets that go into details on the different uh, uh, processes for each FMP for determining BSIA. And then it goes into, of course, uh, HAKE as well, which is um, uh, a species and a fishery managed jointly with the. Uh, um, with Canada as part of um, a treaty. So uh, we've had some uh, very good uh, back and forth on all of this uh, with uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service and our SSC. And um, it, a supplemental to the advanced briefing book, we also had this supplemental attachment three, which provides a little bit more information from NIMS on the framework. And then um, at this meeting, we have uh, a supplemental NIMS presentation that uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin Werner and Dr. Kristen Koch will uh, go over um, shortly after I uh, finish this overview. And uh, we also have a, uh, a supplemental NIMS report, which goes into answering some of the uh, questions and and uh, issues brought up by our SSC and our uh, the salmon technical team. I will uh, let those reports speak for themselves. Uh, also supplemental uh, to the briefing book, we have reports from our SSC and the salmon technical team uh, for your consideration. So those are all the reports uh, that you have before you. The uh, charge here is to provide guidance on the regional framework. As you will see under future workload planning, the, <clears throat> the final step in, 
in uh, determining this uh, framework document is uh, scheduled tentatively for March uh, of next year. And uh, we do need to kind of complete this task by May of next year. So um, there is a, a, a time sensitivity to uh, getting this uh, framework together. And with that, I will take any questions on the overview. Uh, thank you for the overview, uh, John. Uh, questions for John? Okay, seeing none, we'll, uh, we'll now go to um, Chris and Cook and uh, Dr. Kevin Werner um, for the presentation. All right, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. My name is Kristen Cook. I'm the director at the Southwest Fishery Science Center, and I, along with Kevin Warner, will give the presentation today. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to give my, my own little brief shout out to Chuck. I think this might be my last opportunity to do that, so I wanted to just uh, say thank you, Chuck, for all the years of your help and support of the Science Centers. I know when we were all new in our positions here, we Kevin and I traveled to Portland to the, the council offices there and met with you and Mike, and you graciously hosted us for a day to talk talk science and talk about how the science centers support the the council process. So I just wanted to to pre, uh, express my appreciation that I think that day kind of led to a, a, a years long partnership with you on uh, on making sure that our our science was supported with the council, and and I'm very appreciative of that, and I'm looking forward to meeting Merrick. Uh, with that, you'll see the title slide here has a number of people beyond me and my, myself and Kevin, uh, including Ryan, and um, there are a number of people behind this effort, uh, but the two most prominent ones on our staff uh, are Sarah Schaffler and Jim Hasty, and I believe they, they're joining us today as well. So there, you'll see their names up there just in case we get questions that uh, Kevin and I can't answer. So with that, I will jump into the first part of the presentation and then Kevin will will follow me. And um, I think John gave a really nice overview. And in fact, much of what he covered in his, his overview um, will be repeated here on the slide. So hopefully we can just re-cement re for the council's benefit, kind of what this issue is, uh, how what stage of the process we're in today and um, what we're looking for in terms of comments from the council as we go forward. So the, the outline here is we'll cover some background. We'll talk about the BSIA criteria that are in the procedural directive guiding this effort. We'll talk a little bit about the format of the framework um, specific to each of the FMPs. We'll talk about BSIA points of contact with the SSC and then the process for disagreements between NIMFS and the SSC, as well as a, a slide on moving forward. So with that, next slide. There are a lot of words on this slide, but essentially there was, a, as John noted, a procedural directive that came out of NIMFS that requires each region to complete the development of a BSIA best scientific information available framework by May 7th of 2022. Our particular collaborative uh, document that has been in the works now for a while uh, would need to be considered, the, the final of it would need to be considered by the April 2022 council meeting at the latest. And as John noted, we're, we're aiming for March, but I understand there's quite a bit of a uh, uh, number of agenda items on the March agenda and it might have to be kicked to April. Um, the framework itself describes the key science uh, and review process for each FMP culminating in BSIA determinations for evaluating stock status relative to adopted criteria and specifying annual catch parameters as appropriate. It's important to note that it's ultimately, and this is in the directive itself, ultimately the responsibility of no fisheries to make stock status determinations, approve the catch specifications and to certify that these decisions are consistent with BSIA. In doing that, the agency relies on input and advice from the SSCs and, and the peer review processes that we have in place, of course. Um, our framework documents the differences between our, our own West Coast framework and the general NIMS BSIA framework that's described in the procedural document directive. And this is all complementary of the 2016 Federal Register Notice regarding National Standard 2 that, 
that came out that year, which describes the joint NIMS Council regional peer review processes, including our own STAR process, and acknowledges the legitimacy of outside processes, specifically mentioned are those associated with HMS, Pacific Salmon, and Hake in that uh, FR notice. Next slide. So the NS2 guidelines identify seven criteria for BSIA, and they're there on the slide. Um, there's also the importance of peer review is also grounded in an earlier final information quality bulletin for peer review that came out of GAO in 2005. And these notices uh, together provide agency flexibility in determining how and when to best conduct peer review. Next slide. The framework format, which by the way, as John noted, uh, we have spent uh, at least a couple of uh, council meetings now briefing the SSC on this format um, on both, on all four of the FMPs. So this has been well, pretty well vetted through the SSC. And so what you see today is the draft. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, um, the final come in, in March or April. So the framework format, um, the summary is C4 attachment one. It spells out the need for the framework and the format. It identifies the importance of peer review. It describes who the PSCs are for the SSC. It describes the process in the case of disagreements. And then that workbook that John also mentioned, uh, C4 attachment two, outlines in a spreadsheet form the, the five sections of the framework. And each section identifies who the partners are, the participating groups, and the role of each partner in the step, recognizing that not all partners have a role in, in every step. Next slide. So the first, we're gonna just walk through four slides on the, um, uh, on the um, individual FMPs. The first piece is the Groundfish CPS BSIA framework. The, this covers the review processes for the range of assessment products, including the ones you see there, benchmark full assessments, updates, data moderate assessments, data poor assessments, rebuilding analyses, and catch only projections. Um, the BSA certification is done by the science centers to the regional office. The status determination is completed by the regional office. And we did make um, some changes in response to SSC comments to the framework itself. And then this next slide um, is on, sorry, moving forward to HMS. The HMS BSIA recognizing that all Four of these sections are um, quite, in some ways, quite different from each other. Under HMS, as the council knows, we have quite a different process. And so within the framework, the framework documents the international review processes under which stock assessments and proxies for FMP species are reviewed as part of international agreements. And just a reminder, the, the international uh, groups that we do this work within um, the RFMO processes include the International Scientific Committee for Tuna and Tuna-like Species in the North Pacific Ocean, the International, I'm sorry, the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission, as well as the Science Provider for the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. So the document, uh, the framework documents the review processes for HMS stock assessments conducted by NIMPS outside um, the international RFMO arena. And the BSIA certification is done by the science centers, primarily the Southwest Center, to the regional office. And the status determination for those stocks is completed by the regional office. And I think here I will turn it over to Kevin Warner. Thanks, Kristen, and, and hello, Mr. Vice Chair and, and members of the council. My name is Kevin Warner. I'm the director of the Northwest Fishery Science Center, and I will pick up on this slide. Um, so for salmon, I um, just wanted to acknowledge right off the top that salmon is, is unique among the FMPs, not just for the Pacific Council, but for all the councils. So what we did in the document is we document the methodology as, as best as we could determine it. Um, this has been a, a fairly extensive process. 
Um, so we've uh, documented the methodology in the framework for the review process. We've identified the partners, including the Pacific Standard Commission and the state and tribal agencies as best as we could name them. We also documented the roles of the STT, the MEW, and the SSC in the council review process. Um, we documented the contents of the review of the ocean fisheries and preseason report one. Um, we're still, I think this next bullet is important. We're still learning. We, 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 there are some reviews and by bodies that are external to council that, that have not been available to date um, to describe in the framework document. And we have requested information to include that in the document. Um, and the last point, the procedural directive itself allows some flexibility in how the BSIA criteria are met within the abbreviated processes that we have, um, such as the ones that are used for salmon. Um, next slide, shifting to Hake. Um, this is called out separately because of the, the bilateral um, Pacific Hake Whiting Treaty with Canada. Um, so that process is documented in the framework document um, for Hake. Um, the BSIA certification is done through the Northwest Fishery Science Center um, submitted to the West Coast Regional Office where the status determination is, is made. And this is, a, this is consistent with the process that we've been doing at least for the last few years. Um, moving on to the next slide, this is um, covering the points of contact for the SSC. As, as Kristen mentioned, we've been um, working fairly extensively with the SSC on this. Um, one of the, one of the pieces of the structuring agreement is we, we, we will identify points of contact from the two science centers to um, work on an FMP by FMP basis with the SSC um, in, in the case that there's um, any kind of issues. So the, the, the science center people will be drawn from levels ranging from our sort of frontline supervisors up to our division directors. Um, these folks will have familiarity with, with both science and management. Um, the expectations for these folks is that they're, they're not necessarily there to attend each and every single SSC meeting, but they'll stay apprised of issues. Um, they will attend meetings as needed, um, and they'll be avail available for consultation um, with and by the SSC. Next slide. Um, there's a section in the, in the framework on disagreements. Um, before I get into this, I just want to emphasize again, as I have before, that, that we expect this will be used in only exceedingly rare, rare circumstances. Um, we value and appreciate the, the strong working relationship between the science centers and the council and the SSC. And, and you know, we're, Kristen and I are, are committed to, to maintaining that relationship. Um, that said, the, the, the BSI um, framework does include a, 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 a procedure to be used if there are disagreements between the Science Center and the SSC. I'll cover that briefly here. Um, as Kristen noted, the ultimate BSIA determination is with the agency. So it's with the Secretary of Commerce or, or for all intents and purposes, National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, as I was emphasizing before, we will make every effort to avoid and resolve disagreements before using this resolution framework. If we do use this resolution framework, it will emphasize timeliness, collaboration, positive working relationships. Um, and then it, within the framework, it calls out um, a, a special review panel that could be convened by either Kristen or me. Um, it would include external experts that would evaluate the areas of disagreement. Um, they would advise us, Kristen and or me. Um, the SSC would be allowed an opportunity to present to that panel. Um, and then ultimately it would be the, the science center director that would notify the regional administrator and the council executive director um, and the chair of the council on, on whatever decision is made. Next slide. Um, moving forward, um, this is, um, we're going to be revising the framework based on your input over the next few months. Um, we'll be presenting the revised framework back to you at the March or April meeting. Um, and then we'll be finalizing that framework um, before the May deadline we have next year under the procedural directive. Um, the, after there, the, the NOAA Fisheries and Council identify situations where we can strengthen this. So this is not intended to be a one and done forever where we're open to revising this as we gain experience and information over time. I think that's the last slide. Um, I wanted to also conclude by echoing, since I've got the floor here, um, Kristen's sentiment at the beginning of thanking Chuck. Um, I've enjoyed Chuck working with you. 
in my tenure here. I'm going to miss you, and I'm looking forward to um, getting to know and work with Merrick in the future. And so I will wrap up there, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Kevin. Um, questions um, for the Science Center on their centers on their presentation? Uh, Phil Anderson, Phil. Thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, and good morning, Kristen and Kevin. Thank you for your presentations. Um, my questions for Kevin. Um, I recall when this in, this directive came out and the concern that we had relative to salmon and how to make you know how to how to make this work. Uh, I recall that Chuck Tracy and I made a special trip to Seattle to see Dr. Uh, Rick Mathot to talk to him about this and um, on, on, especially on the salmon side. Um, and I, um, I guess in looking at the framework and the timeline that is in the, that is in the graphic, um, I think it's in attachment two. Um, I, I continue to have concerns about how this, how, how this gets applied to salmon, um, you know, um, as the, as the um, paper identified, there's um, a lot of the salmon abundance estimate estimates not led by center scientists and conducted independently. Um, in the case of in the Pacific Northwest, by either state agent the state agencies or the individual tribal entities agencies are producing these preseason run forecasts. And of course, we know that the timeline is tight with salmon from the time you get the forecast to the time the council has to make recommendations on seasons and all of that good stuff. And I'm not convinced, I guess, that I'm not, not convinced yet that, that this framework is going to work. But um, on the fourth bullet of your slide on salmon, it said some reviews by bodies external, external to the council not available for description of draft framework. And I wondered if you could give me an example of, of uh, what's being referenced there. Yeah, through the vice chair, thanks Phil for the question and for the comment. I, I appreciate the <laughs> motivation behind the comment. Um, I, I, I would like to um, see if I can phone a friend here with, with either um, Sarah or Jim, if, if you would like to be able to provide an answer to, to Jim, to Phil's question about a specific example. I don't know that we have a specific example, but uh, in the upcoming uh, report from the Estes, STT, uh, you'll see reference to uh, uh, or mention in their statement about a variety of reviews that are conducted outside of the council process. And of course, some of those are conducted in the context of the Pacific Salmon Commission as well, which we take to be uh, a one of the approved international processes. But aside from from that, you know, there's reference in the STT uh, statement of uh, reviews that are conducted, um, not perhaps not as much on the the annual turning of the crank, but on the methods that are used to uh, formulate the crank to begin with. And so those are the kinds of processes that we're interested in, in at least uh, listing, documenting uh, after, after we get through this initial phase or, or uh, before we reach uh, the submission date for this to the extent that we're able to identify what those are. Does that help, Phil? Uh, a little, thanks, thanks uh, Dr. Hasty. Uh, so, in terms of the um, methodologies, I'll, I'll just 
call them that, that have been reviewed and approved through the Pacific Salmon Commission, either through the Chinook Technical Committee or the Coho Technical Committee, do those have some sort of special standing in that they've been approved through that um, treaty? Basically, it's an implementation of the Pacific Salmon Treaty process. Or may, maybe I didn't understand that. What you no, said no, I those. think that that's correct. And we're assuming uh, that that treaty process, along with the Hague treaty process and the uh, uh, HMS treaty processes that were referenced in the 2016 Federal Register notice as, as being, <clears throat> you know, legitimate external processes that, that fall outside of uh, the more typical joint council NIMS sorts of processes that, uh, that those are embraced. Uh, part of our problem, I guess, is that, uh, you know, Sarah and I in particular don't have a lot of experience with salmon and so we weren't as able to document, say, uh, or lay out, make reference to within the spreadsheet document, um, <clears throat> any of the details of that, like we did for HMS or Hake. Just a quick follow up, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, thanks, Jim. Um, okay, that that helps. I just, you know, I think about things like, you know, the annual debate about what ocean survival rates are, for example, or what the productivity in river freshwater productivity was for a particular um, brood stock and and how those from year to year, particularly you know ocean survival rates for one, change uh, the assumptions into the into the forecast change from year to year depending on you know what it, it information may be at hand to to make those estimates and. So there's just some of those, some of those pieces that go in and elements that go into the forecast that uh, are changing from year to year. Um, and I just, um, and they're either being done as I as I said by, you know, with tribal staff as an example or state staff, and in some cases they they're joint. Um, preseason forecasts and generally everything that comes to the North Falcon process and feeds into the council process in March with respect to preseason forecasts for stocks that are originating in Washington are a product of an agreement between the state and the um, appropriate tribe uh, where that river system resides in terms of their reservation or UNA. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, further um, questions for the science centers? Uh, Corey Niles. Corey? Thank, excuse me. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. And, and thanks, Kevin and Kristen. On slide 11, I believe it was. Yeah, this, this, the first part here is a joke, but you know, I have a couple of disputes with the SOC from yesterday, even and since you're here, maybe you, you could help with those. Uh, but the, um, I'm more curious, and I may have asked you or, or our doctor thought when this was before us um, in the past, I'm kind of curious, you know, how, the, how this would work. Um, and I, I believe there are, these, these disputes will be rare but um, you know, thinking about you know being someone trained in law and seeing how the courts deal with this disputes, you know, being a consumer of scientific you know peer review literature where disputes are maybe never resolved, uncertainties are never resolved, and or slowly over time, and uh, knowing how technical some of these issues are, and, and and for any one person to be able to to understand and and pick who's correct, and when there's probably a, a not a correct answer there. You know, what we often hear our SSC talk about the least worst option. Um, so that's the introduction to say as I'm 
you know, hearing what I'm, if you're following what I'm talking about, and, and since you two would be on the hook, I imagine you've thought about some hypotheticals here. How, how, how will you, does, how will you resolve some of these thorny debates? If you, you know, if you have one or two people, you know, you can end up in a tie. Um, yeah, any, any, any elaboration uh, you have here would be, would be, I would be interested in hearing. So, and appreciate you being here. I guess I can take a stab at that through the vice chair. Thanks, Corey, for that impossible question. Um, I, I think the answer is that it really just depends, right? I, I, we have thought about a lot of hypotheticals here, and I hope that they remain hypothetical. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I'd really say it really depends upon what the issue is, what the perspectives are. Um, you know, we will do our, speaking for Kristen, and you know, she can chime in here too, but we, we'll do our level best to make the best decisions we can based on the information before us. And I, I really, apologies, Corey, I can't really say much more than that without having a specific situation in front of us. Okay. Further uh, questions from the science centers? And seeing none, um, thank you. Um, we'll go to the SSC and uh, Galen Johnson. Galen. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning and good morning to the council. This is Galen Johnson of the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and I'll be reading agenda item C4A, the supplemental SSC report one. The Magnuson-Stevens Act and the National Standard II guidelines interpreting the MSA require regional fishery management councils and the National Marine Fisheries Service to base decisions on the best scientific information available. And a recent procedural directive called for each region to document their process for determining BSIA. The focus of this process is on the current BSIA process for catch specifications and status determinations. The SSC provided feedback on a proposed regional BSIA framework in March and June of 2021, and the SSC received an update presentation on developing a regional BSIA framework from Ms. Sarah Schottler of the Southwest Fishery Science Center and Dr. Jim Hasty of the Northwest Fishery Science Center. This included how NIMS has addressed issues previously raised by the SSC. Overall, the presentation and documents provided describe the existing BSIA process for annual catch specifications and status determinations well. The SSC had requested more detail on the proposed approach to an arbitration process in the case of disagreements between the SSC and science centers. Documentation of this process now describes what the science centers will do in such cases, and at the SSC's request, NIMS has added the National Standard II criteria for BSIA to the framework. Questions were previously raised by the SSC regarding the review and updating of the reference points used in salmon status determinations and about the process for initiating reviews of the processes and models providing inputs to annual salmon management, such as the forecasts used to inform catch specifications. National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration Fisheries has yet to resolve, fully resolve these matters and will continue collaborative efforts to better document processes as the framework is refined leading up to the March April Pacific Fishery Management Council meetings. Uh, the process for designating the BSIA point of contact with the SSD for each fisheries management plan has now been documented in the framework. The SSC had identified differences between coastal pelagic species and ground fish in the review and harvest specifications processes. These are now presented separately for CPS and ground fish in the framework. The SSC thanks NIMS for addressing its comments on the framework from March and June 2021 meetings. The SSC notes that the development of the BSIA framework is continuing with a final version to be considered by PFMC in March or April of 2022. The SSC asks that NIMS provide fuller documentation of the stock status determination process for CPS, be consistent and clear in documenting the role of the SSC in the stock status determination process for each of the FMPs. The SSC notes that no rule is described for the SSC or council in status determinations for CPS or groundfish, and suggests that the final draft framework should add rules or describe why no rules are assigned. And finally, in the arbitration process documentation, clarify the definition of science providers and be specific about the role of the SSC versus other science providers. That concludes our statement. Okay, um, thank you, Galen. Uh, questions for um, Galen on the SSC report? Marcy, you're up to go. Marcy? 
Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you so much, Galen, uh, for the SSC statement here. Um, just a question um, on your discussion about status determination uh, for CPS and ground fish. Um, you mentioned that um, there's no role described for the SSC or the council um, in status determinations and that um, presumably that's um, that's left uh, for the agency to do. Um, so I was just wondering if you could give us um, some an example of um, that situation uh, in the current groundfish uh, stock assessment process. Is that is that the case we're in right now with um, our a few of our stocks um, that that were assessed this cycle? Uh, thanks for that question, Marcy. Uh, unfortunately, you were asking about the one species that I am, or one FMP that I am the least familiar with. Um, I, I so Will Satterthwaite is that I don't know if he has something better to add on that or John DeVore, but I either need to phone a friend or tell you that I cannot answer that. <laughs> uh, John? Yeah, thank you, and to the vice chair, uh, Marcy, uh, it, it, the whole issue of status determination is just the the lack of indicating an SSC role in um, in the spreadsheet in attachment two. But um, and we anticipate that'll that'll be addressed when you see the next version of the framework. But specifically regarding um, like stock assessments done this year and, and some of the recommendations you received from the SSC regarding status determination uh, this year, um, that was discussed in the SSC, uh, you know, relative to those recommendations. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, so that's still somewhat of a, a little bit vague in, 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 in the minds of some folks is exactly how uh, the SSC's role in status determination is made from this presentation you just received from uh, uh, Dr. Werner and, and Ms. Cook, you, 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 they do uh, talk about uh, listening to SSC advice when making status determinations. So right now that's, that's the nexus that um, appears to be um, in play here in the framework. Um, but I think this is one of the issues, of course, that the SSC is bringing up in their uh, report too. They just want to know um, exactly how what their role is in, in that part of the process. I don't know if that was all that helpful to you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, through the vice chair, uh, thank you, John. That is extremely helpful. I appreciate that that clarification, and um, I'm glad to hear that's that's the discussion that was had, and glad to hear that it appears um, solutions are being thought about. Thank you. Okay. Um, further questions uh, for Galen? Okay. Not seeing any. Uh, thanks, Galen. Uh, next up will be uh, Michael Farrell and the uh, STT. Mike. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I will be re uh, reading from Agenda Item C4A, Supplemental STT Report 1, uh, STT Report on Preliminary West Coast Regional uh, Framework for Determining BSIA. Uh, the STT has reviewed the draft West Coast Framework for BSIA, including Agenda Item C4, Attachments 1 through 3, and has the following comments. Footnote E of Agenda Item C4, Attachment 2, states that the Scientific and Statistical Committee has not formally reviewed any of the escapement estimation methods used to inform determinations of overfish status. The STT notes that, the escapement, that escapement estimates are primarily made by regional scientists with expertise in escapement, escapement estimation within the management entities that collect and analyze data and then ultimately produce the estimates. Modifications to these methods can occur on occur as annual conditions change. For example, red surveys can be performed instead of market capture surveys if conditions do not allow for repeated stream access. 
There are many examples of substantial review processes that are conducted for escapement estimation methods that take place each year. Additionally, est estimation and review is performed under very short time frames so as to make the escapement estimates available for stock assessment and fishery planning during the winter and early spring time frame. It is unclear how the SSC could perform a review of escapement estimation methods given the nature of the escapement estimation and annual management schedule. This appears to be acknowledged in footnote D, which states, as noted in National Marine Fishery Service Procedure 011110, within fishery management plans, there are some stocks that will require altered or abbreviated BSI procedures because of extremely short timelines or a preponderance of involvement by state or tribal entities, such as for Pacific Salmon with the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Footnote E of agenda item C4, attachment two also states, of note, the standard review time in our COP4 is two weeks. At least since 2013, preseason report one has not been released more than four full workdays before the start of the SSC, and in several cases, less than one workday before. The availability of this report is driven by the timing of data availability, often in February, and the additional time needed for modeling prior to the March Council meeting. The STT agrees with this statement and notes that, the, that it is infeasible for preseason report one to be produced any earlier than it currently is, given the availability of data and forecasts, the timing of meetings with, within the Pacific Salmon Commission assessment process, the need to perform retrospective assessments such as core reconstructions, and a time required to provide initial harvest model runs given current abundance forecasts and the previous year's regulations, also known as the no action, no action alternative. This, ex uh, this extensive combined set of information is vital to our current salmon management process that begins at the March meeting. It is difficult to see how more review time could be provided without fundamentally changing the existing Pacific Council management schedule, along with the schedules of the state, tribal, federal, and international agencies and entities that provide data and analyses that are essential contributions to preseason report one. And that concludes the STT statement. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, questions um, on the STT report? Oh, I'm not seeing any hands, Mike, so thank you. Um, next, we'll go, I believe, to uh, Ryan Wolf uh, for a supplemental uh, NIPS report. Um, Ryan? Um, thank you, Chair. Actually, I'm, I don't believe I'm, I'm the one to give this report. Um, this report was submitted by the Science Centers. Okay, well, my, my work log, I have to defer to you, I guess. So, um, Sorry, what was the question, Brad? Yeah, I think it's, it's Science Center. Report. Okay, is someone going to, um, or has that been covered? I, I believe a lot of the points made um, in in the presentation you received uh, just a, a while ago um, are also just identified in that supplemental NIMS report, but I see Ryan's hands up, so I'll let him speak. Yeah, Ryan? No, I just wanted to say that that was a, a, an initial response from the science centers uh, that they covered in a number of their report, um, uh, but that came directly from them, so um, I, I won't be able to answer any questions about it. Okay. Um, do we have any public comment? Public comment? Okay. Um, well, with that, I guess we'll go to a public comment. And uh, this is there, there is a public comment. Oh, I thought you said it was. Okay, my bad. I thought I got a thumbs up on public being public comment. So, okay, um, I'll open the floor up for um, council discussion.
No public comment. Um, Marcy Remco. Marcy? Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Just clarifying, we are on to uh, council comments. Um, I'm sorry, Marcy, we, uh, we were having a discussion here. So, what was that again? Just clarifying before I proceed that we are, in fact, on to council comments. Um, council action discussion, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, <sighs> I'm struggling with this agenda item. Um, I am often wondering what the council's role uh, here is with BSIA just generally um, when determinations of BSIA are made. Um, sometimes I find myself wondering why um, things are on the council agenda when we may really not have any role. Um, you know, a good example that I ran into uh, beginning in June is, you know, why, why is it that the council is being asked to adopt stock assessments when, you know, the determinations have been made that it's BSAI, BSIA and, and we really don't have um, much flexibility to say anything about it. Um, I mean, we can say <laughs> things about it, but it may not um, make a meaningful difference. Um, I was, it was suggested to me um, months ago that the topic to, uh, or the, the, the place to raise questions about the council's role uh, with adoption of stock assessments is here in this agenda item. So I'm raising it. Um, I guess when I look at the materials in front of us, um, I'm not sure, um, that I feel a lot better about, um, knowing our role, um, based on the West Coast region's, um, <clears throat> preliminary framework, um, I'm, I think, uh, looking at the SITSUM, wanting um, more transparency, um, and at least um, the policy directive was directed to um, provide that transparency, um, I thought, for the public and the council and um, advisors. Um, so that we have a little better understanding of what constitutes BSIA and, and how it might be used and what, what the roles are of various folks that, that use it. Um, so I'm, I'm not, not sure that we're getting closer <laughs> um, with the materials in front of us today. Um, I guess I just like to highlight, you know, two major um, issues that have been on the council's uh, agendas uh, this year that um, involve BSIA determinations and applications of them and just speak a little about those examples and um, where um, I think a little more understanding of, of BSIA um, and the roles and responsibilities of um, those that are applying them, um, how that how that fits into our, our work here and our public process. Um, I'll use the example of the Copper Rockfish uh, South of Conception assessment um, and the Quillback assessment. Um, and also the example um, of Sunk Coho uh, that we took up this week. Um, at least in the case of copper and quillback, uh, determines were made. Determinations were made that you know these assessments represent BSIA, and so you know why we um, again need to go through the process of adopting them. I'm I'm really not really sure. Um, I think our role comes in when it's about how to use them um, and how we apply them to management and. Um, you know, less about the if and more about the how. 
Um, but it would sure be nice if there was some sort of criteria along the lines of, you know, what to do when BSIA maybe um, conflicts with other BSIA. <laughs> uh, in the case of data streams for copper and quillback, and we have, have catch information on these stocks that show that the stocks are regularly encountered. Um, and in fact, encounters and catches of these stocks are increasing, um, which might infer that fish are abundant um, since they're a regular um, and growing component of the minor nearshore catch. Um, so I, I would take that catch data stream to be BSIA, but yet the, the outcomes from the stock assessments say otherwise and say, you know, essentially tell us that these stocks don't exist, at least in the case of Quillback. They're gone. So um, I just have a hard time understanding how we deal with cases like that where, you know, BSIA uh, determinations <laughs> um, you know, we, we have no um, no recourse but to use them. Um, in the case of um, Sunk Coho, um, in that situation, we're, we're looking at a Coho Fram model where um, we're being asked to um, approve. Um, the use of the FRAM model as a predictive tool of the impacts that will incur to Sant Coho um, and use that tool preseason to project what the impacts will be postseason and then tie our hands to that preseason predictive tool. When at best there is a poor relationship between the preseason prediction and the, the postseason realized impacts. And really not seeing any um, flexibility um, in how um, the council considers uh, the application of that BSIA or recommendations on it. Um, so um, I guess that just kind of brings me to thinking that, you know, it would be useful if the, there was a way to evaluate the, the magnitude of the implications that come with using certain BSIA um, and ensuring that they reasonably relate to the degree of review or the, the veracity uh, of the, the BSIA that um, is being proposed for application. So um, I'm just looking at the sit sum and, um, you know, the goal here is to develop a transparent regional framework for determining BSIA and to document it. Um, so I guess um, I'm, I'm not feeling like um, there's more transparency here. Um, I'm just feeling like the the words on the page just seem to kind of be words and we wait for these cases to kind of come out and, and greet us and say, yes, you know, here's BSIA. And then, then, you know, again, I'm, I'm, you know, finding that our ability to, to um, comment on it or change its application or consider the, the, <laughs> veracity of it, you know, those, those opportunities, you know, aren't there. So anyway, I, I, I don't have any real suggested edits, um, but I'm just noting, you know, I think um, that this, this isn't at least for, you know, my purposes, the, the advisory bodies and such, this, where we're headed doesn't, add a lot of transparency, which I thought was the goal. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Um, Corey Niles, Corey? 
Thanks, Mr. Chair, yeah, and thanks for those thoughts, Marcia. I think you're asking a lot of good questions. Um, on, I'll pick up on your transparency and also the fact I'm having trouble thinking of a a dispute, a real example of a dispute that would be run through this process that we've that, that we've had in recent years. I can't think of one, and I think it's Marcy saying. Um, I, I can't think of the famous quote about the Supreme Court, but it's similar of, you know, I don't think any of us think the SSC is infallible. They're just kind of final in this process, and we, we respect that, even though we don't agree with it all the time. Um, they're the most competent body in this group and in this council process to, for making those decisions. There's uh, never a good, perfect decision. Or on tough ones, there, there's not a, a correct answer. There, there is, you know, a, a consensus answer often. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm having trouble seeing a real world example. And it seems only that only NIMS could raise the dispute here. But on transparency, I mean, a question for Ryan or or Kevin or Kristen, but and I haven't absorbed all the words in, in the framework, but on transparency, I presume if there were dispute and this, this process were run and a decision was made on who was correct, that would all be written up the rationale for why why the best available science was decided as it was and brought back to the council, you know, via the, oh, on the issues where the council's involved. Um, I presume there would be some capturing of, of the rationale and decision and, and, and public announcement of that. I didn't articulate that very well, but yeah, I don't know if Ryan's the best or as that this comes through the, the region on the flow chart and figure one there, but am I correct in assuming we would we would get the rationale back on why the decision was made on the dispute. Uh, Ryan. Yeah, um, no, I, I'll, I'm going to turn it over here to Kevin Warner in a, in a minute, but but we do have been doing BSI determinations for quite some time. We, we document them. Uh, I would imagine that, that it would be very similar in this case, but as your question is specific to kind of this dispute process, maybe I'll, I'll open the floor up to Dr. Warner. Through the vice chair, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, I've, 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 both of the last two questions, I just wanted to chime in and offer that for, for Groundfish and Hake from the Northwest Fishery Science Center perspective, and I, I think, you know, Kristen could chime in on the Southwest, I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure it's similar. We've been doing best scientific information available certifications to the regional office on our stock assessments for years now. Um, and I don't, you know, the, the, the framework as it's been laid out, um, you know, pretty much reinforces that, that existing process and structure. So I would not expect to see that change. Um, you know, our, our BSIA determinations, as we said in the presentation, they go to the regional office rather than to the council. And we're, you know, I, they're not secret or anything like that. We're happy to share them so you can see an example of what they look like. Um, I just wanted to sort of chime in and offer that perspective. Yeah, from my perspective, we've been doing these BSIA memos for years uh, for HMS because of the international processes. We've recently started doing them for CPS. And as Kevin says, they're, they're available. Um, and in the case of some dispute having to be resolved through this process, to answer your question, Corey, I think um, I would agree, yes, there would be documentation of any decision that was made through that process and made available. Okay, Ryan, your hand's still up. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, for the discussion? Uh, Joe Oatman, Joe. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And try to take an opportunity to uh, provide a comment as it relates to tribes uh, under this item. As travel agencies were noted in a couple of instances today. So in this specific council, the tribes are recognized as management entities and contribute to the council process. To the extent applicable and relevant to tribes in their role for the data and information they may provide, or which may be used in this ESIA framework and process, 
it will be important to understand how it will be treated and used. I think it would be our expectation that tribal data and science, as developed from tribal agency fishery data surveys or assessments, are to be considered valid and legitimate for the purpose of BSIA, including those that may not be published or peer reviewed. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to uh, provide that comment upon um, hearing the uh, presentation that was provided to us today. I meant to try and uh, pose a question to the uh, uh, no fishery that they're given their PowerPoint, but uh, I failed to get my hand up in time. So, so appreciate uh, you know do that now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Joe. For the discussion, I did see a hand come up underneath the Joe there. I didn't see who it was. Uh, John DeVore, John. Um, thank you. I just wanted to offer uh, my perspective on one of the questions that um, Marcy raised, and that was uh, why the council adopts stock assessments. Um, I, I just want to point out that it's really an important part of our peer review process that we have that step, because not only does it bring out uh, the SSC's recommendations on an assessment, but it affords the, the council an opportunity to, um, you know, if, if it, within the structured process we have to ask for, you know, some further evaluation. And as you are all well aware that um, that trigger was, was pulled in June when uh, some further evaluation of the copper coil back and spiny dogfish assessments was requested. So, I, I don't think that you want to um, dismiss that part of our peer review process where the council uh, adopts stock assessments. And further, I think uh, just as importantly, um, this affords an opportunity for us to, for the NIMS to um, understand and receive uh, recommendations from both the council and, and the SSC um, that affect their BSIA determinations. And uh, I don't think you want to, um, I don't think you want to derail any part of that process. So I, I think it is important that we go through that step of the council um, adopting stock assessments. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, Corey Niles. Corey, you're, um, you're muted. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. And I, I guess that's proof it does work. You don't have to ask if you can be heard. <laughs> you will tell us. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's o worth getting into spending a lot of time today, but I'm, I'm uh, agreeing with John, um, but also hearing Marcy's frustrations about what, what is the council's role here and I, I I'm also wondering and this, this is I don't expect this to ever happen but we wouldn't want this to become a process where people come and, and bring reasons why this dispute resolution process would be triggered for an assessment that the council has issues with I guess I would have concerns if that's how this would be going I don't think that's what you're saying John DeVore but um, just speaking to raise I have I have questions in mind that that don't have to be resolved now, but there, there, I think there are questions floating out there that we can look at as, as I'm sure as everything, this framework can be changed if, if um, new information and circumstances say it's not working as intended. But yeah, um, I, I, do, I do wonder how, you know, some of these questions we have assessments might play in, into this process at one point, but not not needing to be resolved now. Okay, thanks, Corey. Further hands? Okay. Um, John, how, how are we doing here? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, no, I think you've you've satisfied uh, the council action on this. Uh, you provided some comments. Um, certainly, we'll we'll transmit uh, these comments and um, the recommendations from 
uh, the SSC and the STT uh, to the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, for their consideration as they um, uh, revise the framework and, and provide a, a more complete uh, framework for your consideration next spring. So uh, with that, I'd, I'd say that you've had a good discussion and you've completed the action under this agenda item. Okay, thanks, John. Just to see if there's anybody, any other hands. They won't say anything else at this point in time. Okay. With that, um, Chair Gronick, I'm going to pass the gavel um, back to you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Vice Chair Pettinger. And we will uh, move on uh, to Groundfish and uh, agenda item E5. And uh, I'll turn to Todd to uh, get us started there. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good late morning, Council. Um, as the Chair indicated, this is E5, Biennial Management Measures for 2023 and 2024, the counterpart to E3. So under this agenda item, the Council is to consider management measures for 23, 24, 2023, 2024, groundfish fisheries. Um, and consider adoption of a final range of management measures necessary to implement harvest specifications for more detailed analyses and provide guidance as necessary on routine adjustments to management measures. Um, management measures that are applicable to this action are those that have been previously analyzed, are defined in regulation, or are necessary for ACL management, mitigating potential impacts on protected species and or critical habitats. Such items um, include uh, the opportunity for the council to recommend stock complex alternatives based on harvest specification values that were adopted under agenda item E3, identification of specific set aside amounts for trial allocations, um, adopting and or modifying ACL deductions, and as well to a chance to review sector allocations. Um, I will note that uh, agenda item C, or excuse me, agenda item E5, attachment one, uh, is a summarized version of the management measures that are under consideration uh, at this point. For council reference, the council uh, could also adopt new management measures for a detailed analysis during our overwinter period. The council should, however, consider carefully consider the list of potential new management measures proposed by management entities, advisory bodies, and the public when deciding which issues are the highest priorities for a more detailed analysis. Several new management measures, including the repeal of the Calcutt Conservation Area and Short Valley Rockfish Management are under consideration for inclusion into this biennial cycle. National Marine Fisheries Service under National Marine Fisheries Service Report 1 and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife under ODFW Report 1 have offered, um, offered these reports for the council to consider as you uh, speak to this action. For reference, the council is scheduled to develop a preliminary preferred suite of management measures at its April 2020, uh, 22 council meeting. And the analysis of those management measures that the council adopts under this meeting will be available for council review in April. Uh, after a public review period, the council will take by, um, final action on the biennial management measures at its June 2022 council meeting with implementation scheduled for January 1, 2023. So looking at the list of reports the council has before it, uh, you will note that we do have some a NIFS report. Uh, you have two tribal reports, supplementary report from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife report, three reports and three presentations from the GMT. And I will note that the GMT plans to give the presentations that will correspond to those reports instead of reading the reports due to their length. Um, additionally, uh, there's a gap report and a habitat committee report. Looking to the council's action, it is to adopt stock complex alternatives for analyses as appropriate, adopt deductions from the ACLs and trial allocations for analysis, adopt preliminary two-year allocations for analysis, adopt a range of new measure measures for more detailed analysis, and provide guidance on routine adjustments to management measures. Um, 
with that, Mr. Chair, I am happy to any, answer any questions on my abbreviated overview, or um, I would recommend that you just move right into the reports. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Todd. Let me see if there are any questions on your overview. And uh, not seeing any hands, we'll get started with reports. And uh, we'll first call on NIMPS and Keeley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am prepared to speak to agenda item E5, uh, NIMPS report one. We'll note that um, because this report was in the advanced briefing book, I intend to provide some overarching remarks, um, but won't be um, reading through all of the the report, but certainly will be available to answer questions as needed. We offer this report to assist the council in selecting a range of alternatives for new management measures associated with the 2023-2024 groundfish harvest specifications action. We think that some new management measures lack crucial timing needs related to January 1, 2023, lack urgency enough to move forward in this time constrained and workload constrained action, or may be more complicated than initially thought. Our concern is that including an overly optimistic suite of measures will be a detriment to progress on other actions under development during the next 18 months as we reshuffle work time to focus on this top priority action. I will note that in our report, um, we called out a few of the new management measures that have been dis discussed thus far, um, provided specific feedback as well as a summary table. Um, specifically, I'll note um, we offered um, should the council agree with our recommendation to move these new management measures out of specs um, offered where we think that there is a viable alternative pathway to be proceeded i'll specifically note that for the cow cod conservation area removal um, we are specifically recommending that the council take this up under the non-trawl rockfish conservation area action um, which will be followed by this agenda item we see a lot of similarities um, between the CCA action and the non troll RCA adjustments, um, and they have similar um, analysis needs, in particular related to um, any changes to where bottom contact gear is allowed to fish will need habitat analysis and could likely be efficiently covered in one action. Some of the other new management measures that have been put forward on this list, including prohibiting directed a directed fishery for short belly rockfish and groundfish retention in the salmon troll fisheries changes. Um, we have not identified a specific other pathway for those items, but do note that the council has um, shaded on the March uh, agenda to take back up the workload and new management measures prioritization action. And we feel like that would be um, an appropriate place to discuss whether these items are a priority and in what order for the council to identify alternative pathways for those to be taken up. That's my overview of the report. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions on it if there are. All right, thank you very much, Keely. Are there any questions for Keely? I am not seeing any hands. Keely, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, we've got a number of reports. We'll go next to the Supplemental Tribal Report and Joe Oatman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and apologize for the slight delay here. Uh, but we have the uh, two supplemental tribal reports. Uh, I do not intend to uh, read directly from those reports, but I do want to provide a uh, brief summary uh, for each of those. Uh, so the Supplemental Tribal Report 1, uh, that is a letter from the Macaw Tribe addressed to Mr. Barry Thom, expressing intent to continue all of its existing groundfish fisheries. This is consistent with the procedures outlined within the Federal Register. The request includes the standard 17.5% tribal share of the U.S. whiting and request an increase of Pacific Ocean perch from 
9.2 metric tons to 130 metric tons within the 2023 to 2024 biennium. The second is the the second supplemental travel report is the preliminary 2023 to 2024 tribal management measures document from the tribes. This document contains preliminary 2023 to 2024 tribal fisheries. It includes two adjustments to the tribal set asides. The Macaw tribe requested an adjustment for Pacific Ocean perch from 9.2 metric tons to 130 metric tons. The Quinault Indian Nation requested an increase in the treaty set aside for dark, dark blotch rockfish from 0.2 metric tons to 5 metric tons. Uh, additionally, um, Mr. Chair and Council, uh, it is uh, my understanding that the Widing will be taken up under the annual widing regulations and not under this agenda item as relates to as relates to uh, tribal uh, measures on that. With that, Mr. Chair, um, I can try and address any questions um, that council or others may have with respect to the two supplemental travel reports. All right, thank you very much, Joe. Are there any questions of Joe on the travel report? Thank you, Joe. Uh, we'll now go to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife report, Marcy Remco. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a second here, I'm having a bit of a computer issue. Um, Ink. Should we come back to you, Marcy? No, nope, I'm getting okay. There we are with other devices. <laughs> Hooray. Um, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, this report on biennial management measures is uh, really an update of reports that we've submitted um, back in June and then again in September on our waypoints and the corresponding non troll RCA boundary lines. Um, as a uh, other state agencies uh, do as well. Uh, CDFW has been um, collecting input on the waypoints that um, are present off the state of California um, and suggestions from industry, from uh, CDFW enforcement um, and others on the waypoints and their placement and how that affects the, the boundary lines that um, establish our non troll conservation areas or uh, rockfish conservation areas. So, um, you know, we, we do this on an ongoing basis. A lot of folks uh, will comment to us about um, a, a boundary line not approximating a depth contour very well. Um, folks have identified in the past uh, issues with waypoints that result in um, boundary lines that cross one another. So a correction is needed. Um, and then uh, similarly, uh, our enforcement folks have identified some uh, cleanups needed on some, some of the RCAs that um, create difficulty with enforcement, um, creating little, little slivers of area that are very difficult um, to enforce. So um, we've been taking all of this information um, into consideration over the past uh, two years or so and um, provided our first cut at uh, proposed revised waypoints um, back in June. Um, at that time, our focus was on the Calcod conservation area. 
And um, at that time, the proposal was to include a repeal of the CCA uh, in the uh, biennial specifications package. Um, so we embarked on a process of developing a series of waypoints that um, might be appropriate for use that uh, exist in that big swath of the Calcott area so that in the event we moved to um, more of a traditional RCA type management in that area, we'd have waypoints that were available to use in the depth contours uh, that were under consideration. So um, this package uh, presented here today, I'm not gonna go through it all, um, but it really, it's just an update um, and cleanup from um, the information that we've previously submitted. Some folks, uh, as I think uh, we discussed uh, with the council um, in those um, past reports, our, our goal with submitting um, our waypoint proposed corrections early was to get some informal public review so that folks could kind of look at some maps and look at um, proposed changes and consider them and talk about those uh, with us. So um, we did get a number of um, inquiries based on the content that we submitted uh, in this agenda item um, since June and have worked with industry um, and our enforcement folks to um, bring a complete set of proposals here in this packet. So um, that's what we have for you today. Um, I think I mentioned that the CalCOD, well, the, so that the items, the proposals fall into um, four general categories, um, the repeal of the CCA and replacement with RCA uh, waypoints, um, the request from CDFW enforcement, um, the request from industry, and those um, waypoint corrections that are needed to clean up crossovers. So, um, we characterized each of the proposals as uh, falling into at least one of those categories. Um, and so the resulting maps and, and tables uh, fall from, from there. So with that, I'll, I'll take any questions on our process and our proposals. And um, again, this, this content should replace what previously was submitted in the briefing book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcy. Are there any questions of Marcy on the CDFW report? All right, thank you, Marcy. Uh, we have a report from ODFNW, Maggie. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Uh, the ODFW report has three purposes. Uh, to hopefully streamline discussion of short belly rockfish management today by making a specific proposal regarding council, council action at this meeting under biennial groundfish management measures and to provide that proposal in advance uh, through the advanced briefing book for adequate time to review. Second, to indicate ODFW interest in this topic. And third, to describe some of the issues that may need to be considered if the council pursues a directed fishery prohibition. I will summarize rather than read the report since it has been available since the advanced briefing book. The proposal related to uh, groundfish biennial management measures, which is presented right at the top, is that a directed short belly rockfish fishery prohibition not be included in the 2023-24 groundfish specs and management measures process. Uh, it's not necessary to meet the January 1st deadline uh, that the National Marine Fishery Service emphasized. Uh, there is no immediate conservation need, and of course, the capacity of council groundfish staff, the management team, and others uh, involved will be um, fully occupied with groundfish harvest specifications and management measures in the near term. The rest of the report, the rest of the main report, provides additional detail on that rationale, as well as some contextual information. In the background, we recognize the recent designation of short belly rockfish as an ecosystem component species within the groundfish FMP, which we believe heightens its prominence as an important forage species uh, and the council's commitment to that priority. We include the June 2019 motion text in order to highlight the 2000 metric ton threshold, which will trigger a review of changes in short belly rockfish bycatch 
uh, stock abundance, fishing behavior, marketability, or other factors, and reconsider EC species designation. We present a very high level summary of short belly bycatch uh, in ground fish trawl fisheries recently, uh, noting that recent increases in bycatch levels correspond with indications of high recent short belly rockfish recruitment and abundance. We recognize the current concerns about possible development of uh, interest in targeted fishing and the reasons for those. The council has previously agreed that we would not want to see a fishery develop at least before full analysis of potential impacts, including to the ecosystem and to dependent predators uh, could be conducted and reviewed. We restate our conclusion that there is no current or imminent conservation concern, but that being proactive is preferable to reacting to a potential directed fishery if interest were ever to arise. We recognize the process options described by the GMT in September and offer our recommendations related to each and rationale for those recommendations. As I said at the top, uh, we recommend a standalone pathway and in terms of timing, we suggest that this be considered for prioritization and scheduling uh, in March, meaning that in March we do that consideration, we do that considering when we conduct our annual holistic review of groundfish workload and new management measures so that we have an opportunity to evaluate the urgency, priority, and other relevant factors related to a short belly rockfish directed fishery prohibition along with similar considerations for other potential measures at the same time and make uh, an informed choice about when the best time to potentially schedule a standalone process is. Uh, we acknowledge that this will likely mean a slower process uh, than moving through the groundfish biennial specifications for 23 and 24. We feel this is not problematic given the absence of current conservation concerns, current short belly rockfish status, close monitoring and bycatch avoidance, and our belief that the rapid development of a directed fishery is implausible given the infrastructure requirements and other factors. We remind everyone that many items take a lengthy period of time to move through the council process and that a slow track is not indicative of low priority or interest. Finally, the appendix provides a starting uh, list of items that could be useful to consider if the council pursues a directed fishery prohibition. I have heard some statements that prohibiting uh, a directed fishery for short belly rockfish should be a simple thing to accomplish and uh, frustration that it's not being done in specs for that reason. One reason I wanted to provide this information in the appendix is to better illustrate why I think it may not be a simple exercise. Uh, and in addition, I hope that the information provided in the appendix uh, could help inform uh, future scoping of a directed fishery prohibition and provide a little bit of starting momentum there uh, if the council chooses to pursue it. I won't read or summarize the appendix uh, other than I would like to highlight the importance of understanding existing patterns of non-targeted short belly rockfish encounters in current groundfish trawl fisheries before developing any definition of directed fishing for this stock and associated limits. Noting that patterns with short belly rockfish are very different than with the SEBA-1 species, for example. I think with that, I will conclude and happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much, Maggie. Let's see if there are any questions from around the table on your report. And I'm not seeing any, thank you very much, Maggie. So uh, we have quite a number of reports and a number of presentations from the Groundfish Management Team so I'm going to invite Lynn Mattis to come to the microphone, so to speak, and uh, provide us with information from the Groundfish Management Team. All right, thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Um, we are gonna tag team this a little bit. You're gonna hear from me for a little bit, and then I'm gonna defer to Katie P uh, Pearson. Um, similar to how we handled 
E3. We do have a number of reports in the briefing book, but rather than read those to you, we, we have developed some pr uh, presentations to walk through the highlights and the key points of those. Um, just based on some experience of the previous cycles, this seems to have worked well for everyone, uh, rather than listening to us read a 30-page report. So, we have three reports uh, and three presentations, and the presentations are go with the reports. So first off, we have uh, presentation one, which Sandra is kindly uh, displaying on the screen, and this covers the information in supplemental GMT report one. This report focuses solely on action item number three in the uh, action item checklist that Todd described a few minutes ago. Uh, next slide, please. So ju just as a reminder, because I know there are a couple of council members who this may be your first spec cycle, um, off the top deductions are an amount that's taken from the ACL to account for sectors that the council does not actively manage. This includes tribal fisheries, research projects, incidental open access fisheries, such as the uh, directed Pacific halibut fishery, the sea cucumber fishery off California, uh, and then as well as the uh, exempted fishing permits that you all approved yesterday, or approved for public review yesterday. Today. And, and it's a balance with setting these values. We want to set them high enough that we allow those sectors to proceed without endangering the ACL, but we also don't want to put it, set them so high that it could impact uh, and strand fish that could be available to our fisheries. So we take the set asides off of the ACL, that gives us our fishery harvest, harvest guideline, and then the fishery harvest guideline gets separated out into fisheries, which we'll talk about in presentation two. Next, please. So the first of these set-asides is the tribal, uh, which Mr. Oatman spoke to a few minutes ago. Um, based on the, the request from the tribes and their report, specifically in Supplemental Tribal Report 2, uh, we do recommend adopting the set-asides as outlined in their reports, making note that for most species, the requested set-asides are the same as for the last cycle, the two differences being dark blotched rockfish and Pacific Ocean perch. Previously, dark blotched was at 0.2 metric tons, and there's a request for five. Uh, and for POP, 9.2, and uh, request is for 130. And uh, I believe these are to account for some additional encounters in the midwater fisheries. Next, please. For research, uh, this, this includes all sorts of things like the NIMS trawl survey, the IPHC longline survey, the hook and line survey down off of California, and other federal and state research projects. Recently, the council has been setting the species specific set aside equal to the maximum catch since 2005, except for yellow eye and cow cod, which are highlighted in bright yellow in this table. We do include lingcod and Pacific spiny dogfish in this table to point out that research catches in 2019 were higher than the previous maximum high, the previous set aside. Uh, therefore, the GMT is recommending to increase the set aside to those high levels. For yellow eye rockfish, uh, the council has been setting the set aside at 2.92, and that counts, accounts for some very specific projects, um, some Washington Fish and Wildlife, Oregon Fish and Wildlife, the International Pacific Halibut Commission, and I, I believe we've added some California Fish and Wildlife there too. For cow cod, um, next slide, please. Yep, there we go. Uh, for cow cod in, in 2011-2012, the council set 10, 10 metric tons off of the ACL, which is above the ACT that we'll get into in the next presentation for research. Uh, the GMT was not positive on what projects might be going on. Um, if anything's planned, if that number is still appropriate. So we don't have a recommendation on, on the cow cod, but we did point out that it was 10 metric tons that we had last cycle. Uh, next slide, please. For the incidental open access fisheries, as I said, these are the fisheries that the council doesn't have a role in active management, but there are some impacts to ground fish species. And similar to the research set asides, the council has been setting those based on the maximum high for high catch for most species. However, last cycle, uh, the council did choose, rather than the maximum high, to go with the long-term average for petrali sole and dark blotch sole. They're dark blotch rockfish. Apologies, it's been a very, very long week for the GMT. I did not invent a new sole. 
And recall under the in-season discussion back in September, we talked about yellow-eye rockfish in the Pacific halibut-directed fishery. Uh, at, that's where the majority of the impacts in the incidental open access sector come from. And the council chose to go on the, uh, to go with the average of the years that that fishery has been observed, which is three years. Next, please. So here's a similar table of, with the incidental open access. The species highlighted in yellow are the ones that uh, we're recommending going with something other than the historical max. The other species in this table, and this table is in the report as well, uh, Boccaccio, Canary, and POP, we are highlighting those because the the 2005-2020 max value is higher than the previous set aside. You notice for Boccaccio and Pacific Ocean perch, it's minor, uh, less than 0.5 metric tons for each of those. Those are up due to based on updates to the data that goes into the groundfish expanded mortality reports. Uh, for canary rockfish, there were some additional impacts uh, noticed in 2019 and 2020, and the GMT recommends increasing from 1.31 to 2.83. As I mentioned, with dark blotched rockfish and petrali sole, the previous cycle, the council chose with, to go with a long-term average. The GMT recommends that as well. Um, for dark blotched rockfish, the difference is less than 0.01 metric tons. Uh, there was a, a little bit of a difference in petroli sole due to the small amount of impacts in 19 and 20, so that would actually decrease from 13.3 to 11.1. For Sablefish South, uh, we recommended 25 metric tons last time. That was an increase over what had previously been encountered, plus some buffer to account for a large year class that, that was thought to be coming in through the fishery, so we still recommend that. Uh, already mentioned yellow eye. And then with nearshore rockfish north, there was a large increase in impacts in the Iowa fishery in 2019. And out of that 4.15 metric tons, I believe it was about 3.7 of that was copper rockfish from the directed halibut fishery. Again, that's a fairly newly observed fishery and that fishery is going through some changes. The GMT did not think, uh, we, we treated it similar to yellow eye rockfish due to the great amount of uncertainty with that fishery at the moment. Rather than going with the maximum high of 4.15, going with the average of the three years that that fishery has been observed, which comes out to be 1.3 metric tons. Next, please. Uh, exempted fishing permits. Uh, I'm sure you all recall the discussion yesterday. You forwarded, I believe, five out of six or six out of seven EFP applications. We have updated our tables to include the set-asides for those specific EFPs that were forwarded, um, and that's in, in the table. We recommend the council adopt the total amount for those set-asides. Next, please. So in summary, we recommend adopting the values requested in tribal report two for the tribal set aside. For research, adopt the max high for all species except yellow eye, which we recommend 2.92 metric tons, and cow cod, which we are, we'll leave up to you all to determine. For incidental open access, adopt the max high for most species except for dark blotched, petrali, yellow eye, sablefish south, and the nearshore rockfish complex and for exempted fishing permits, adopt values from the forwarded EFPs. The actual values for all of those species by species for 2023 and 2024 can be found in tables in appendix one and two in supplemental GMT report one. Next, please. And with that, I will answer questions. All right, thanks very much, Lynn. Uh, let's see if there are any questions on the GMT presentation, I guess this is presentation one. Uh, Marcy Remco. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lynn. And I know how hard <laughs> this week has been for you. So um, I appreciate your work here um, on this presentation and the content in your supplemental report. Um, that said, I'm, I'm, I, I kind of, <laughs> I'm not sure where to start. Um, I'm a little 
surprised, I think, by the content here under the discussion of off the top deductions um, in that these are deductions that are needed um, in the to, to be taken care of now as we move through our specifications process. Um, I really appreciate your uh, slide that um, shows, you know, very simply um, where we are in the step that um, that at slide two um, that the eight from the ACL we take the set asides out and that that leaves the fishery harvest guideline. Um, I'm thinking particularly about quillback and copper rockfish off of California. Um, I would have expected that to be like the biggest of discussions in this report. Um, and so I, I'm, because <laughs> we're going to need to deal with research um, for those species, research set asides. Um, and so I guess I'm, I'm wondering, um, and also estimate the take in the incidental open access fisheries for those two stocks, recognizing um, how constraining they're going to be to our California fisheries. Um, and so I don't know if, if um, that was just not possible um, at this point in our slate of actions and that the expectation is that we'll be talking about IOA and research set-asides for those two stocks um, as we move forward in future months or, or um, I guess, just wondering. I mean, I again, I know how strapped you are for time, but um, to me, that would have been the, the biggest topic needing attention. So if you can help, <laughs> I'd love to hear it. Uh, through the through the chair, Mr. Rimko, um, I I was given a heads up that this question likely would come up. Uh, we did not focus on this introductory report on the the actions and the discussion that happened under E three just due to some timing issues. However, that being said, knowing that there's some additional scrutiny and some additional interest on those two species. Uh, we've already started looking into some stuff. We are prepared to bring something back, whatever we can come up with by by Sunday, um, have it for the Sunday discussion for you all, where we do try to pull out whatever we can for copper and quill back out of that near shore rockfish south complex. It just the timing of when that discussion happened under E3 and when some of these reports were due, it just didn't work out for us to include now, but it is on our radar and we can try to provide supplemental for um, the, dis the second part of this discussion. Uh, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, thank, thank you, Lynn. I sure appreciate it. I wasn't intending to add to your workload um, this week. I, I guess my question is, um, I think we're at the process or at the stage in the process now where we're adopting um, preliminary um, IOA and research set asides and an ROA. So, I mean, can uh, I, again? I wasn't <laughs> wasn't expecting you to work um, on your day off to do that. Um, but I, I just wanted to flag that it seems like it is uh, going to be a hugely important consideration as as we move forward um, in our management measures discussion. So. Um, I guess I'd ask council staff if if that needs to happen now, this meeting, or um, if it can wait, because it is a, a Friday, and I know, you know, <laughs> resources aren't necessarily going to be available to, to us over the weekend, and I, I, I'm not intending to put more on your plate, but thank you for, for the discussion. All right, thank you. Further questions on this portion of the GMT presentation? Uh, Marcy. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, I, I'm just hoping to get some concurrence from council staff that we don't have to tackle those items here today. 
and that we'll have an ability as we further develop our ROA to add in research and IOA set asides on those stocks. Is that is that correct? Mr. Chair, uh, I can answer that question. Um, yes, um, yes, ugh, sorry, words again. Yes, Ms. Niranko, um, I, it doesn't necessarily need to happen um, today, noting that there wasn't, a, there, well, as you well noted too, that there wasn't a whole lot of time between the E3 and this agenda item for the team really to uh, tackle um, some of the outcomes from E3. Uh, I know that the GMT, as you well acknowledged, is, is still quite busy, especially with end season coming up. Um, Lynn did note that the team could provide some preliminary information for you, um, but just in the grand scope of things, um, it's something that, that, that we could provide a, a, probably a better analysis for the council if we worked it over the, uh, the winter and then brought it back at our check-in in March. Um, that would be my uh, understanding and advice uh, for council to consider. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Sounds sounds good to me. All right. Uh, any uh, further questions? All right, Lynn, um, you're still on unless you're ready to toss to Katie. Nope, you get me for for another one. Uh, and, and and then I'm going to quit talking at you at you all for this meeting, I believe. So this is agenda item E5A supplemental GMT presentation two, and this covers the information cover, uh, contained within GMT report two. Uh, we again are using the action item checklist as our roadmap and this particular item. Next slide, please. So th this particular report covers items one, two, four through 11, noting that we've just talked about number three. Next, please. So item number one is any outstanding specifications. So if there was any holdovers from E3 yesterday, the day before, I don't know, days are blending in. Um, right now, the team hasn't identified any outstanding specifications other than, you know, I think some stuff that we all know are going on, but there wasn't anything new that we identified. Next, please. Item number two, uh, there, uh, the, the CDFW report that uh, I believe Mr. Remco spoke about a few minutes ago, looking at the minor adjustments to RCAs off of California to better align with the bathymetry lines and depth contour crossovers. Uh, we recommend that these adjustments continue forward as we have in previous cycles. Next, please. Uh, action item number four, treaty fisheries management. Uh, we recommend removing this particular item from the action item checklist and future checklists as the tribes self-manage within their set-asides. Requested set-asides for off-the-top deductions and the GM can considerations for those are included under action item number three, and we just don't know that this action item is needed in this list. Next, please. Number five is talking about ACTs, annual catch targets, which are set below the annual catch limit. Uh, recall last cycle with the new uh, assessment of cow cod and the ACL going quite a bit higher than it had been. Uh, the Council for Precautionary and Flexibility Reasons set the ACT at 50 metric tons, um, and that was for all the cow cods south of 4010. Um, I believe that air, that in that area, it's technically split into two stocks, but it, it would be impossible to manage to the, to the uh, separate areas. So recommending a single ACT of 50 metric tons for cow cod south of 4010. And this is the same as what was done last, last cycle. We will be discussing ACTs of sorts under yellow eye, for yellow eye rockfish, but it's not an overall ACT, it's a non-trawl sector ACT, and that will be covered under agenda item number 11. Next, please. For action item number six, this is two-year trawl and non-trawl allocations. There's a few species that are listed in this table uh, where there are in regulations 
formal sharing arrangements between the trawl sector and the non-trawl sector. The GMT is not recommending any changes to those from what was done in the previous cycle. Uh, so we're recommending status quo or no action for all of those. Next, please. Uh, we, we did have a placeholder for depending on what action was taken under E3. However, at this time, it's our understanding the only species being removed from a complex is quillback rockfish from the near shore complex south. And that complex does not have the trawl non trawl allocations. Uh, therefore, it doesn't need to be considered uh, as part of this action item. Next, please. Action item number seven is the Amendment 21 trawl non trawl allocations. And at this point, I believe Lincoln South is the only species that's left as an Amendment 21 stock. Currently, it's trawl 40%, non trawl 60%, and there has been low attainment the last couple of years by both sectors. There's a table showing what the ACLs, the fishery harvest guideline, and then the allocations and attainment percentages have been recently. And based on all of this, the GMT is recommending no action at this time, maintain the 40-60 split. Next, please. Action item H, this is for harvest guidelines for stocks within a complex. Uh, one of the key, the key one here is black gill rockfish out of the slope rockfish south of 4010 complex. Uh, we can continue the Amendment 26 allocations of 4159 trawl non trawl for the black gill only. And then the Amendment 21 allocations to the remaining species within the slope complex, which is 63 to trawl, 37 to non trawl. And on the next slide, I've got a table that breaks all of that out for us. Oh. Can you go back to the previous, please? Thank you. Um, I'll discuss that table here in a moment. Thank you for being on the ball. I appreciate it, though. Uh, for the for a couple of our for our three new complexes, fairly new complexes of Blue Black Deacon in Oregon and Cabazon Greenlean in Washington and Oregon, the GMT does not see a need for formal harvest guidelines at this time. The states have been doing a good job of managing those complexes and species within them to the species specific complex uh, contributions. Therefore, we do not believe that those are needed. And then the action item checklist referred to the near shore rockfish north of 4010 state harvest guideline shares. We discussed that under item 11. Now the next slide, please. So this is the breakdown for black rockfish. Uh, for 23 and 24, how the math works um, with the, the black gill, the black rock, black gill rockfish share, then the other rockfish slope share, and then what that total would be. Uh, so for 2023, the black gill share for trawl is 70.7 metric tons. For the remainder of that complex, it's 330.5 for a total of 401.2. So that's how the math works. Um, this table is, I believe, table 12 in the report so that it, it's very clear how this all came about. Next, please. Table nine, or action nine is within trawl allocations. Um, we recommend that in the future, this item can be removed from the checklist as the former within trawl allocations were all converted to set asides uh, due to a lot of work by industry and a couple of former GMT members last cycle. Next slide, please. For number 10, at sea set asides. Um, again, many changes to the at sea set asides were done for 21, 22 uh, to accommodate expected mortality in both the uh, at sea and IFQ sectors. And again, here's where a lot of coordination, especially uh, by Sarah Nayani, Dan Waldeck, um, working with Patrick and, and Jesse and others on the GMT. And based on all that work um, and not hearing any requests, we recommend, uh, we do not recommend any adjustments for the next biennium. Next slide, please. Now we get to uh, action item 11. This is within the non trawl harvest guidelines and shares. And this is where I was going to, as I mentioned, talking about yellow eye. The stock is continuing to rebuild well ahead of schedule. And we recommend continuing the status quo sharing proportions 
um, noting that the non-trawl sector uses both an ACT and harvest guidelines for precaution and flexibility. The, the HG is, which is in the second from the left column there, draft 2324 HG, that is the value of applying the proportions to the fishery harvest guideline directly. However, the last two cycles, the council has chosen to adopt a non-trawl ACT, which is said at I don't remember the exact reasoning off the top of my head, and if it, somebody asks, I may have to phone a friend, um, but it, it was specifically set at a, a level lower than the ACT based on, I believe, a differential SPR harvest rate. The net result is that it's uh, about a 78, it's a, the ACT is approximately 78% of the HG. Then we manage the non-trawl fisheries to the proportions based on that ACT. That provide, still provides, um, a significant allocation for the, the the fisheries but if some if a certain sector goes over for some reason we do have that buffer area between the ACT and the HG uh, to, to be precautionary in our management and I hope I didn't just confuse you all as I was confusing myself describing that next slide please for CalCod south of 4010, uh, the GMT recommends maintaining the 50-50 split for the non-trawl and trawl allocate. Oh, I'm sorry, 50-50 split between the non-trawl allocation to the recreational and the commercial sectors as has been done in the previous cycle. Uh, for Boccaccio, uh, last, last cycle, we did combine the near shore and non-near shore into one allocation, the 0.4% to near shore really had no function and it was a remnant for from uh, the overfished area. Therefore, we recommend maintaining the same percentages and the same sharing as we saw in 2021-22. Next, please. Sable fish south of 36. Uh, again, there's been low attainment in both the limited entry and open access sectors in the south for a variety of reasons. And based on that, we don't see a, a need at this time to change. So we recommend the no action allocation, which is a 70-30 split. Next, please. Near shore rockfish complex north of 4010. Uh, we recommend status quo sharing arrangements to the states to set the state specified harvest guideline. This is a complicated table and it's table 21 in report two. Um, and those proportions are based on uh, species specific percentage based on some area from the assessments. Uh, so now that we have new assessments, uh, for example, um, copper off of Washington, uh, Washington would get 100% of that and California and Oregon North of, or Oregon and California North of 4010 would get 0%. Same thing with the, the copper off of Oregon, Washington would get 0%. Oregon would get 100 and California would get zero. But other species that are just uh, done north of 4010, the percentages are based on some information within the assessments. Uh, so, but we're recommending status quo sharing of that arrangement. Next, please. And with that, uh, I suspect you may have questions and I will do my best to answer in a timely manner. All right, thanks very much, Lynn. And uh, Brad Pettinger has a question for you. Yeah, thank you, Chair Gerlich. Um, Lynn, I think on slide 11, I think you had uh, some numbers switched on the black gill uh, for 2024. She was troll having uh, quite quite a bit more than, uh, way more than its percentage that you'd just spoken to earlier. Uh, through the chair, Mr. Pettinger, um, I suspect you may be right. Um, th this was we were trying to hurry and finish this report late yesterday afternoon. Um, I, I, I'm not as familiar with this as some of the other team members, but I, they do look like they're flip-flop to me as well um, in the top half of the, the table. We will double check it, double check the table within the report and provide a supplemental update uh, as necessary. Thank you for that information. Yeah, and if I may, um, I, I'm not sure those numbers actually uh, add up to the proper uh, balance between the the split. So anyway, very good. Thank you. Thank you. We, we will double check the table in both the presentation and the report to make sure it's the correct information and uh, provide a supplemental uh, updated report 
to make sure, sure it's the correct information. All right. Eagle Eye, Brad Pettinger. So um, further questions on the GMT presentation two. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands. Um, so we'll go to GMT presentation three, Katie Pearson, welcome. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Um, for the record, my name is Katie Pearson. I will be providing the supplemental GMT presentation of supplemental GMT report three. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to correct a hyperlink in our report uh, where we're speaking about short belly rockfish under 12B. Um, there's a reference uh, that I think is a link to the open access regulations, but it was meant to be a link to the agenda item C.A.A, GMT report one, September of 2021. Next slide. Um, so as Lynn mentioned, I will be kind of talking through uh, the action item checklist uh, numbers 12 through 18. Uh, so uh, action item 12 is the new management measures uh, and then action items uh, 13 through 15 are dealing with daily trip limits and then action items 16 through 18 are dealing with uh, recreational fisheries. Next slide. Um, so action item 12A is the cow cod conservation area repeal. Um, so as noted in the NIMS report, uh, there is a potential high workload and not necessary, not necessary for implementation by January 1st of 2023. Uh, therefore, the GMT recommends that this item be moved back into the E6 uh, non troll rock rockfish conservation area item to be discussed at this meeting. Uh, that's also due to, oh, <laughs> if you could, yeah, thank you. Um, that's also due to um, uh, efficiencies that can be created with analysis of doing both of those items at one time. Thank you, Sandra, next. Um, action item 12B is the directed short belly rockfish prohibition. Uh, this is a potential high workload as noted in that GMT report in September and is not necessary for January 1st of 2023 implementation. So therefore the GMT recommends that the council move this management measure out of the harvest specification cycle. Uh, we do not have a recommendation into which pathway uh, to go into, but as noted in that report in September, there were two pathways identified, um, a standalone groundfish FMP amendment or uh, the addition to a list of shared ecosystem component species, which would require amendment of all of the council's FMPs. Um, Next slide. Um, so action item 12C is the salmon troll incidental groundfish items. Uh, so the GMT has su suggested a holistic look at groundfish retention in the salmon troll fishery. Uh, we do not believe that this item needs to be done by January 1st, 2023, or as part of the biennial process. Uh, and the recommendation from us uh, that is not noted on this slide, but it is a recommendation um, that this item gets agendized as a standalone item and considered for prioritization under future workload and planning. Next slide. So action item 12D is the rebuilding plans. And the GMT reports some values from the rebuilding analysis that were, were adopted under E2. Um, and so if NIMS declares the stock overfished, uh, then we will see a rebuilding plan that will need to also be formally adopted. Uh, so basically running through some of these numbers that you've, you're now probably pretty familiar with, but quillback rockfish off of California, uh, the T-min is 2040, uh, which is of course outside of 10 years. And so that means that the T-max can be uh, the T min plus 26 years, which is one mean generation time. So that would mean that the T max is 2066. Um, the draft rebuilding analysis range of SPR would successfully rebuild the stock by 2066 or earlier. And 
uh, the GMT would like to request additional runs of the SBR harvest rate at 0.55 and 0.65 to further examine, examine the trade-offs of alternative rebuilding strategies. Um, we also have noted here some uh, information about copper rockfish off of uh, California, south of Point Conception. Um, T min is 2033, which is of course within 10 years, and so therefore T max is also 2033. Um, the only viable alternatives uh, to rebuild the stock by 2033 would be an SPR of greater than or equal to um, 0 0.935. Uh, that being said, pooling spawning output across California results in a statewide fraction on fish of uh, 31.7%, which is a, above the minimum stock size threshold. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then this was kind of a very late breaking um, uh, item. Uh, that we put kind of under new management measures just so that everyone could be made aware. Um, this is a proposal coming from the GAP. Uh, we're calling it the groundfish retention in the non troll rockfish conservation area with select gear types. So the GAP is proposing a new management measure that would authorize selected hook and line gears within the non troll RCA south of 4616 on North Latitude or the Washington, Oregon border. Um, due to the late timing, the GMT was in, unable to discuss this proposal in detail and therefore does not provide a recommendation. Uh, next slide. Action item number 13 for the shore base IFQ. The GMT has not received any requests for changes to the shore base IFQ trip limits at this time. So next slide. Um, action item 14A, open access fixed gear fisheries north of 4010 uh, north latitude. Um, and I just wanted to note that kind of as we go through uh, these stable fish items uh, north of 4010, I'll, we'll note that the major changes are uh, the elimination of the daily trip limits so that the weekly and bi-monthly limits can be achieved in fewer trips. Um, or just in general, we're trying uh, with the gap um, to make it so that the weekly and bi-monthly limits can be achieved in fewer trips. Um, so stable fish, uh, the status quo would be ma maintain the 600 pound daily limit uh, in the stable fish open access daily trip limit sector. Option one would be remove that 600 pound daily limit uh, to just make 2,000 pounds weekly and 4,000 pounds by monthly limits uh, would remain. And then again, the quillback rockfish and the copper rockfish are kind of placeholders um, until further um, kind, of, kind of conversations uh, can happen. So again, these would be adjusting by monthly limits to implement those 2023-24 harvest specifications. Uh, next slide, please. Action item 14B, open access fixed gear fishery south of 4010 North Latitude. Uh, you will recall that in uh, the 2019 to 2020 limits were uh, 1,600 pounds per week and 4,800 pounds per two months. Uh, so that was um, increased by quite a bit in the 21-22 cycle. Um, and so that's the status quo now, um, which will be 2,000 pounds per week or 6,000 pounds every two months. And that's the highest they've been since 2010. Uh, and there are no requests that we've received so far to change those. Uh, so we'll just be kind of looking at the status quo. Um, once again, Quillback and Copper uh, have placeholders that we will adjust the bi-monthly limits to implement 2023-24 harvest specifications. Next slide, please. Uh, oh, sorry. Limited entry fixed gear fisheries north of 4010 North Latitude. Um, you will also see this uh, as an in-season request during E7 at this meeting. Um, so this is reflective of the current option one in the in-season request. Um, so recall that the 21-22 limits were 1,700 pounds per week and 51. 
hundred pounds uh, every two months. Uh, so that would be the status quo to analyze. And then option two would be uh, 2,400 pounds per week and 4,800 pounds every two months. Um, and once again, quillback and copper, we will adjust by monthly limits uh, in order to implement the harvest specifications. Next slide, please. So limited entry fixed gear fisheries south of 4010. Uh, status quo um, is 2,500 pounds per week, which is again the highest uh, that it has been since 2010. Again, no request to change. Um, and once again, uh, Quebec and Copper are as a placeholder, uh, adjusting by monthly limits uh, to implement um, the 23-24 harvest specifications. Uh, next slide, please. Action item 15C is the limited entry fixed gear primary sablefish tier fishery. So this uh, request is to extend the season from October 31st to December 31st. Um, the GMT does not provide a recommendation, um, but does say that it could be taken up under either this process, so the 23-24 biennial harvest specifications process, or uh, the fixed gear catch share program review, which is currently scheduled on, on the year at a glance for June 2022. Um, and so the GMT does not provide a recommendation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so Wa Washington Recreational uh, will be using um, various things to uh, manage their fishery. Uh, those things will be bag limits, season changes, and seasonal depth restrictions. Um, next slide, please. So Oregon Recreational um, will be considering uh, bag limits, fish length limits, uh, se seasonal depth restrictions, and really, um, to note, the black rockfish and nearshore rockfish species are really going to drive the season's uh, structure um, for Oregon into the future. Um, next slide, please. And then California Rec Recreational uh, will be managed by bag and sub-bag limits, uh, season lengths, and seasonal depth restrictions. And the next slide, please. So with that, I'll take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Katie. Uh, questions for Katie on this report. Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair Gralnick. I had a question on Pardon me, I believe it was slide seven. No, shoot. Well, let's not try to go to the slide, but it was your uh, discussion of the potential new management measure suggested by the gap uh, to allow certain gears uh, in the non-trawl RCA, at least uh, south of the Oregon-Washington border, I, I believe, if I recall correctly. And I uh, heard you say that the GMT, because of the timing of when that came in, the GMT was not able to discuss and doesn't have a recommendation on. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I wonder if the, the GMT, I mean, is that, did you not have any time to discuss at all? at all and uh, including whether the GMT would potentially have the time to conduct appropriate analysis of this item uh, as we go through the process. Through the chair, thank you, Ms. Summer. Um, that is a correct uh, uh, a, a, um, characterization of that we did not get to discuss those details at all. Uh, this came in kind of as we were trying to get five reports and three presentations out of the door. Um, so the discussion was very um, brief, uh, but I mean, it was a good discussion, but there were, I wouldn't say that it was a full GMT discussion. There were a lot of people doing a lot of different things. Uh, so there was 
Um, I mean, of course, it's hard in this virtual uh, format to really know who's paying attention to doing what. Um, but I would say uh, definitely the discussion that we had did lack the actual um, kind of workload of the GMT um, okay. timing kind of discussion. Thank you very much, and and my appreciation to you and the the whole GMT for your work on uh, many weighty topics over these few days here. Uh, Marcy Yurimko. Yes, <clears throat> yes. Thank you. There was a strange lag there. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Katie. Um, I think it's slide eight where you, yes, shore-based IFQ, you've received no requests for changes to the IFQ trip limits, um, but did the GMT discuss the need for establishing um, some sort of limit or prohibition on um, certainly California quillback rockfish um, and probably also some measure for copper. I, I can't recall offhand exactly how we deal with um, nearshore rockfish bycatch um, in the IFQ shoreside fishery, um, they don't have quota share, but I think there is some some rule <laughs> uh, that discusses this. So I was just wondering if the GMTs had a look at that. Through the chair, uh, thank you, Mr. Yurimko. Um, I might phone a friend on this one. Um, <laughs> I think Lynn is going to stand by and help me answer this. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, Ms. Yurimko, we, ha we just haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, uh, I think a number of us kind of forgot that um, there, there could be some IFQ impacts to that fishery, um, but it was something that is definitely going to be on our list now. It, we just hadn't got there yet. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lynn. I, I, I know and I understand and I apologize for putting something else on the list. Um, and, you know, this is certainly going to take some time to work through and um, you did the best you could with no time. So just want to thank you again. Yeah. Through the chair, Mr. Remco, um, we, we were expecting these questions on copper and quillback based on the actions that were taken um, under E3. Um, we were still trying to digest ourselves what that would mean and then how to move forward. Uh, and we do anticipate working and discussing with the states, with NIMPS, with the industry and how, how to proceed on all of that. And uh, we'll be coming back to you in March or April with uh, more information. Sounds good. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, any further questions on uh, report number three, presentation number three? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Katie and Lynn, for those reports. Uh, we're going to take our uh, lunch break here, and uh, no reason uh, to shorten it today, so we'll take a full hour. Um, we'll be back at uh, 1 22, <laughs> um, and we will continue. We have uh, two more reports. We have a report from the GAP. We have a Habitat Committee report, and then we have a number of public comments. So we'll see you all back in about an hour.
All right, welcome back. <clears throat> it's uh, 1.22. Hope everyone <clears throat> got some lunch during that break. I know there's a lot going on. So we are in the middle of agenda item E5 and uh, up next is the gap report. Uh, Dan Waldeck, welcome Dan. Good afternoon, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, Dan Waldeck with the gap. I'll be reading agenda item E5A our GAP report on biennial measures for 23-24. The GAP and GMT discussed the suite of management measure alternatives for the 23-24 biennial. As in the past, we provide some general comments and then work through the items in order as identified in E5 attachment one, that is the action item checklist. The GAP comments on only those items which we provide additional support, recommendations, and or suggestions. We do not provide comments on items that we believe represent appropriate ranges for analysis to move forward. In general, the GAP discussion centered around whether the proposed range of management measures were sufficient to provide flexibility to the fleets while managing some very, some likely very strict ACLs anticipated for Vermilion Sunset Rockfish, Copper Rockfish, and Quillback Rockfish, particularly in California. The GAP acknowledges there may be significant workload and discussion regarding the new information and is trying to balance expected workload with the needs of the fishing fleets. Regarding stock complexes, the GAP understands California quillback will be removed from the nearshore rockfish complex, anticipating it will be declared overfished. The GAP does not support inclusion of comprehensive restructuring of the stock complexes in the biennial harvest investigation process due to workload, which the GMT speaks to in agenda item E3A, GMT report two under stock complex. Management measures for copper and quillback rockfish will create dire consequences, which is an understatement. As fishermen have said, we are in survival mode. That is not an understatement. The ACLs and measures necessary for managing to those ACLs will likely be, by necessity, draconian. Fishermen have been grappling with ways to increase pressure. Sorry, fishermen have been grappling with ways to decrease pressure on these nearshore stocks while targeting the shelf species. Fishermen also remain cognizant that yellow eye rockfish are still sensitive to fishing pressure on the shelf, so midwater fishing methods are preferable if available. To that end, the GAP reiterates our recommendation to allow the regulatory use of jig fishing gear in the RCA as soon as possible via whatever vehicle is best. This action could have significant economic benefits to the LE fixed gear and open access fleets as the nearshore areas become more restricted. As noted in our biannual management statement from September 2021, recent stock status information indicates midwater species in nearshore zones are relatively healthy and abundant. Therefore, the GAP recommends the Council consider development of measures that facilitate access to these species by commercial and recreational fleets using big water gear. This is likely to provide fishermen more opportunity and relieve some of the pressure on nearshore bottom dwelling species. Area management. The GAP supports the proposed RCA management line updates as described in CDFW reports from June to September 2021, because this action will be helpful to fishermen. GAP members appreciate the department's work on this. Off the top, deductions, research, EFGs, and ISCAL open access. The GAP supports exploring a range of changes to the off the top deductions for research and open access to accommodate open access fishermen to target short spine thority head north of, 30, of 3427 north latitude. The current trip limit is 50 pounds per month, but open access fishermen would like to increase that number to 100 pounds. These are valuable fish to the open access fleet, and this action would also prevent regulatory discards while fishing for stable fish. Annual catch target. The GAP suggests the council may want to consider revising the Calcod Rockfish ACT in light of potentially reopening some of the CCA. The GAP does not have a specific ACT recommendation at this time, and consideration of a revised ACT may be more appropriate in April or June of 2022. Similarly, given the increase in the yellow eye ACL for 23.4, the GAP may consider revising the yellow eye ACT. We flag these issues more as warranting further consideration and potential action in future meetings. Rebuilding species allocations, yellow eye rockfish. The GAP recommends revisiting this in April 2022 as part of the 23-24 measures package as the council considers redistribution of effort from the near shore to the shelf. Harvest guidelines, state shares for stocks in a complex. The GAP anticipates looking at this more closely in April 2022, especially for near shore rockfish north of 40 tests given the effort to decrease fishing pressure on your shore stocks. Within trawl set aside at the whiting for 2023-2024.
the GAAP recommends continuing use of the at sea whiting set aside values from 21 22 for the next biennium. Recognizing the analysis and tribal requests under this agenda item could necessitate further consideration in April 2022. Within, not, within non fall harvest guidelines, ACPs or shares. As has been discussed, the GAAP anticipates significant restrictions to some stocks, particularly as more effort will shift from the nearshore areas to the shelf. We anticipate more discussion about this suite of management measures in April 2022. New management measures. Calcod Conservation Area Repeal. The GAAP remains interested in this topic moving forward. However, it is unclear what regulatory vehicle is the most appropriate. During discussions with the GMT, it sounds as if the most appropriate place for this issue is in the non-trawl sector area of management action, that is, agenda item E6 at this meeting. The GAAP supports removing this from the management measures package and adding it to the non-trawl sector area management if, and that's a bold italicized if for those reading along, that is the quickest path to getting these area changes into regulation. As we have stated before, measures like this that will provide more flexibility to fleets, which is needed now more than ever because of the needs to reduce impacts on cobalt, copper, and vermilion sunset rockets. Repealing the CCAs will be extremely important for fishermen to access midwater stocks such as chili pepper rockfish. Furthermore, habitat impacts will be part of the analysis for the CCA line changes. It is possible the required analysis will likely take more time than is currently available in the biennial specifications process. Prohibited directed fishery for short play rockfish. This has been discussed several times and the gap defers to the NIFS report and the Oregon Park Fish and Wildlife report under this agenda tab. Access to the non trawl RCA with hook and line gear. The GAP requests the Council consider including non trawl RCA alternative 1, sub option A2 and B1, and alternative 2, sub options A2 and B2, from agenda item E6 attachment 1 within the new measures for the 23 24 biennium. This is also discussed under agenda item E6, supplemental GAP report. This would authorize selected hook and line gears to be used within the non trawl RCA south of 46 16. Prohibited gears would include bottom long line, pot, bottom gill net, vertical set line, and dingle block. This management measure would be in place to provide immediate relief to the near shore stocks that were assessed during this cycle, that is copper rockfish south of Point Conception and fullback rockfish, California, Oregon, and provide increased fishing opportunity to rebuild midwater stocks and economic relief to the fishing industry. Trip limits, bag limits, and season structure remove the daily trip Sorry, remove the daily limit for stable fish, daily trip limit for open access south of 36. This action would provide more flip, sorry, this action would provide more opportunity for open access fishermen, particularly in California, many of whom will need the flexibility due to the restrictions in the near shore fishery and the gap support this measure. Routine adjustments to the non trawl RCA configurations, trip limits, and size limits. Sport fishermen in Southern California recommend RCA line changes to access the northwest portion of Nine Mile Bank. The northwest corner is all within the 100 fathom line and would allow access to both commercial and recreational fleets out of San Diego. It is an area rich in chili pepper, green blotch, and focaccia rockfish. This would allow fleets to more efficiently avoid vermilion sunset rockfish and is deeper than areas where copper rockfish typically inhabit. Extension of primary LE fixed year season end date to December 31. This management measure may become part of the trailing actions package from the primary LE fixture package that is intended for council discussion in March 2022. However, like the GAP's CCA line change suggestion, we would recommend this move forward in whichever vehicle we get it implemented most quickly, that is in time for the 2023 season. And to clarify that, that doesn't necessarily mean January 1, 2023, but in time for at, at some point during the season in 2023. California recreational bag limits, season structure, length limits, etc. California sport fishermen on the gap also support the potential use of size limits that would need to be determined for vermilion and copper rockfish as a tool in the toolbox, paired with the use of descending devices to increase fishing opportunity. This may help avoid a major economic fishery disaster, potentially a loss of $60 million or more due to boats and businesses going out of business in California. Furthermore, the GAP supports including an analysis to enable survival credits for use of the setting dice devices for vermilion, copper, and fullback rockfish. These are already in place for canary, cow cut, and yellow eye rockfish, and the three vulnerable rockfish stocks have similar physiology. That is, 
large rib cages, thick gas bladders, uh, etc. GAP members noted there was likely to be expanded use of descent devices regardless because it's important in reducing mortality. However, survival credits may provide more flexibility for fishing operations. That ends the GAP report. I will answer questions to the best of my ability, and I believe Mr. Richter is also in the wings if I uh, need help. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Dan. Uh, questions for the GAP? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Waldeck. And this one may, in fact, be for Mr. Richter. Um, I'm just hoping that you can characterize the GAPS discussion uh, surrounding off the top set of sides uh, for the newly um, constraining stocks, meaning the, the copper rockfish and quillback off California. Um, you may have heard the GMT's uh, discussion earlier that they just, um, you know, did not get to that uh, part of the discussion. But um, I'm just curious as to um, what transpired in the gap room um, and if you would expect there to be um, off the tops for, for those species. Thanks. Uh, through the, the chair, Mr. Rake, so that's a very good question. And if I, if I don't get to it completely or, or don't provide a direct answer, I, I presume that, that Mr. Richter will, will step in. Um, I, I think the way the GAP discussed this was that, um, and I believe the GMT spoke to this as well too, is that typically the research and incidental open access set-asides are for the, are for, well, one for research and then for the non-groundfish fisheries like salmon that incidentally catch um, groundfish species. Uh, and so the suggestion here, and I think maybe it's an, an, a fair analogy, is that in the past, when, when the whiting fishery found itself um, up against some hard caps for, 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 for rockfish species, the council was able to dip into those um, research and open access set aside late in the year to provide relief to the whiting fisheries from being shut down. So I, I think what we're suggesting is that, is that because creative thinking is necessary for these California fisheries, if there is the ability, if there's any room in those research and it's still open access amounts to provide a little bump for the open access groundfish fishery, I think that would be helpful. And I think that's what the gap is getting at. Did that answer your question, Marcy? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Dan. Partially, um, I'm trying to understand what those off the top set asides will be um, because I'm not seeing any any information in front of us to consider as to what that amount might be. So I, I, I support your 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 thinking. Um, I I'm just wondering where those numbers might be. Again, through the chair, and, and again, Mr. Rick, for a very good question, and and Mr. Richter might have a better recollection of our conversations in the gap, but I do not recall specific amounts being discussed. I I, I felt this is more of a conceptual conversation, and if the council were to move it forward, then obviously we would have to think about those amounts. Yeah, Mr. Chair, good afternoon. And uh, Marcy, we didn't talk about it. I, you know, specifically to quillback and copper, uh, we did talk about it for the shorts, I want to say short spine thorny head north, and how they might come up with some fish for that sector because it looks like we don't have enough to do it for in season. I, we're working on that statement right now. So my recollection from talking to the GMT, we're going to try to take something off the top there to try to facilitate that fishery. But to answer your correct, your question directly, we did not talk about copper and quillback. And to be honest, I never even thought about it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair Gerlnick. Uh, thank you to the GAP for the report. Uh, I have a question on the new item, access to the non-trawl RCA with hook and line gear. Um, realize you, the, in the report, the GAP mentions that it is also described in your report under agenda item E6, and I'm sorry, I'm not uh, looking at that right now. Maybe my question is answered there, uh, but my question is, uh, in in this report, you mentioned authorize selected hook and line gears uh, without any further detail on what specific gears those would be. And the description of prohibited gears states it would include 
those gears, um, which leaves it open to, it might include other gears too. So I, I guess I'm, I'm looking to see if the gap had uh, got any more specific on gear types that would be allowed or prohibited at this point in your discussion. Uh, Chair Borelnik, uh, Ms. Summer, uh, also a very good question. And I believe the way that it was characterized was that the gears that are currently legal and gears currently used in EFPs. If you need more specificity than that, or if I love that response, then I believe Mr. Richter could add additional detail. Um, Mr. Chair and Maggie and you, Dan hit it right. I mean, that's, I think we get to more specificity in the next statement uh, under E6 and stuff, but what Dan said is correct. Thanks to you both. You're welcome. All right, further questions on the GAP report? All right, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for the report. It doesn't look like we have any further questions. So what remain, remains is the Habitat Committee report, and uh, Corey Green is going to read that. Corey, are you with us? <clears throat> yes, can you hear me? I can, go ahead, thank you. I'm just trying to find the notes, hold on a sec. Here we go. Thank you, Chair Grelnick and members of the council. Happy Friday and appreciate your attention. Uh, I'm reading agenda item E5A, Supplemental Habitat Committee Report 1, Report on Biennial Management Measures for 2023 to 2024. The Habitat Committee discussed potential habitat issues regarding the removal of the cow cod conservation area, or CCA, protecting a significant prey species, a short belly rockfish, and the status of quillback and copper rockfish. The HC concurs with the National Marine Fisheries Service recommendation in agenda item E5A, NIMS Report 1, that removal of the CCA should be considered under the non-trawl rockfish conservation area agenda item E6, rather than this agenda item E5, since the CCA action doesn't have to be done by January 1st, 2023. In addition, it would facilitate completion of additional habitat impact analyses and discussions between California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Oceana, and Industry on new measures to protect coral and sponge habitat within the former CCA. The HC had provided recommendations with, uh, we've provided a link here for a habitat analysis on this measure in September 2021 and suggests that these still may be relevant to the proposal. The HC continues to support consideration of a prohibition on a directed fishery for short belly rockfish to maintain these important forage species and their contributions to ground fish as a component of essential fish habitat and the broader ecosystem. As the HC included in our September report to the Council on Ground Fish Specifications, short belly rockfish are potential prey species for stocks in all of the management plans, as well as seabirds and other unfished marine species in light of council intentions to limit overfishing yet recognizing that incidental catch occurs the hc supports continued evaluations of ways to limit directed fishing on short belly rockfish and finally regarding quillback and copper rockfish habitat and ecosystem considerations may be relevant to depletion for example these fishes have small home ranges and are closely associated with local nearshore reefs and kelp forests Kelp forests are vulnerable to warming oceans and have been decimated in many areas by urchins as a result of cascading environmental conditions within the nearshore ecosystem and as invasive kelp species. Rebuilding plans should take these factors into account. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Corey. Are there questions of Corey? <clears throat> I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, so Corey, thank you very much for the Habitat Committee report. And that completes all of the reports uh, on my list and will take us to public comment. We have a number 
of folks signed up. So we'll wait for that list to come up on the screen here. We have seven speakers. So we'll start with Jamie Diamond, followed by Bill James. Good, uh, good afternoon, Chairman Grillnick and council members. My name is Jamie Diamond. I own Stardust and Coral Sea Sport Fishing Vessels out of Santa Barbara, California. And I'm on the board of directors for the Sport Fishing Association of California. I'm here again to plead with you about copper and vermilion rockfish. I've wiped away my tears from yesterday and put on my big girl pants, but wrong is wrong. And honestly, I'm just plain mad now. The Magnuson Stevenson's Act says to ma manage using best available science beyond best available science. The act also says we must take into consideration the economic hardship on a community, specifically in national standard 7B alternative management measures. Management measures should not impose unnecessary burdens on the economy, on individuals, on private or public organizations, or on federal, state, or local governments. Factors such as fuel costs, enforcement costs, or the burdens of collecting data may well suggest a preferred alternative. We as a fleet are going to incur increased fuel costs having to fish deeper, moving frequently to avoid copper and vermilion rockfish. We're going to have a reduction in passengers due to lack of access to a desirable fish in the bag. We're facing inflation as a whole and increasing ticket prices while at the same time offering a reduced product to our customers. That just doesn't work. This also will impact data collection. How can surf samplers and observers get any data on copper rockfish if we're avoiding them like the plague? Furthermore, there are no numbers for off the top reductions on copper or quillback to be used for valuable data collection needed to right the ship, if you will. How on earth can we be expected to move forward without the ability to capture this information? As I said yesterday, this is so rushed, I haven't had time to calculate solid numbers, but back of the napkin math says we're looking at a potential lost revenue of 60 million statewide. Worst case would be loss of boats and landings from the larger LA area to the Oregon border. I hope and pray I'm wrong. I really, really do but there must be a better way than what is happening here right now. I'm asking you to create a preferred alternative allowing us to keep two copper and four vermilion. That's what we need to survive. In the inevitable event you vote for one copper and three vermilion, I'm asking you to prepare initial steps for a disaster declaration to open fisheries relief funds for our fleet who will be severely impacted by this decision. This whole copper assessment and outfall has happened so quickly we've barely had time to grasp what is happening. It honestly feels like a setup. Once again, right now, this very moment, the rest of my colleagues who would normally be here in the wings to speak are currently testifying at the California Air Resources Board fighting to keep our boats from being scrapped due to a proposed zero emissions rule for all harbor craft in California. I'll be testifying there next. I guess it really doesn't matter though what you decide if CARB moves forward with the new rule since we won't have boats to fish with then. This is a disaster. Have a great day. All right, thank you very much, Jamie. Let's see if there are any questions of you. Not seeing any hands, thank you, Jamie. Uh, Bill James followed by Jeff Shester. Hello, Chairman uh, Rolovic, members of the council, can you guys hear me? You bet, go ahead. Apparently, I, I, I'm listed here under getting an engine for my used 1997 car. So uh, actually, I'm up under E6, but I'll speak just a little bit to help clarify. I guess Maggie uh, Summers brought it up. Um, as far as what gears we want to use, what gears we don't want to use. Um, I've been working on the language of that for uh, about eight months with Dan and uh, driving everybody nuts, trying to be precise. And then um, some people from government, I, I want to point out fingers, but then they say, well, make it general so you don't get driven into a box. So this is an attempt um, to say what we thought was damaging to either the habitat or um, bottom uh, rebuilding species of what not to put down. But basically it's just a hook and line vertical or horizontal gear that is uh, fishing in the, in the, in the uh, midwater area. Um, that's basically what it is. 
And I, the other ones are more specific um, due to we know that those in the past, you know, I've seen them in different areas. I've been fishing um, in the California water since 1961. So I've been around a little bit and uh, um, fished in the ocean either uh, as a sport or commercial, you know, every year since then. So um, it would be basically uh, we could put down the gear that yeah, specifically um, what I just said. And this is not a new measure. This has been going on and on, um, on for, you know, years. I've been asking for access since 2008, trying to tell everybody how to avoid this and that, and how not to, you know, and it should be becoming pretty clear uh, that we're not going to damage anything. We're going to avoid what we need to avoid. And um, the purpose of needs before was getting access to uh, midwater rockfish um, uh, stocks that were really abundant. Well, that's still there. Um, and we need to build up our, our markets that you took away in 2000 from us by closing everywhere. Um, it's gone to uh, the next uh, purpose of needs is to save open access. Because by 2025, if you don't let us have access into the uh, entire RCA, we aren't going to have to talk about open access. It won't be here. So um, I, I can't get more dramatic than that. It's uh, you. It's assessment. I don't want to start in the assessment here, but um, there's a lot of things that need to be discussed, which I will after this council meeting is over, because um, you guys have a lot to do with what you're dealing with. And I'm speaking for myself, because honestly, um, I, I've been talking so much to everybody trying to pin this stuff down. I haven't even had a chance to talk to my association, you know, which I know will go with endorse me, but I've so I'm speaking for myself. Um, Dan Platt yeah, uh, will be able to answer. We, we were thought we were speaking to this um, item under E6. But uh, I will again. And hopefully, uh, Maggie, if you can really um, fine tune what you want us to do, it is very easy for us to do. We know, we, we know what, we, what we've done. We've done it. And uh, we just need to get on paper for you guys to approve it. Um, I want to thank the council for allowing me to, to speak. I'm getting a little bit of laryngitis, so I'm going to hold off now so I can talk under E6. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Bill. Any questions for Bill? Maggie Summer. Thanks, Chair Grelnick. I, I won't ask you to talk again, Bill, but wanted to say thank you very much for the work you have been doing to uh, specify year types under this action, I appreciate that and um, your intent in looking for flexibility to use gears that don't have habitat or uh, impacts on the, our rebuilding species. Thank you. All right, uh, seeing no other hands, we'll go to Jeff Shester followed by Megan Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is uh, Jeff Shuster representing the conservation group Oceana. Um, I'll be speaking today about uh, short belly rockfish management. I uh, wanted to start by just saying that we believe that proactive conservation measures should not just uh, only occur when, uh, when it's convenient to put them in place, but that protection of, of prey, uh, ecosystem-based management, and establishing climate-ready fisheries really is a fundamental uh, responsibility of the of the council uh, under the act and and it's and it's and it's there's also a sense of urgency as well associated with that responsibility um so we thank you for the council's continued attention to the management of short belly rockfish uh, in 2010 when the late zeke grader originally proposed precautionary acls for short belly to protect an important prey item for salmon there was a broad recognition of short belly's ecosystem importance as a forage fish which was later enshrined in the council's eco fishery ecosystem plan. In the past three years, as incidental catch increased, we are glad to see there is a re renewed and increasing awareness of the importance of short belly rockfish as the council has begun looking at ways to increase protections. As a result of this attention, we are glad to see that now there is real-time in-season tracking for short belly, 
and the council has adopted a 2000 ton annual incidental catch trigger. The council has also repeatedly voiced support for the policy of preventing a directed fishery from developing. We recognize the fishing industry has dramatically increased their efforts to avoid short belly in light of the recent increases in short belly abundance and has no interest in catching them or starting a targeted fishery. However, we are concerned that the redesignation of short belly rockfish as an ecosystem component species in the ground fish fishery management plan was an inappropriate use of a loophole in the national standard one guidelines allowing an off ramp for the MSA requirements to prevent overfishing, achieve optimum yield, and set annual catch limits. And those protections are no longer in place for short belly rockfish. And NIMS did decline to include the 2000 metric ton trigger established by the council in the fishery management plan or regulations. Furthermore, new interest in directed fishing can happen rapidly and unexpectedly. So together with the removals of previous protections, there is an urgency and a responsibility to prevent directed fishing. There's broad support from the public conservation groups, top seabird scientists and the habitat committee for moving forward with a short belly rockfish directed fishing prohibition. The council has already decided this is a priority and signaled to the public that, uh, repeatedly that it is on a timeline for completion. By placing it on the 2023-24 groundfish specifications package last June and reaffirming it was on that list in September 2022. We had expected the GMT to flesh out the approach at this meeting so that the council could adopt management uh, and were disappointed to not see any further analysis by the GMT of fleshing out what that approach might look like. Uh, we believe it could be done now at this meeting uh, and we would encourage the council to consider that based on the specific numbers and proposal in our letter. However, we now understand that there is opposition to moving forward in the specs process due to unanticipated ground fish workload. To that end, we very much appreciate the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife report on this item, which lays out an approach and considerations for fleshing out a regulatory approach to implementing a short belly rockfish fishing prohibition through a standalone ground fish FMP amendment. If, the, if this item is removed from the specs package, we would support this approach. A groundfish FMP amendment makes sense because short belly rockfish are exclusively caught in groundfish fisheries with groundfish fishing gear, primarily by the whiting fishery. And the, and the GMT is the management body best suited to flesh out the details of a management approach and they have the expertise. However, rather than reconsidering how this fits into groundfish workload in March 2022, which will only serve to kick the can down the road with any vehicle or timeline, we believe the council has a responsibility to create a new vehicle at this meeting. Therefore, in keeping with previous council commitments and prioritization, we ask that the council schedule initiation of a standalone groundfish FMP amendment to prohibit short belly rockfish directed fishing at the March 2022 meeting to scope the amendment. And we believe that the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife report appendix provides an excellent starting point for this scoping process. In conclusion, there will always be competing workload, but if the council is serious about following through with its commitments and responsibility to protect the California current marine ecosystem, it is essential that the council identify the vehicle and put it on the calendar. Thank you very much. And happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, are there any questions of Jeff? All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Megan Flaherty, followed by Padma Jagnathan. Megan, are you with us? I don't see your, there you are, you're muted on your end. There you go. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Apologies. My internet is kind of acting up, so it was a pause there. Um, I want to thank the council for allowing me to comment on this item. Um, you guys are clearly working on a, a lot of uh, regulatory changes right now, so really appreciate taking the time to have this conversation. Um, as Jeff mentioned, um, it's really essential that actions are taken now to consider um, prohibiting a directed fishery for short belly rockfish. Um, and part of the reason for that, that um, the Audubon Society um, feels that way is that it's just human nature, um, that it's always more difficult to uh, move away from something once the desire is there. So we do understand there's a lot of workload um, 
requirements. You guys are being pulled in many directions. Um, but by taking the steps to work towards prohibiting a uh, directed fishery, we can make sure that short belly rockfish does not end up um, in the ever-growing market for fish meal and all of the other areas where uh, a directed fishery could end up. Um, again, just want to emphasize the big picture uh, problems that are going on right now that are impacting seabirds. Seabird populations have decreased by 70% since the 1950s, and they're dealing with a lot of problems due to climate change, ocean acidification, rain litter. And one of the things that we can do um, most in the most immediate sense to help these populations is to protect the fish that they eat. So um, just uh, thank you guys for all of your hard work. And we're also asking that you take the steps needed to adopt a prohibition on a directed fishery for short belly rockfish, and that you do so um, in a more timely manner, despite the fact that there is no uh, attempts to create a directed fishery at the moment. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Megan. Any questions for Megan? I'm not seeing any. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Padma? I'm not seeing uh, that speaker on our list. So we'll go on to Christine Miller. Christine Miller, are you with us? <clears throat> I'm not uh, seeing a Christine Miller. Can you uh, scroll further down the list? Or is that the end of the list? All right. Well, those are all of the speakers that have signed up. Uh, I see that Anna Weinstein has her hand up, but um, uh, you don't have a card turned in. You have a, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that I can call on you, Anna, but I will anyway. What's up? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually did submit a, a card, and I and I think I am on the list. Um, I don't think it's fully scrolled down. I saw myself on the list oh. earlier. Oh, there you are. Okay, very good. You're absolutely right. So <laughs> welcome. Thank you very much. Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Members. So um, I'm um, speaking on behalf of Audubon. I'll also be speaking on behalf um, and reading from part of the letter submitted by Point Blue Conservation Science and the Pacific Seabird Group. Um, I, um, we, like the other speakers mentioned, um, and Dr. Shuster mentioned, we urge the Council today to initiate a standalone groundfish FMP amendment to prohibit new directed commercial fishing uh, for short belly rockfish uh, with a scoping meeting in March, 2022 and direct the GMT to prepare a scoping document using ODFW's report one uh, under E5 and appreciate ODFW and, and Ms. Summers contributions um, through the report in the appendix very much. So in your own fishery ecosystem plan, you identify the low ACL for short belly rockfish um, as a management measure to mitigate the um, fishing, the impact of fishing on the environment. Well, that legal protection no longer exists. There are no catch limits in place for the species and no prohibition on fishing for them. And there is a threat and, are, and there is reduction capacity. Uh, as for threat in March, 2021, the council, uh, quote, prioritize analyzing a prohibition of directed fishing for short belly rockfish given the growing global fish meal market, unquote. Uh, and, and also as for threat, there's a new exempted fishing permit application that NIMS is reviewing for uh, Atlantic thread herring on the East Coast that came out of the blue um, using uh, new thousand foot nets um, um, for pretty high, you know, 3000 ton a year fishing level. So there is interest in this country um, for new reduction fisheries on forage fish. Um, and as for capacity to reduce, I checked pack fin this morning, um, 328 metric tons of short belly and 33 metric tons of EC species were landed by the fleet. 
Uh, presumably this was reduced. Uh, someone can disavow me of that notion if that's not true. Um, I also saw in PacFin that another 240 tons of EC species were discarded. And like Dr. Shuster alluded to earlier, it's too bad the GMT and NEMS didn't do any analysis uh, in between March and, and September uh, of these retentions of discards to see how this would work for short belly in terms of the electronic monitoring, uh, the, the requirement that vessels with electronic monitoring land their fish. So instead of doing any analysis, um, the GMT sort of inexplicably linked our letter um, to its new management, matter ca management measure category. And I found this very curious to, is that an informed decision for the council or a way to inform the council on its decision to link to Audubon and Oceania's letter instead of doing any analysis. So I'm very disappointed um, that NIMS and the GMT uh, and are recommending kicking this out of specs back to square one. Um, the new list of management measures. Um, so, you know, it looks like the vicious cycle will continue unless someone submits a letter of intent to fish, then the real workload would start, like with it's happening on the East Coast with thread herring. So I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes on the input um, in your briefing book from other entities. So as Jeff mentioned, the Habitat Committee dedicated a quarter of its report to su supporting a focus on a short belly prohibition. Um, and then I want to point out the letter from Point Blue Conservation Science um, so I'll read directly from the letter. Um, Point Blue Conservation Science is an independent scientific research nonprofit. We have worked closely with NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Services biologists to provide information on forward fish abundance and interannual variability based on predator diets to help improve understanding and management of important fish stocks, unquote. So their seabird productivity data in the IEA interactive database, the public can download and see um, is there, and it's also, you hear from um, either data comes alive um, in the annual state of the California current ecosystem report when, they, um, when the seabird productivity is brought up. And then for this collaborate, collaborator also, um, there's a new paper in Nature Communications, Diverse Integrated Ecosystem Approach Overcomes Pandemic-Related Fisheries Monitoring Challenges. So six scientists from the Southwest Science Center collaborate with Point Blue in this paper. Um, and this paper, reading from the abstract, augments trawl observations collected from a limited fishery survey with survey effort reduction simulations, use of seabird diets as indicators of fish abundance, um, and so on and so forth. And so here you have an important data provider and critical science collaborator to the Council on NIMS making this request, an unusual request from this organization, policy request, the schedule of scoping of an FMP amendment. Then you have a letter from the Pacific Seabird Group who are biologists and scientists who have research interests in Pacific seabirds, who are government officials who manage seabird refuges and populations. And these are experts and leaders uh, nationally and around the world. So these requests really mean something, um, in including the request from your Habitat Committee. Uh, well, that was not a request, I should say that was a, 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 um, a, a recommendation for a continued focus. But these, these mean a lot. And so kicking the can um, I, appears unex really um, <laughs> unacceptable in terms of being in keeping with this council's good track record on forage fish. So we're asking you to schedule an FNP amendment scoping today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Let's see if there are any questions from council members. And I am not seeing any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a two part agenda item. Um, and we're part one, um, I think we're through. We've gotten through all of the um, reports. We've gotten through public comment. Uh, what remains is council discussion and action, which is scheduled for Sunday. Let me just confirm with council staff that I haven't uh, misstated anything. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no, you've, you've accurately captured what um, at least I understood the process for this particular um, action item to be is that today we would make it through public comment and then take the item back up again on Sunday for council discussion and council action. Thank you. 
All right, thanks very much, Todd. So we'll leave uh, agenda item uh, E5 here for now, and we'll move on to agenda item E6. And it is my great pleasure to hand the gavel to Vice Chair Pettinger. Okay, thank you, Chair Grolnick. And uh, I'll look to Todd to uh, get us started off on uh, E6. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, good afternoon, Council. So we are starting on agenda item E6, as noted by the Vice Chair which is non-trial sector area management measures. <clears throat> so under this particular agenda item, the council is scheduled to review proposed modifications to the non-trial RCA or Rockfish Conservation Area management measures. Um, the council scoped this action in April, 2021 and directed staff to analyze these modifications to the current um, suite of management measures used for the non-trial RCA. The analysis is attached as attachment one under this agenda item. Um, and it examines two overarching themes, which are allowing non-trawl open access, uh, excuse me, allowing the non-trawl open access in limited entry fixed gear sectors to operate within the non-trawl RCA and to modify, potentially modify boundaries of the non-trawl RCA. Additionally, as part of allowing the limited entry fixed gear sector to operate within the non-trawl RCA, the council directed staff to investigate how this sector could fish to their trip limits. At present, the non-trawl sector is prohibited from operating in the non-trawl RCA unless transiting or if fishing for other flatfish, the other flatfish species complex. Under this action, the council will consider if open access and limited entry fixed gear vessels can access the non-trawl RCA using approved hook and line gear. Hook and line gear, as listed in regulations, can take several forms, including long line, troll, and vertical hook and line. The council and the ground fish advisory subpanel, GAP, have noted the applicability of this type of gear to be used in three exempted fishing permits currently in operations as a means to access the non-trawl RCA, as well as address yellow eye rockfish bycatch concerns. The EFB gear types are designed to fish in the water column and primarily target midwater rockfish, which may reduce benthic habitat impacts as well as incidental yellow eye rockfish catch. The council will also consider if the limited entry fixed gear sector can attain their ground fish trip limits when fishing in the non trawl RCA. This sector is in gear endorsed but may use other gears, such as open access gear, to fish for ground fish. When fishing with its endorsed gear, limited entry fixed gear vessels can fish to their approved trip limits. However, if a limited entry fixed gear vessel uses OA gear, or excuse me, open access gear, it can only fish to open access trip limits. Therefore, if the council is considering allowing the limited entry fixed gear sector to access their higher trip limits as part of this action, regulations related to, this, to their trip limits when operating with open access gear provisions will need to be considered by the council. In addition to allowing these sectors to operate in the non-trawl RCA, the council will examine modifying the current structure of the non-trawl RCA through changing boundaries. The present configuration does not have uniform boundaries along the coast. The GAP recommended potential boundary modifications by management area in their April report, which was agenda item F3, supplemental GAP report one to the council. This report, that, excuse me, that report recommended reducing the area of the non trawl RCA from Oregon, the Oregon Washington border to Point Conception. The council also requested an examination of discrete changes to the non trawl RCA off of Washington State. The non trawl RCA off Washington has consistently been a shoreline to 100 fathom closure since the inception of the non trawl RCA in 2003. Attachment one provides analyses of these items and preliminary analyses of biological, socioeconomic, and habitat impacts. The analysis also examines specific concerns brought forward by the enforcement consultants in their April 2021 report entitled Agenda Item F3 Supplemental EC Report. Um, so, and these items that they brought to the forefront were fishing inside and outside of the non trawl RCA on the same trip and gear on board during fishing. The council made a wish to consider these and other regulatory issues noted in attachment one 
as it moves forward with this action. Further, the Habitat Committee has noted concerns related to narrowing the non troll RCA. As described in their statement for April 2021, which was sub, uh, agenda item F3, Supplemental Habitat Committee Report 1, the concerns regarding narrowing the non troll RCA are related to exposing areas by changing boundaries. If the council were to narrow the non troll RCA, depth reopened to fishing could be accessed by all fixed gear types which would include bottom contact gear. Um, these gear types, bottom long line, pot and trap, and the like, have relatively higher impacts on habitat forming invertebrates and other sensitive habitats. <clears throat> As part of this agenda item, the council is scheduled to consider and potentially adopt a range of alternatives, as well as a suite of preliminary preferred alternatives for public review. However, if it is determined that this action would benefit from further development and or analyses, the council could continue to refine the scope of the action and request additional analysis. <clears throat> so looking to your briefing book, you have several reports here for your consideration. Open up. You have reports um, from Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. GMT reports, a GMT report and a GAP report, an EC report, and a Habitat Committee report. There is also a supplemental public presentation from Oceana. Um, your action today is to review priority issues, including regulations and non troll RCA boundary modifications as appropriate, to consider adopting a range of alternatives, and as well consider adopting a preliminary preferred set of alternatives and then to provide guidance for development of alternative management measures as needed. Um, before I conclude with my overview, I will note that I do have a high level uh, PowerPoint that I can present to the council to give you um, some basis from which we could discuss this item. Um, with that, Mr. Vice Chair, I conclude my overview and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Todd. Um, questions for Todd on his overview? Okay, seeing none, um, take it away, Todd. Starting her up now. All right, it is my hope that you are seeing a big blue screen with the words non troll sector area management measures. We do. Excellent. Okay. So I also note that um, Brett Weedoff was. Uh, is my counterpart on this action. So he may be a, a friend that I need to phone um, if necessary. So the basic, um, I guess, plan for this presentation is I'm gonna draw back into giving a basic background and overview of the action. Then we'll take a look at the draft alternatives. And I wanna stress here with the term draft alternatives is these are not council um, approved alternatives, it was a way that we could classify the, um, the motion that was made back in April to better understand or better classify um, what the council was asking us to analyze. And then we will walk into a preliminary impact analysis and then I'll conclude with a, a slide on council action. So recently, um, meaning uh, since June of 2020, um, what the council has undertaken or heard from is that in GAP, the GAP in June 2020 provided a detailed, inf detailed report called Information Report 4, which they put forth the idea of how to modify the non troll RCA that may give them a little bit more access and potentially, um, as, they, as they noted, increase attainment of midwater rockfish species. In March 2021, uh, the Cow Cod Conservation Area was removed from this action and eventually placed into specs. However, as the council is well aware, um, that this particular um, item, the Cow Cod Conservation Area Repeal, could be placed back into um, this action if the council so desires. In April of 2021, the council scoped the non trial rockfish conservation area management changes. You adopted a draft purpose and need for public review. And then you directed staff to uh, analyze allowing the limited entry fixed gear and open access sectors to operate in the non troll RCA 
and specifically um, for limited entry fixed gears to analyze um, how they could attain the, or how they could fish to their LEFG limits. Um, additionally, the council asked us to, to analyze uh, limited gear, gear types to be used in the non-trawl RCA and modify current non-trawl RCA boundaries. I put this slide up here just to give uh, a brief overview of the purpose and needs and key points that um, really directed our um, work since uh, the purpose and need was, was adopted. So the purpose was to provide access to additional areas that are currently closed ground fish fishing in the non-trawl RCA, with the need being to provide increased attainment of available healthy shelf rockfish species that largely reside inside the non-trawl RCA, thereby increasing their utilization and economic value of the ground fish fishery. And to help diversify fishing strategies in light of restrictive salmon and crab opportunities, provide more stable year-round fishing opportunity and expand opportunities to supply seafood while bringing financial benefit to fishermen, communities, and the infrastructure, infrastructures they support. <clears throat> so just as a, a way to get us all on the same page in terms of what the non trawl RCA is, noting that we do have a few new council members, is that initially these, uh, this non trawl RCA was implemented in 2003. And this was in response to the declaration of multiple um, species, rockfish species in particular, being declared overfished. And so the original intent and the purpose of the non trawl RCA was to minimize impacts to overfished stocks, such as canary, yellow eye, and the like, um, from non trawl fishing. Um, the boundaries um, have largely remained similar, but not the same since its inception, meaning that as we show in Appendix 1 of Attachment 1, that there have been changes in management areas to these, uh, these boundaries. And these are some of the more recent ones that were done under the last harvest specifications management measure cycle. So between 4010 and the uh, Oregon-Washington border, or 4616, the 30 to 40 fathom line, uh, 30 to 40 fathoms was opened up to hook and line gears, except for bottom long line, pot trap, and dingle bar. Um, then between 3427 and 3827, the shoreward boundary moved out from 40 to 50 fathoms. And then south of 3427, or point conception area, the shoreward boundary moved out from 75 to 100 fathoms, and this is also around the islands the Channel Islands, excuse me. And I think this slide really just gives a better, more visual look at what uh, the current uh, boundaries are of the non trawl RCA. So you'll notice just moving from north to south that north of 4616, which is Washington State, it is a shoreline or zero fathom to 100 fathom closure. Moving south from between Oregon, Washington border to 4010, it's from 30 to 100 fathoms. And I'll note here, just as I did on the last slide, is that um, while these boundaries stay, have st st stayed the same um, in the last specs action, uh, it is between the 30 and 40 fathoms in which a fisherman can now venture, but only using or, uh, specific gear types. So moving on from 4010 to 3857.5, um, the boundaries are 40 and 125 fathoms. South of that at 3857 to 3427, it's 50 to 125 fathoms. And then of course, south of uh, the Point Conception area or 3427 is the boundaries are 100 fathoms and 150 fathoms. And those do extend out to the islands or are also around the island, excuse me. So, looking at this, this is just a general broad overview of uh, what type of fisheries we're looking at that um, are subject to the non trawl RCA. So, what you see here are the two main fisheries, as I've mentioned several times, both in my overview and my uh, slides before this, is what we're looking at in particular are the open access fixed gear fisheries, as well as the limited entry fixed gear fisheries. <clears throat> However, it is important to consider that the um, IFQ gear switching um, fleets, excuse me, fleet is also subject to non trawl RCA when fishing with um, fixed gear. 
under the limited entry fixed gear sector, we have essentially two larger, two large or uh, overarching fisheries, which is primary sable fish and then daily trip limits. Now in there also are some, um, there is some effort for uh, directed rockfish or directed other species groundfish that are not necessarily included in primary sable fish. Um, looking at open access, we have the targeted groundfish daily trip limits. And then you have something we call incidental open access. And incidental open access is this really, it's essentially a large catch-all category that includes such fisheries as salmon troll, Pacific halibut, um, other fisheries that you may have, uh, may reference as well as open access um, are like the pink shrimp fishery and the sea cucumber fishery. But however, those two fisheries, um, they use trawl gear and they are not subject to the non-trawl RCA. <clears throat> So just to give the council um, uh, an idea of what we concentrated on in this analysis was we looked at the targeted ground fish sector of the open access fishery. And we also looked at the primary sable fish and daily trip limit fishery in the, under the limited entry fixed gear fishery. However, it's important to note that however the council moves forward with this particular action is that it could in some way impact um, salmon troll or Pacific halibut fisheries as well. And as well as, excuse me, the IFQ um, gear switching fishery. So just as a general, I, um, I guess, uh, drawback, drawing out, not drawback, um, the open access fishery, at least the, uh, the one we looked at, which was the directed ground fish fishery, can use any type of what's called open access gear. Um, this fishery, there are no federal permits required. However, states do have um, regulatory authority um, over those fleets in some areas. Uh, yeah. And in general, uh, their trip limits are lower when you compare them to, to the limited entry fixed gear fleet. So for limited entry fixed gear, these vessels must have a fixed gear endorsed permit um, in order to fish, which would be a long line or a pot permit. Um, in general, as, I'm, as can be alluded to in my last uh, overview of open access fisheries, is the trip limits are higher. Um, again, the limited entry fishery, limited entry fixed gear fishery can use OA gear. Um, so this would be, for lack of better words, like hook and line gear. Um, yeah, just general hook and line gear. But in order, if they use that um, non-endorsed gear, they must fish to the lower, more restrictive trip limits. Okay. So this is just um, because this presentation can get a little wordy and there's a lot of moving parts and complexities, I wanted to show the, the council action at the start and also again at the end. So under today's work, um, you're gonna be reviewing priority issues, including regulations and non trawl boundary modifications as appropriate. You're gonna consider both adopting a range of alternatives and if so warranted, adopting a, a, preliminary, a set of preliminary preferred alternatives. And then of course, providing guidance for development of alternative management measures as needed. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is just pause here and ask if there are any questions on what I presented prior, and if not, I'll just move forward. Okay, I have questions for Todd. I think they're good, Todd. Okay. Good. All right. So as I noted before, um, the alternatives that we uh, we developed as part of this action are in reference to the motion that was made back in April. And again, these are not council um, necessarily council approved, but air quotes around that, if you will, alternatives. But yet it is a way that we could delineate what we were talking about and give some idea to the council of how we understood the motion to read. So the first one would be to allow the open access fleet to operate within the non trawl RCA. And as we looked at this, we have, you know, obviously our, our no action and then our alternative. So under no action, OA would not be allowed to operate in the non trawl RCA, except where and when allowed in regulation. So this is what is under current regulation. The alternative would be that the OA sector would be allowed to operate in the non trawl RCA with approved hook and line gear 
and that the vessels must declare their intent to fish within the non-trawl RCA prior to departure. So looking at this particular alternative, and you'll see it again in the next slide, is this declare to in their intent to fish is something we picked up on in the, um, the EC statement from back in April as well. The second portion of this is the allowing the LEFG or limited entry fixed gear fleet to operate the non trawl RCA. So under no action, it would remain consistent with how it is at the present, is that the LEFG um, are not allowed to operate the non trawl RCA except where and when allowed in regulation. The alternative that the, uh, the council wanted to look at would be allowing the, uh, the allowing LEFG to operate and the non trawl RCA with approved hook and line gear and fish to up to their LEFG trip limits. And then the vessels must declare their intent to fish within the non trawl RCA prior to departure. <clears throat> so we had, we generated three, three basic questions that we were hoping that the council could um, give us some direction on. The first one has to do with this idea of fishing inside and outside of the non trawl RCA. So this would be an event where a vessel could um, say, go out, lay, the, lay gear um, outside the non trawl RCA, non -trawl RCA, and then come back in to the side of the non trawl RCA and fish. So you're fishing both in and outside of the non, non trawl RCA. Um, the motion didn't specify whether or not vessels um, could fish in these multiple areas. However, the EC um, report did um, have some language that we thought was important to recognize and have some council discussion on. Um, the rationale really, um, or one of the rationales for this particular question deals with where fish are caught, meaning um, if managers wanted to, one, determine, you know, what fish were caught inside the non trawl CA versus outside the non trawl RCA or if enforcement wanted to do so, there's no real way to determine that because all the fish could be in one big bag, so to say. The second question that we had has to do with fishing gear use. So under current regulations, uh, excuse me, um, I'll back that up, excuse me. The motion did not specify if vessels can carry or use multiple gears on the same trip. And um, so this would be like if, for example, if a, an open access vessel were to use uh, pot gear as well as um, hook and line gear on the same trip and whether or not um, that would be allowed. And the rationale behind that is it's really difficult to determine what gear was used where. Um, and then of course that correlates to the bullet points above is fishing inside and outside. So it'd be, it, something that the council probably should um, uh, consider as we move forward. And the final question that we came up with is this idea of hook and line gear definition. So in regulation, hook and line gear is, is quite large and it can comprises multiple gear types. Um, one thing that we have heard um, in conversations both in the GAP, the GMT, as well as on the council floor is this um, vessels would be allowed to use exempted fishing permit here. However, at present, there are three exempted fishing permits um, that are investigating how to fish in the non trawl RCA, but yet each um, permit is using a different, different gear type. And so what we're looking for in terms of gear guidance is um, hook and line gear. Um, as a just a general statement of hook and line gear is that it's gear that has one or more hooks attached to it to one or more lines and maybe stationary or trolled. So in regulation, this also would include bottom long line, vertical hook and line, ge line gear, dingle bar, as well as troll gear. And as I mentioned prior to this was the EFP gear, there are three configurations being tested. Now each EFP uses a different number of hooks, um, weights, line test, um, buoys, that sort of thing. So there's no consistency essentially. Um, and so honing in on what could or could not be used from here is, um, is something the council may wish to consider because it would provide, I guess, more certainty and consistency across the board for both fishermen and enforcement to, um, to, to fish with. So we developed these sub options for, consider, for the council to consider. So the first sub option um, talks about fishing inside and outside the uh, non-trawl RCA. So 
sub option A, we have A1, A2. So A1, um, OA and LAFG vessels may not fish in either inside, may fish in either, excuse me, it may fish in either inside the non troll RCA or outside the non troll RCA on a trip, not both. And we're considering a trip to be a dock to dock experience, meaning you, it's a fishing trip. Um, the sub option two, OA and LAFG vessels may fish both inside and outside the non troll RCA on the same trip. The second idea that we are, or second sub option that we develop deals with um, gear and whether or not vessels could carry multiple gear types while fishing in the non troll RCA. So B1, um, OA and LAFG vessels shall only carry approved hook and line gear on board vessel when fishing within the non, in the non troll RCA and that vessels will not switch gears during a fishing trip, meaning that they will only fish with one gear type is the overarching uh, theme there. Under the second sub option, OA and LEFG vessels will be allowed to carry multiple gears on board vessel when fishing in the non troll RCA, but only approved hook and line gear may be used inside the non troll RCA. And again, we're classifying that approved hook and line gear because we're not sure, we weren't sure exactly um, which direction the council was going to go on uh, selection of gear. Okay. So, under the third bullet, our uh, third um, item that the council wanted us to address would be to modify the current non-trawl RCA boundaries. So under no action, obviously, the non-trawl boundaries would not be changed under this action. The alternatives um, that we looked at, and these were based primarily on the gap report from April and what they suggested for um, boundary lines are these. So sub option one, is 40 to 80 fathoms between the Oregon Washington border and 4010. So that would move the borders both in and move, excuse me, move both the shoreward and seaward borders in. Um, sub option two is we change the borders or boundaries, excuse me, to the 60 fathom and 80 fathom lines between 4010 and 3857.5. Sub option three, it'd be changing the boundaries to six. 60 fathoms to 80 fathoms between 38.57.5 to 34.27. Um, sub option four, I do have those ellipses there, um, denoting that, uh, that the motion did not specify what um, boundary lines Washington um, would be prescribed to, nor did the gap report. So this would be something that the council would need to direct us to investigate. So, um, as noted, the current boundaries off of Washington are zero to 100 fathoms. Um, boundaries, have, again, haven't changed since the non troll RCA, and the council could select or recommend um, boundaries as you see fit. To notice, um, to put this in note here, is that the contours that are currently available in regulation off of Washington are the 10, 20, 30, 50, 60, 75, and 100 fathoms. Um, at present, there is no 80 fathom line, and this would be something to recognize if I move back to the, the prior slide, is that the gap recommended the 80 fathom line. Um, in regulation, there is no 80 fathom line. However, the council could direct us to investigate to to develop an 80 fathom line. The nearest line is the 75 fathom. Um, yeah. Also, you'll notice here that I did skip the number 40. That's because um, there is not a 40 fathom line in reg off of Washington at present. <clears throat> so I'll pause there because I know I threw a lot of information at you and I would um, like to hear if there are any questions at this point. Okay, thank you, Todd. Uh, questions for Todd? Um, I think you're doing good, Todd, so continue. Okay. All right. So with the help of Brett and uh, Miss Jesse Dorpinghouse, we performed a little bit of preliminary impact analysis for the council to consider. And again, these are extremely preliminary. Um, and what obviously, as the council moves forward, we, we would be uh, diving deeper, as they say, into this particular area. So what I'm going to uh, provide here is that we're going to look at the biological impacts potential prohibited and protected species impacts. We're going to talk, well, not an impact, we are going to talk some monitoring enforcement concepts. And then we're going to roll into the associate, potential socioeconomic 
um, impacts as well as pulmonary habitat impacts. So starting off with biological impacts for target species. So we're thinking um, midwater rockfish, at least that's how we've seen it in both council discussion and in the gap and in public comment is what the desired uh, target species are, are these midwater rockfish. So currently, or at least since 2017, um, overall landings of midwater rockfish have been increasing. Um, and it could be related to a lot of different things, but you know, increased opportunities because of increased trip limits, uh, changes in RCAs, um, that sort of thing. But um, the real thing that that comes at that we could tease out is that it appears that the non non-trail RCA is limiting attainment in some way. So this graphic here that I blew up shows that over time, um, between 2017 and 2020, that attainment has increased. Um, so things are, are, are moving upward, but yet how far up they go or how far this increase continues into the future could be limited again by the non troll RCA as it is current. So under the alternatives, um, and it's something that you, you'll hear quite, uh, you'll hear me repeat throughout the remainder of this discussion is that it's very difficult to project um, any type of impacts and that any of those uh, impacts, at least at this point, are pretty highly uncertain. Um, we can, say with some confidence that midwater rockfish ACL attainment will likely increase if more access is given to the non troll RCA. Um, additionally, non-target species, non-target discards, so these would be um, unwanted species essentially, may increase concomitantly um, with increases to target species. Um, if the non troll RCA boundaries do change, it's a, high, a probability that we would see um, an increase in more diversal species unless the council acted to re prohibit certain gear types. So to take a little bit of a step back, if the council were to narrow the non troll RCA, that means that areas that were part of the non troll RCA would be um, available for fishing. And that would mean that you could fish at least initially um, with multiple gear types, so bottom long line pot, um, dangle bar, that sort of thing. And those um, those gear types, we do see an increased demersal species catch. Um, what I mean by demersal species in this case would be um, some yellow eye rockfish, uh, green spotted, green blotch, that sort of thing. So um, as the council has noted, and as well as, well as the gap in the GMT, one of the major concerns here has to deal with yellow eye rockfish and what this particular action could mean uh, to its rebuilding. So currently, the mortality is um, very much under the non troll allocation with the exception of 2017. Um, it appears that the non troll RCA is working as a yellow eye rockfish catch mitigation measure. Um, the stock, as the council well knows, is scheduled to be rebuilt by 2029. And in reference to this uh, rebuilding, uh, the positive rebuilding that is going on with the stock is that harvest specifications should increase over time, but not dramatically so. Okay, so under the alternatives, again, um, any impacts to this species are extremely, excuse me, highly uncertain. Um, yellow eye being demersal um, and is, you know, mostly subject to that type of gear that rests on the bottom. However, um, this species can be caught with midwater gear if that gear um, touches the bottom or is incidentally on the bottom. Um, and we noticed that with the EFP is that, um, the Emily Platt EFP especially, is that um, their data showed that they were fishing up in the water column, but yet there were yellow eye rockfish within their catch records. Um, so we can say that it's likely that mortality will increase. We're just not sure by what type, what amount it would increase. Um, again, if the non troll RCA boundaries are adjusted, incidental rock, yellow eye rockfish catch may increase. And again, that has to do with uh, the type of gear that could be used in those newly reopened areas. So mitigation measures. Um, at present, we have, of course, the harvest specification measures that describe the trip limits, seasons, that sort of thing. 
We have in-season management in which the council does at each meeting, take a look at uh, what the catch is to date, uh, especially yellow eye, as well as other species. Um, we have uh, the non-trawl RCA. That's a huge mitigation measure um, to, uh, to, well, especially yellow eye rockfish. Um, and then we have the yellow eye rockfish conservation areas, which, um, which can be turned on or off based on how the council uh, wishes to look or go with um, things. So possible mitigation measures the council may wish to continue, uh, consider as we move forward with this action. Um, potentially increasing the number and size of YRCAs and or activate um, current yellow eye rockfish conservation areas. Because I, I believe at the present, none of them are activated, so to speak. And then again, the one thing that um, Amendment 28 taught me or taught us is that we could use something called a block area closure. Um, these are very surgical in nature. Um, you could, for example, if a uh, yellow eye catch was in a specific area, um, the council could act if they had this mitigation measure to close that area to fishing and allow for the remainder or large portions of the shelf to, uh, to remain open to fishermen. Moving on to protected and prohibited species impacts. So it's highly uncertain. Um, it's clear that uh, Endangered Species Act listed species as well as Marine Mammal Protection Act species could encounter the gear. Um, to what extent, again, is highly uncertain. Um, we do figure that it's unlikely this gear would have the same impacts as bottom contact gear. So this would be like your long line, your pot gear, et cetera. Um, but it would probably require a little bit more analyses and discussion with uh, National Marine Fisheries Service. I will note here that though it's not in this slide, is that um, under the current EFPs, uh, MIMPS did take a look at potential impacts to pr protected species from that gear type. Uh, one thing they did notice is that for seabirds, especially seabirds, is that they did not seem to be attracted to our artificial gear. Um, so there is a positive for um, not allowing or to considering only allowing rather uh, artificial gear as opposed to baited gear. Um, so alternative three um, obviously could allow for bottom, you know, I use the words bottom contact gear here in quotes, um, in the reopened area. So it, that would be akin to like your pot gear, uh, your long line gear, and could put gear in places it hasn't been in nearly 20 years. And that may, may have some ramifications on uh, species that we know interact with that gear. Uh, yeah. The other one here, of course, is salmon. Um, we're again uncertain. Um, when the biological opinion was completed for salmon for the groundfish fishery, um, the impacts were quantified um, based on the current status of the non troll RCA. So um, we did, however, we being the GMT especially, looked at um, latitude and longitude uh, hotspot mapping of salmon. And also they looked at uh, relative impacts of salmon from the fixed gear fleet um, in that, uh, in, their, in the whole salmon uh, mitigation measures package. Overall, fixed gear does seem to have a fairly low impact as compared to trawl fisheries on salmon. Um, the one thing that uh, the council does have to, I guess, mitigate against salmon, um, increased salmon catch is that one, there's a real desire by uh, fishermen to stay away from uh, salmon if you're not targeting them and that uh, the council does have, or the council does have the regulation to use where salmon biological thresholds are established for the non troll sector, and if exceeded or appearing to be exceeded, um, could trigger closure of the uh, of the fishery of the fixed gear fishery. <clears throat> Moving forward, monitoring. So, one thing that has been noted um, as very important in looking at this fishery is. Because um, we don't know what the impacts really are going to be, especially with discards, um, we need to look at, at monitoring. So at present, we essentially have, well, three of the four here. 
So we have in-season monitoring. These are something that you see commonly in under the in-season, routine in-season uh, action that the council takes for groundfish. So we have landings data, um, information from the West Coast Groundfish Observer Program. There's vessel monitoring systems. You can tell where a vessel is fishing or isn't fishing. Um, especially noted here is that there is a forthcoming non-troll logbook and that would be of some uh, use in monitoring what is being caught as well as what is being discarded depending of course on how the council determines to, uh, to or what the council recommends for NIMPS to consider in that logbook. And so I have here the West Coast Groundfish Observer Program bullet point. Um, they uh, do obviously observe fixed gear fleets. However, um, in the groundfish fishery, they are not monitored 100% as are the IFQ trawl fisheries. Um, the rationale for that really, um, I guess in simplicity, is that these rates are partially based on council recommendations and also requirements from the cashier's implementation. This graphic or this table here that I show is that between 2020, well, from 2001, it should not be 2021, 2001 to 2020, 2010, excuse me, um, averages for coverage in the fleets um, fall out by sailfish, which is limited entry fixed gear, um, which is long line and pot combined, is about 34%. Limited entry fixed gear non-sablefish is about 6%, and OA long line and pot is about 5%. Um, regarding OA, I just wanted to bring it to the council's attention. Um, those vessels could be considered, um, are observed, but yet due to their size, the observation rate could be a factor of, you know, safety for observers, meaning that because an OA vessel is much smaller than a, than a LFG, LEFG vessel, observation rates are going to be lower in, uh, in, uh, in, in reality. <clears throat> yeah. okay. Socioeconomics. Um, so what we intended here to provide for the council is um, really to, to un try and get a handle on the socioeconomics when we're dealing with a highly uncertain situation because there's been a lack of fishing activity for nearly 20 years in these, in these non-troll RCA. Um, so it's difficult to quantify exactly what these impacts would be. But it's anticipated that each action alternative would have some positive impact by restoring portions of historical fishing grounds um, and, yeah, excuse me, targeting uh, fishing grounds. Um, some of the key assumptions that we utilized in our analyses is we used a baseline of 2017 to 2020, as this really represents a time when mid rotter rock fish were considered rebuilt. And, and opportunities were increasing for fishermen to target shelf, shelf rockfish. Uh, we also looked at participants and recent harvest trends in these uh, two sectors, the OA and LEFG fisheries, that are not targeting sable fish. Um, noting, of course, that while sable fish is one of the primary stocks targeted by non trawl, it's kind of like we thought it was likely that the action alternatives would not provide much additional access to sable fish. And this is a particularly important, the noting that north of 36 degrees, um, sablefish are highly attained. Um, so we also only looked at directed groundfish trips, so that means no halibut trips as well. So looking at alternative one, and for just to remind the council, alternative one is for ocean, for open access to access the non troll RCA. So initially, what we found was that these four ports, Brookings, Oregon, Morro Bay, California, Reef, California, Fort Bragg, California, are likely to benefit at least initially. And that's not to say that the other ports won't, wouldn't benefit, um, but it, it would probably take them some time to uh, come up to speed for processing for vessels, that sort of thing. So this is what we found, at least initially, for alternative one. Alternative two deals with limited entry fixed gear. Um, now, currently, as I mentioned, um, LEFG vessels are held to the lower OA limits. And based on the data that we looked at, and how we looked at it, it appeared as if there's really limited effort by limited entry fixed gear vessels just, just to target um, rockfish. 
I believe um, that would be an important thing for the GAP to, to discuss because they brought to, to our attention some new information that could influence future analysis. But at this point, port, ports that are more, most likely to benefit would be Brookings, Oregon, and Crescent City, California. And again, the same um, caveat falls for the limited entry fleet as it does for the open access fleet is that other areas would probably see an increase, but that increase would be relative to how quickly infrastructure as well as um, the fleet rebuilds in those areas. So for the alternative three, um, so this again is the ports we're looking at here, the ports most likely to benefit from modification of non troll boundaries. So for open access, um, Brookings and Morro Bay, and then for limited entry, Monterey and Brookings. So you're seeing a lot of commonality in terms of initial benefit from, um, from these alternatives. <clears throat> Habitat impacts. So alternatives one and two are quite similar in how they, they uh, both allow limited entry, fixed gear, and open access to fish within the non troll RCA with a very similar gear type. Um, based on our investigations and also from the Groundfish FMP Appendix C, we found that uh, fishing with midwater gear generally has low impact. However, in general terms that if there's a weight on the bottom of the gear, it could strike the bottom, which could in fact harm the epibiota. So this would be your, your corals, your sponges, that sort of thing. And if gear is lost or is dragged on the bottom, you could entangle benthic invertebrates or displace um, other habitat. And this table that we have here for you is based on uh, information from that Appendix C. So I won't go through it all, but you can see that their impact of these particular um, gear types that, that can be used at, moment, at the moment, which are you know, troll gear and then vertical long line gear. So these are single or multi hook ganyons with a weight um, and the fishing mission thereof you know, could crush break biogenic habitats, um, displace uh, habitat and, as well as entangle um, species as well. Alternative three, so this is the one where we would modify the, the non troll boundaries. And again, just to, to reiterate, this would narrow the non troll RCA and it would, could um, allow for more opportunities with all gear types in those newly reopened areas. So that would mean in general, um, things like bottom long line pots, traps, and dingle bar gear that fish generally on the bottom could be used in those areas. So we know that in terms of these three gear types, they do have um, increased impacts over just general hook and line gear. So the impacting parts are usually, you know, depending on which gear you're looking at, um, have to do with the anchors, the weights, the, the, the fishing gear itself, this would be the pot or the line gear, um, as well as, uh, you know, well, I guess as well as all those. Uh, impact is similar to what hook and line gear is. However, it's important to note that like for bottom long line and trap gear, these are heavier um, lines and bigger gear in general. And so their impact could, um, their footprint of impact could be a little bit larger than just hook and line gear. So they could, similar to hook and line gear, they could overturn, crush, break in, um, organisms, and just generally disturb biogenic habitat. <clears throat> So I've come to the, the end here, at least of the, all the slides um, that I want to present, but I do have some backup slides depending on how the discussion goes. But your council action here is on screen, um, and I'll just uh, conclude by saying thank you very much, um, both to the council for allowing me to present this, as well as the excellent help that we received um, from Jesse Dorpinghaus and Brett Weehoff. And I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Well, thank you, Todd. That was a pretty comprehensive overview, to say the least. Um, any questions for Todd? Uh, Corey Writing is Corey. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, hi, Todd, and thanks for, <laughs> as Brad just said, a very comprehensive overview, um, especially for the initial impact analysis. Um, the socioeconomic analysis appears to have looked only at potential port landings, and I'm curious if you or anybody else from the team considered other social or economic metrics. Thanks. Yes, through the vice chair. Um, thank you for the question, Ms. Writings. Uh, the answer is no. 
uh, we did not initially, we did not, at least in our initial involvement, consider uh, impacts to, uh, I guess in this case, things like infrastructure or uh, community benefits, or at least in a, in a narrowed down scheme. It's something though that we would look at, um, at we, would, we will look at as we move forward, but uh, if you have suggestions of how you would like us or what you would like us to look at, we are, we're very welcoming of any, any of that. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Okay, thank you, Corey. Um, further questions? Okay, seeing none, um, thank you, Todd. And uh, next up is the WDFW report and uh, Heather Hall, Heather. Or, or Corey. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Vice Chair, throw you for loop today. I lost the coin toss on this one. Um, yeah, I think our report's been in the briefing book for a couple of days. We put it out there, you know, to give the GAP GMT public a little a little indication of what we're, we were thinking. Um, I will, so I won't I won't read it. I'll summarize it, and then happy to to answer questions here. Um, and Todd Todd touched on a lot of this um, in his presentation. Um, but yeah, backing up to April, we we said some of these same things we you know Washington is in a different place than Oregon and California and the challenges they're looking at uh, with this action in Washington uh, we never had a, a commercial fishery develop to the extent off Washington as in the other states um, and you know Mr. Anderson can give you the background there and council discussion uh, better than anyone but you know we saw the writing on the wall with with the uh, rockfish species um, being overfished you know, and uh, not not seeing our coast being able to to handle pressure from a commercial recreation recreational commercial and even our, our tribal fisheries from our tribal co-managers. So we have a different history. So we've been approaching approaching this this item um, differently. And in April we had committed to to working with um, some of some of our you know our offshore commercial our fixed gear sablefish uh, sector folks and. Our recreational folks to have some initial discussions on on what what might be possible. So, you know, this report, you know, out of came out of those discussions and thinking about what what we would be interested in recommending here. You know, that first section here, we talk about, you know, we see some some objectives. Um, if we were to open areas, it would be as Todd said, we're uh, you know looking at modifying the shoreward boundary only. You know, objective number one, and that's the reason really is because uh, for is the main reason has been for yellow eye rockfish. Canaries rebuilt, um, yellow eye still rebuilding, and as Todd said, it's it's rebuilding quicker, but we're still not going to go back to the days of 200 metric tons of yellow eye. It's not looking like unless the assessment changes. So, so our first objective would be you know, these areas would, would not add much at all, yellow eye rockfish catch at all. We'd want to avoid conflicts with recreational fisheries. In, in other commercial fisheries, we want to avoid sensitive habitats, and we'd be looking at areas that were large enough to be enforceable by the MS. Um, that the next section here, the background, you know, it, that explains a lot. lot um, figure one here on page two is, is a map put together by Whitney Roberts, and shows shows. Um, the RCA from extending from shore to 100 fathoms, you know, with some of the EFH closure areas and recreational closures for yellow eye, just for context, the EFH closures don't apply to fixed gears off our state. Um, and that second section there just speaks to some more, more thoughts, um, you know, about, you know, possibly we, we think pot gear shows prospects of meeting a lot of those objectives, especially for yellow eye. Um, it's yellow eye catches are, are very low in pot gear. And, you know, lastly, I guess at, at this point where we are, we, we, we had some good discussions, but we, we, we weren't proposing, we're not proposing, prepared to propose specific coordinates. We're looking at areas, um, we think areas between the, the current line, 100 fathoms and somewhere around 75 fathom line in regulation is generally the area we're looking at, but we don't, we think we would, um, if we were to 
include this in the range of alternatives, um, come back in the next stage with, with some specific coordinates for areas that might not follow uh, one depth contour like now. So it would be a, uh, a discussion on, on finding areas, uh, smaller areas, not the whole coast, but smaller areas within those depths that, that, that meet the objectives. And off our coast, the objective we, we've heard from, from, the, from the sablefish fishery is accessing more sable fish in, in late summer and fall when, when some, some bigger fish are on the edge of the shelf there. Um, so it's not to target um, rockfish or, or lingcod. We just don't think that the LOI um, ACL could, could handle that at this point. Uh, so Mr. Vice Chair, that might've taken longer than, than reading it, but we're happy to, uh, to answer questions. And I know Whitney's standing by if anyone has detailed questions on, on the map. Okay. Um, okay, thank you, Corey. Uh, questions for Corey on the WDFW report? Uh, Bob Dooley, Bob. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you, Corey, for the report. I, I just have a question on uh, the enforcement concern about proximity to areas large enough and distant enough from the 100 fathom mount line, and what what type of distance are you, do you have any knowledge of that? What distance is considered okay and all that? I just, I just know that in, in our, you know, in other fisheries that have borders and have enforcement through their cooperative contracts, they, we, we can get pretty darn close and enforce it with no problem. So I just, I'm, uh, I'm curious how, what kind of bu buffers need to be had around these areas and, and, and to be enforceable and how large they need to be to be enforceable. Yeah, if I could, Mr. Vice Chair, yeah, good question, Bob. We have the same question. Um, we did have a, a couple enforcement consultants, you know, Captain Chadwick and Chris German join us for a couple of our conversations and um, maybe they'll have an answer for us now, but yeah, I, I, that's a, I, we don't know. I don't know. Maybe, um, maybe we'll hear an answer. It's a good question, but you'll see places. If you, if you look at the map where at least at the scale we're looking at the, you know, in the Canyon, um, where it's very steep, you're not going to see the surface area between a 75 and a, and the hundred, hundred fathom line is just very short, very small distance. Um, and if we were to do something like only allow a pot gear in there, um, you know, so I, long way of saying, good question. I'm hoping that we'll we'll hear the answer, and I would love I would love it to be what you uh, just said it is. It's could be pretty precise. Thanks, Corey. Well, I you know, it might be re worth reaching out since they're up in your neighborhood to reach out to C State and understand how they do that with the uh, with the Whiting and Pollock fleets and the different fleets that they work with uh, to enforce closures and. Um, I know it's pretty fine scale within, I mean, they can tell within a hundred feet and, and do it regularly. So maybe it's just something we need to catch up on so we can manage our fisheries at a fighter scale. So thanks. Okay, thanks Bob. Further questions for Corey? Okay, thank you, Corey. Um, next up is the GMT report and um, Kelly Summers. Kelly? Hey, um, so I'm going to be reading from the GMT report on non troll sector area management measures. The GMT reviewed the materials in the advanced briefing book, including the analysis to support the development of an ROA, and received a briefing from Mr. Brett Weedoff and Ms. Je Jesse Dorpinghouse from the Pacific Fishery Management Council staff. The Council's action under this agenda item consists of four parts review priority issues consider adopting an ROA, consider adopting PPAs, and provide guidance for development of additional management measures as needed. So for a little bit uh, more background on top of what Todd already gave you guys, the ROA analyzed um, includes three alternatives and a variety of sub options. Briefly, alternatives one and two are similar, but address OA and LE fixed gear sectors respectively, accessing the non-trawl rockfish conservation area using approved hook and line gear. 
Both alternatives include sub options related to fishing area and allowable gear on board. Specifically, both alternatives include sub option A1, which is fishing inside and outside the NTRCA is not allowed on the same trip. Sub option A2 is allowing fishing inside and outside the non trawl RCA on the same trip. And sub option B1 is allowing only the approved Pokemon gear on board when fishing in the non trawl RCA and not allowing gear switching on the same trip. And sub option B2, which is allowing multiple gear types on board when fishing in the non trawl RCA and allowing OA gear fishing outside of the non trawl RCA on the same trip. Throughout this report, references to sub options incorporate both alternatives one and two, unless otherwise stated. And finally, um, alternative three would reconfigure the non trawl RCA boundaries. The GMT recognizes that the draft purpose and need adopted in April of 2021 may be overly narrow in scope, given that the WDFW report, which Corey just spoke to, highlights the interest in opening the non trawl RCA off Washington to improve the value of sablefish catch by providing access to larger sablefish in slightly shallower waters. Unlike off of Oregon and California, the purpose of opening up the non trawl RCA off Washington would not be to quote, provide increased attainment of available healthy shelf rockfish stocks as described in the draft purpose and need statement. The GMT suggests revising the purpose and need statement to be inclusive of all non trawl sectors that have been constrained by rebuilding stocks and offers the following revision. The actions are needed to provide increased utilization of non overfished shelf rockfish species, as well as other important target stocks that reside within the existing non trawl groundfish conservation areas, thereby increasing the overall economic value of the groundfish fishery. Adopting an ROA. The GMT focused our discussion on any alternatives and sub options that were infeasible to move forward as part of the ROA. To that end, the GMT agrees with the enforcement, enforcement consultant's report and recommends the council not move forward sub option B2 in the ROA, as allowing multiple gear types on board would make enforcing gear restrictions infeasible. The GMT recognizes that allowing any gear on board under sub option B2 could be more convenient for fishermen, especially if sub option A2 moves forward. However, due to the lack of enforceability, the GMT recommends removal. The GMT recommends that alternatives one and two, and two including sub options A1, A2, and B1, and alternative three should move forward in the ROA. The GMT expects that the council will discuss the potential repeal of the cow cod conservation area under agenda item E5 at this meeting and may propose moving that action from the 23-24 harvest specs and management measures package into this larger non trawl RCA package. In order to streamline these similar analyses and to ensure the 23-24 harvest specifications and management measures are implemented by January 1st, 2023, the GMT recommends adding the CCA repeal into the ROA. The GMT recommends the council add the requested non trawl RCA adjustments off Washington, as noted in their report, to the ROA as a standalone alternative. The GMT interprets the request to investigate non trawl RCA adjustments off Washington to be a separate standalone alternative because the intent behind the request is to open select areas within the non trawl RCA without necessarily adjusting the entire extent of the 100 fathom boundary off Washington and possibly just for vessels using pot gear. However, since select areas have not been identified at this point in time, the entire 75 fathom to 100 fathom area should be considered as within the ROA. Within this range, analysts could consider things such as impacts to tube habitat, potential yellow eye rockfish bycatch, catch and effort patterns of sablefish, and the likelihood of whale entanglements per the biological opinion. Additionally, the GMT agrees with the GAP recommendation to use the 75 fathom line that is already in regulation as opposed to the 80 fathom line that was noted in the attachment one analysis and is not currently in regulation. This would relieve the workload involved in establishing new boundary lines that approximate depth contours. Potential management measures. 
As with many pathways to increasing access to fishing grounds, the potential ROA for this action will include many possible impacts to the ocean ecosystem. As the ROA is selected and analysis continues, the magnitude of these risks will become clearer and the council may need to consider potential management measures to mitigate these impacts. The GMT outlines some of these concerns and potential management measures to consider as this action progresses. First, as noted by the Habitat Committee, habitat impacts due to opening this area to fishing are uncertain and will differ between alternatives and sub-options. The GMT supports the Habitat Committee's suggestion to assist in the development of future analysis of habitat impacts related to these management measures. The GMT also notes that the HC report and the Oceana public comment discussed how the proposed openings of the non RCA and EFHCAs and the differences between bottom contact EFHCAs and bottom trawl EFHCAs. The GMT will continue to follow and engage in these nascent conversations, which may identify additional concerns or pathways forward for fishing opportunities and habitat conservation. Second, this proposed action could result in an increased yellow eye rockfish bycatch, as noted previously in the GMT report from April 2021. Potential use of yellow eye rockfish conservation areas could be used to mitigate impacts to yellow eye rockfish and de facto yellow eye rockfish habitat as a result of this action. YRCAs are a management measure that are currently in the regulations. The council could also consider developing black area closures as was done for the trawl fisheries under Amendment 28. BACs can restrict fishing by gear type and sector within specific latitudes and depth contours and can be implemented in season or pre-season. If bycatch of yellow eye rockfish or prohibited species, for example, salmon, were to occur in reopened areas, then the council could use these tools to react as needed. However, the development of YRCAs and BACs would require additional workload outside of the current scope of the ROA. Finally, the analysis recognized that the potential impacts to other protected and prohibited species are mostly uncertain. Once an ROA is selected, analysis can provide additional qualitative assessment of these impacts. Potential management measures, whether already available or new, can be considered to address these risks as they are more clearly defined. And I and the rest of the GMT are happy to take any questions. Thank you, Kaylee. Questions uh, on the GMT report? Uh, Phil Anderson. Bill? Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks for the GMT's report. Uh, my question has to do with the portion of the report that deals with the adjustments to the non troll RCA off Washington. Um, I noted it said, however, since select areas have not been identified at this point in time, the entire 75 fathom to 100 fathom area should be considered within the ROA. And I'm just trying to understand, uh, I mean, I think I understand what it says, um, but does that mean, for example, there'd be an alternative where the area between 75 and 100 along the entire coast of Washington would be one of the things considered? Is that what that's saying? Um, I believe the goal was to say that potentially up to that could be considered, but more so that that the entire area could be considered um, to identify smaller areas within. But I'm happy to let either Whitney or Corey speak to that, as I think we were mostly trying to reflect what was in the WDFW report. Okay. I, I mean, all right, thank you. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, further questions for Kaylee? Uh, Maggie Summer, Maggie? Thank you, Vice Chair. I don't have a question, but I didn't want to let Kaylee get away after reading her last GMT statement uh, either, since she'll be... Moving off the GMT, just wanted to acknowledge your hard work in that group and the contributions to the council, and we very much appreciate it. 
Yep. Thanks for that, Maggie, and uh, thank you, Kaylee. Okay, seeing no hands, um, instead of going to the uh, the gap report, we're going to take a break. We're nearing uh, two hours, trying to break up the rest of the day here. So we'll be back in about um, um, 10 minutes, 3.27, actually um, 3.30.
Okay, we're back and um, looking for the uh, gap report um, from uh, uh, Dan Platt. Dan? Yeah, I am here. Can you hear me? Um, yes, we can. Okay, well, bear with me. It's a wrong, long report for a gap report, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Okay, so um, I'll be reading from agenda item E6A, Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel Report on non trawl Sector Area Management. The Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel received an overview from Mr. Brett Whiteoff, Pacific Fishery Management Council staff, and Jesse Dorfinghouse, and has the following recommendations. non trawl fishermen on the Gap said that while the intent is to open or modify the rockfish conservation area for all non trawl gears. Completely re removal of the RCA is unlikely due to concerns related to habitat and yellow eye rockfish, which is continuing to rebuild. However, the gap believes now may be the most opportune time to use gear that has been tested through exempted fishing permits to access midwater shelf stocks, thereby taking pressure off nearshore stocks without affecting habitat or yellow eye rockfish. Therefore, the gap would like, number one, for the council to continue to move forward with allowing the following gear types to fish within the non trawl RCA in California and Oregon. Per staff guidance, the gap further refined the gear description as non bottom contact hook and line gear that is attached to the vessel and not anchored to the bottom, including but not limited to the gear used in the 320. 21, 22 EFPs targeting shelf rockfish. Gear that would not be allowed includes bottom log line, pot and trap gear, bottom gill net gear, vertical set lines. And I have a note here uh, to uh, describe what we mean by uh, vertical set lines a little bit better. Uh, the the Vertical set lines we're talking about are lines that are buoyed and anchored to the bottom. So they're not uh, attached to the boat in any ways. And um, those are the lines that we uh, would like to disallow. And uh, continuing with our list, uh, Portuguese long line gear and dingle bar gear. The gap notes that uh, bottom gill net gear and vertical set line gears that were not in, uh, excuse me. The gap notes that bottom gill net gear and vertical set line gears are gears that were not identified in alternative one in, uh, in the analysis. Uh, item two, uh, fisheries that are currently permitted to fish in the non troll RCA will be allowed to continue. For example, some fisheries such as spot ponds and hagfish that use traps are currently permitted to fish within the RCA. And our intention here is to um, not uh, disallow any fishermen that are currently, currently permitted to fish in the RCA. Um, item three, uh, fishermen are required to would be required to declare into the fishery and be allowed to carry only one type of approved gear on the boat while fishing within the RCA. And uh, item four, that this issue be scheduled as soon as possible to enable movement of fishing operations to the shelf and slope. Um, other considerations. The Calcod conservation areas, the gap would like to see changes to the CCAs as soon as possible to move effort to the slope 
If repealing the CCAs will progress on a faster timeline in this action, then the gap would support removing it from the biennial harvest specs discussion and place it here. Reopening the CCA has become even more critical due to copper rockfish and vermilion rockfish catch reductions coming forward in the next uh, management cycle. The status of copper and vermilion will force both recreational and co commercial fishermen further offshore to pursue, to pursue other species such as chili peppers and widow rockfish. The CCA contains several areas known chili pepper hotspots as well as Boccaccio widow, widow and bank rockfish in plentiful amounts. As noted in public comment from Oceana, it has committed to working with the council and fishing industry stakeholders toward the goal of repealing the Cal Cod conservation area to increase fixed gear fishing opportunities while sim, sim, sim <laughs> having trouble with that word, simultaneously establishing new projections for priority habitat features like cold water corals and sponges. Because Cal Cod rockfish have been rebuilt, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife recommended the council repeal the CCA while also taking steps to protect the most sensitive habitats. We understand that in the future, CDFW might want to provide the gap and the council with additional CCH changes, not just a full repeal. We expect to engage in scoping of these ideas at some point. At a minimum, full repeal could be part of the ROA and in the future, other actions are less than less than a full repeal could be placed within the ROA. Further, we understand that the purpose and need for this action to be slightly revised to accommodate the inclusion of the CCA actions. Uh, accountability measures. Non-trawl fishermen noted it will be necessary for vessels fish fishing uh, ground fish outside of state waters to have vessel monitoring systems, BMS. They also will be eligible for observer coverage. Lastly, fishermen will be subject to the use of law books as well. All these measures will enable fisheries managers to ensure that compliance while fishing in the RCA and to manage stocks to their annual catch limits. Uh, incremental process. Overarching thoughts regarding moving forward with accessing the, the non troll RCA include the forthcoming reductions in, L in ACLs for copper, quillback, and vermilion rockfish, particularly in California. It is imperative for non troll fishermen to access midwater stocks as soon as possible. The non troll RCA process is just one mechanism to achieve that. However, the gap recognized recognize an implementation date of January 1st, 2024 may be too late for many fishing operations. Fishermen on smaller vessels who also fish salmon and crab have been constrained by regulations for those fisheries due to stock declines, changing ocean, oper ocean environment, et cetera. Adding more time to this process would be problematic. GAP members therefore suggest consideration of an incremental process which may allow access to the RCA sooner. That is, number one, allow access to the RCA using hook and line gears only, currently authorized in new EFP gear up, uh, authorizations. This action could be implemented much more quickly and provide almost immediate re relief. We ask that the council consider implementing this as an either new management measure under the 
23-24 specifications process or remain as an action through this non-trawl package. We think implementation of just the hook and line gear alternatives may, the, may be the most expedient way to gain access to the RCA in the shortest time frame with minimal analysis and without reinitiating any bio, biological opinions. To make changes to RCA lines, the GAP would like to work through more RCA line changes in the future as this package moves forward. For example, given the likely, likely reduction in catch for copper and quillback rockfish in California, the GAP believes it is unwise to consider changing shoreward boundary of the RCA at this time. The council may want to consider repackaging CCA and RCA changes in one agenda item in the future with development of new purpose and need, further scoping analysis and discussion as appropriate. The WFW proposal could be added Uh, I'm having trouble read this because it also pertains to different gear and type of fishery. Three, completely remove the RCA for non-trawl gear. This action will require a multi-year analysis and the gap recognizes it may be necessary to create a small RCA block area closures. This kind of information would come through the upcoming analysis. An incremental process would allow the most expedient access to the RCA and keep many small businesses operating. Additionally, portions of this package using EFP gears to access the RCA, for example, may be excited through the, the biennial har harvest specs and management measure process. This would immediately decrease fishing pressure on near shore stocks of concern while affording additional fishing opportunity and flexibility. The Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife proposal. The gap had limited time to vet the WFW report one, but generally supports this proposal moving forward. The GAP is concerned this could unnecessarily delay the non troll RCA package at a time when fishermen need to amplify, emphasize shelf rock spe rockfish species simply to remain economically via viable. The purpose and need would have to be modified to ac accommodate this action. Range of alternatives. Reference Referencing E6 attachment one, the range of alternatives analysis, the gap sees the current range is sufficient to move forward. However, allowing regarding allowing multiple gears on, on board, the gap believes this is not worth pursuing at this time. The gap suggests removing both alternative one, sub B option, sub option B2, and alternative two, sub option B2 from the range of alternatives. The gap also supports removing alternative one, sub option A1, and alternative two, and sub option A1. Under this package, one of the goals is to use gear tops, gear types as described in the EFPs. Currently, these gear tops gear types can be used to fish both shoreward and seaward of the RCA. Adding the use of these gear tops, gear types within the RCA negates the need for this sub option. Regarding the boundary lines of the RCA referenced in an alternative three, sub options one and two, the gap recommends keeping the shoreward boundary boundary, in other words, leaving that the same, 
an existing line 40 fathoms, but changing the seaward boundary to 75 fathoms. Keeping the shoreward boundary will decrease pressure on near shore stocks like copper and quillback rock fish. The 75 fathom line is currently described in regulations. The 85 fathom line is not. Changing it to 75 fathoms will decrease some analytical workload while also operating, opening deeper areas to midwater rockfish in some areas to access lingcod. The summary of our recommendations begins on the next page. Summary of GAP recommendations on alternatives from agenda item F6, non-trawl sector area management analysis. The GAP recommendations to remove are in strike through additions in bold italics. So let's see. Um, I might need some help on reading this part of the statement. Um, can I call on Harrison Nyback? Absolutely. Harrison? Harrison? Yeah, give me one second here, Dan, to bring this up. Okay, thank you. This is a page. Where, yeah, where do we leave off, Dan? Yeah, uh, page four at the top, uh, summary of gap repping recommendations on alternatives. Three, four. Okay. <clears throat> summary of gap recommendations on alternatives from agenda item E6, non-trawl sector area management ROA analysis. <clears throat> Alternative one, allow open access vessels to operate in the non-trawl RCA when using approved hook and line gear. Uh, prioritize an analysis of opening the existing non-trawl RCA to open access fisheries using approved hook and line gear and excluding long line dingle bar and pot trap gear, which is option one in the table at the end of supplemental gap report F3A. Uh, no action. Open access vessels, except where and when allowed in regulation, are not allowed to operate within the non-trawl RCA. Alternative, allow open access vessels to operate inside non-trawl RCA to target ground fish with approved hook and line gear only. Vessels must declare their intent to fish within the non-trawl RCA prior to departure. Um, fishing area sub-options. Uh, the GAP had decided to scratch uh, sub-option A1 and would recommend sub option A2, open access vessels may fish inside and outside the non-trawl RCA on a trip. Uh, gear on board sub options. Um, GAP recommends sub option B1, open access vessels shall only carry approved hook and line gear on board vessel when fishing occurs in the non-trawl RCA. Vessels shall not switch gears during a fishing trip. And we had removed sub option B2. Alternative two, allow uh, limited entry fish, <clears throat> limited entry uh, fishing gear vessels to operate within the non-trawl RCA when using approved hook and line gear to fish to LEFG trip limits. Uh, conduct a complementary analysis that considers how the LEFG fishermen can access their higher trip limits within the RCA using approved hook and line gears. Uh, no action would be uh, LEFG vessels except <clears throat> where and when allowed in regulation are not allowed to operate within the non-trawl RCA. Alternative, allow the limited entry uh, vessels to operate inside the non-trawl RCA with approved hook and line gear and fish up to the LEFG trip limits. 
Vessels must declare their intent to fish within the non-trawl RCA. Um, same as in open access, the GAP had recommended to strike sub-option A1 and go with sub-option A2. Um, LEFG vessels <clears throat> may fish inside and outside the non-trawl RCA on a trip and gear on board sub-options, same as open access. The GAP had recommends to go with sub-option B1. Um, limited entry vessels can only carry approved hook and line gear on board a vessel. Vessels shall not switch gears during a fishing trip. Um, alternative three, reconfiguration of the non-trawl RCA boundaries. Um, conduct a complementary analysis regarding RCA line modifications, table one, options two and three, to allow uh, limited entry <clears throat> vessels access to areas of the RCA in addition to gap options described in table one. RCA line modifications may also include discrete changes to the 100 fathom RCA boundary in Washington, north of the 46 line. Um, no action would be non trawl RCA boundaries shall not be changed under this action. Um, alternative, uh, non trawl <clears throat> RCA boundaries shall be set at um, sub option one, would be 40 fathoms shoreward, which is the current boundary, and uh, 75 fathoms seaward between the 4010 and the 3427. Sub option two would be the 40 fathom shoreward, which is the current boundary, and 75 fathom seaward boundary uh, between the 46 and the 4010. Sub option three, the non trawl RCA boundaries off of Washington, um, will be to the depths, to whatever depths that they had desired. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank hey, you, Harrison. Harrison. Um, questions for the, the gap? Um, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Vice Chair. I think this is an easy one. Uh, looking for confirmation. At, when I'm reading through the summary of gap recommendations where you have uh, based it on the exact wording from the, uh, the scoping document and in alternatives one and two, where you, where the alternative, the action alternative would allow approved hook and line gear only. I assume the gaps intent there is to describe that to that approved hook and line gear more specifically would be what you described on page one as non-bottom contact hook and line gear that is attached to the vessel and not anchored to the bottom, including but not limited to the gear used in the three EFPs targeting shelf rock fish. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Yeah, Vice Chair? Oh, oh. Sorry, Dan, go for it. Yeah, that, that is correct. Okay, thank you, Maggie. For the questions for the gap? Okay, oh, Maggie. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do not have a question, I, my apologies. Um, no problem, okay. For the questions, seeing no hands. Uh, thanks, Dan, thanks, Harrison. Uh, next up is um, Greg Bush in the EC report, Greg. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. It's Greg Bush. I'll be reading agenda item E6A, Supplemental EC Report 1, Enforcement Consultants Report on Non-Trawl Sector Area Management Measures. The enforcement consultants have reviewed the documents pertaining to agenda item E6, Non-Trawl Sector Area Management Measures, and provide the following comments. The EC has concerns with any proposed increased and in authorized fishing activity within a ground fish conservation area due to the increased need for additional shoreside monitoring and at sea enforcement to ensure gear and retention requirements are met. The EC prefers maintaining status quo under the no action alternative or making changes to the boundaries of the non trawl rockfish conservation area. Yeah. The EC provides the following recommendations in support of developing a range of alternatives. General gear issues. The EC notes that new hook and line gear definitions need to be developed for the West Coast groundfish fishery. 
consideration should also be given to both shoreside and at-sea enforceability when establishing gear specifications. The EC is concerned about the complexity and enforceability of any additional gear types being allowed in the non-trawl RCA. Declaration reporting requirements. The EC recommends that any new gear type and sector approved for use be added to the declaration reporting requirements in 50 CFR 660.13 Delta. Alternative one, allow open access vessels to operate in the non-trawl RCA when using approved hook and line gear. Fishing area options, the EC recommends consideration for sub option 1A. Vessels may fish either inside the non-trawl RCA or outside, but not both on the same trip. Gear on board sub options, the EC recommends consideration of sub option B1, allow vessels to carry only approved hook and line gear on board when fishing occurs in the non-trawl RCA and recommends consideration, excuse me, recommends against consideration of sub option B2, allow vessels to carry on board multiple gear types and use other gear outside the non-trawl RCA. The EC considers sub option B2 to be unenforceable. Alternative two, allow limited entry fixed gear vessels to operate in the non-trawl RCA when using approved hook and line gear. The EC has the same recommendations for the sub options as are noted under alternative one. Alternative three, reconfiguration of non-trawl RCA boundaries. As stated above, the EC prefers suggesting non-trawl RCA boundaries to opening the areas to additional fishing. We do have concerns about enforceability in some areas where the inner and outer boundary depth contours are very close, such as along a steep bank shelf with little separation, which makes monitoring with vessel monitoring systems ineffective. E6A, Supplemental WDF W Report 1. The EC has no concerns with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's proposal to adjust the seaward boundary of the non-trawl RCA off Washington. The EC is concerned about proposals that establish new gear-specific fishing areas. The EC appreciates the acknowledgement by WDFW that any area identified needs to be large enough to be enforced by VMS. Cowcod Conservation Areas. The EC has no concerns with including Cowcott conservation area changes to the range of alternatives. This concludes the EC statement. Um, thank you, Greg. Um, questions for Greg on the uh, EC report? Okay, seeing none. Thanks, Greg. Um, next up is uh, Corey Green uh, with the Habitat Committee report. Corey? Thank you, Vice Chair. Members of the Council, I'm reading agenda item E6A, Supplemental HC Report Number 1, the Habitat Committee Report on Ground Fish Non-Trawl Sector Area Management Measures. <clears throat> the Habitat Committee was briefed on Non-Trawl Sector Area Management Measures by Todd Phillips and offers the following comments. The HC considers Alternatives one and two, which would allow open access and limited entry fixed gear fisheries to use council approved hook and line gear, vertical long line jig and troll in the non-trawl rockfish conservation area as defined in agenda item E6 attachment A, attachment one. This would exclude the use of bottom long line dingle bar and pot trap gear in the non-trawl RCA. While hook and line gear can make contact with the seafloor, the effects on benthic habitats are likely minimal. The HC has no habitat-related concerns with the use of approved hook and line gear in the non-trawl RCA. Alternative three would reopen portions of the non-trawl RCA to all types of authorized non-trawl gear, including bottom contacting gears. There are multiple essential fish habitat conservation areas EFHCAs closed to bottom trawl, but not closed <clears throat> to fixed gear that are partially or completely encompassed by the non-trawl RCA. Removing or reducing the non-trawl RCA would subject sensitive habitats in newly opened areas to ground fish non-trawl fishing. The HC is concerned with the effects of alternative three on rocky reef habitat areas of particular concern. Detox. Particular. <laughs> oh, yeah particularly well, in EFHCAs. 
sleep. And <laughs> yeah, that sucks. Oh, is it downstairs, the uh, chilies? Part, figure one provides an illustration of how some EFHCAs would become open to fixed gear fishing should the non-trawl RCA be reduced. Under EFHCA protection for over 15 years, benthic habitats may be returning to pre-bottom trawling conditions. For example, recent surveys at Coquille Bank, an abandoned high spot EFHCA, by NOAA's deep sea coral um, group found that Gorgonian coral density had increased by 1,400% moving the seaward boundary of the non trawl RCA from 100 to 80 fathoms would remove Coquille Bank from, the non from within the non trawl RCA, therefore exposing it to fixed gear fishing. In addition, Coquille Bank provides the council with a unique opportunity to study long-term effects of bottom contact gear closures on habitat recovery and fish abundance, a research need the council has previously identified. This research opportunity could be compromised if fixed gear fishing activity were to resume in that area. The GMT's June 2020 report notes that the fixed gear sectors would primarily target fish in rocky habitats in areas opened by the narrowing of the non trawl RCA. Preliminary HC mapping indicates that a large portion of the rocky habitat in non trawl RCA is within EFHCA. Therefore, the HC supports habitat measures that continue to protect Rocky, Rocky Reef HAPCs in EFHCAs. The HC recommends adding an alternative or a sub-option to alternative three to keep the non trawl RCA closed to certain bond up contact gear, such as long line, dingle bar, and pot traps, in areas that currently overlap with EFHCAs if the non trawl boundary is modified as proposed under alternative three. Should the council include alternative three in the range of analysis alternatives, the HC offers additional recommendations to consider for a habitat analysis, mainly which were provided in previous HC reports on the non trawl RCA and the cow cod conservation area, summarized as follows. First, include new survey data from the Deep Sea Coral Research and Technology Program on coral and sponge distribution and seek assistance from that program to identify sensitive coral and sponge areas in the non trawl RCA. Include new seafloor mapping data for the habitat analysis and apply a substrate classification scheme that groups seafloor substrates into ecologically relevant habitats, such as boulder, uh, rock, cobble, gravel, sand, and mud to identify diverse habitats that can be more susceptible to disturbance. And finally, estimate the amount of anticipating fishing effort by bottom contact gear, habitat type, and EFHCA area in, proposed, in areas proposed to be opened by alternative three. And summarize the analysis by habitat gear, habitat type, and EFHCA within CCE biogeographic subregions. The HC is available to assist as needed. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Uh, questions for Corey on the Habitat Committee report? Okay. Um, seeing no hands, uh, thanks, Corey. Next, we'll go to public comment. And I think there's so oh, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I, I, with apologies, I, I would like to ask the GAP uh, one more question of their report, uh, about their report if possible. I'm sorry, I didn't, wasn't quick enough before. Uh, possible to ask them to come back? Yeah, I think they're available here. So Harrison or Dan? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Brad. Um, hi, Maggie. Hi, Harrison. Thanks very much. I noticed on um, page three of the GAP report under item number two at the top, the GAP believes it is unwise to consider changing the shoreward boundary of the RCA at this time. Uh, and then uh, looking down at the summary where the alternatives are listed at the very end of the document uh, shows the options for reconfiguring the boundaries have the shoreward boundary at 40 fathoms. I think that would be a change 
at least in some areas of the coast, including Oregon. So that seems like um, a conflict. Can you help me understand what the GAPS recommendation is? Um, yes, thank you, Maggie, for the question. Um, just to clarify, I believe you're right. Um, north of the 4010 is slightly different. Um, we kind of have two RCA boundaries, I guess you could say. Um, one for all gear types, which would be shoreward of 30 fathoms, and um, another one for hook and line only gear types, excluding bottom contact gear, which would be 40 fathoms and uh, shoreward. So when it comes to all gear types, I guess you are correct. That would be 30 fathoms, um, would be the inner boundary between the 4010 and the 46. Thank you very much uh, through the vice chair. Just to clarify, so the, the gap is recommending against considering uh, changing the shoreward boundary of the RCA where it currently is at 30 fathoms um, under uh, alternative three, looking at reconfiguration. And I, I think uh, maybe to help explain my question, I am um, considering the current and, and just north of 4010, the current shoreward boundary of the RCA is 30 fathoms. The current allowance for the use of certain gear types within, you know, uh, seaward of that out to 40 fathoms, I don't think has changed the, the definition of the RCA boundary. And I know this is really getting into the weeds, um, but I, I appreciate your your thought on this. And maybe um, maybe if I focused it like this, for alter for alternative three, reconfiguring the non trawl RCA boundaries, what would be the gaps specific recommendation for a shoreward RCA boundary for an action alternative north of forty ten? Uh, through the vice chair, thank you, Maggie, for the question. I understand that this gets kind of complicated. Um, um, I guess at, for all gear types, um, including bottom contact gear, uh, the shoreward boundary would be recommended to maintain status quo at 30 fathoms. Thank you. That really helps me understand it much better. I appreciate you coming back and answering. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Harrison, and thank you, Maggie. Okay, um, seeing no more hands, um, we'll go to public comment, and I believe um, Ben Enknapp, um is first, and I believe he has a presentation. Which uh, Sandra is uh, getting up right now. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Council. My name is Ben Enticknap, and I'm representing Oceana. Nine of 10 groundfish species previously declared overfished have rebuilt. <clears throat> Nevertheless, management measures that protect habitat, minimize bycatch, and prevent overfishing will continue to be corner conservation measures for sustainable fisheries. So as you consider modifications to the non trawl RCA, Oceana is requesting careful attention to minimizing adverse fishing effects to essential fish habitats, including habitat areas of particular concern and ecologically important and sensitive cold water coral and sponge ecosystems, and, and careful consideration of any actions that may increase bycatch, particularly yellow eye rockfish, which are still not yet recovered after being declared overfished in 2002. Next slide, please. Regarding habitat protection, it's widely accepted that the habitat impacts of bottom trawls are, you know, orders of magnitude greater than the effects of fixed fishing gears. However, when set in complex habitats, fixed fishing gears can have adverse effects. Uh, they can interact with coral and sponge ecosystems in several ways. Pots and traps can be dropped directly on top of the coral and sponge habitats or dragged over them during deployment and recovery. recovery. And similarly, long lines set in these habitats can become entangled during gear recovery. And here are just a few example photos of uh, fixed gear plus a, a trawl net 
wrapped in coral uh, from ROV surveys off the West Coast. Next slide, please. So alternatives one and two uh, that are before you uh, for the non-trawl sector area management measures would open the non-trawl RCA to fixed gears other than pots, long lines, and dingle bar gear. We support continued consideration of these alternatives and we support the gap recommendation to include bottom gill net gear and vertical set lines in the list of gears that would be excluded from these alternatives. Alternative three, however, would significantly narrow the non-trawl RCAs by about 11,000 kilometers squared coastwide and allow all hook and line gears into the reopened areas. Doing so would open EFH conservation areas and habitat areas of particular concern to fix fishing gears that contact the seafloor with potential adverse effects. So the maps that I'm showing here are examples off of Oregon showing how moving the seaward boundary from 100 fathoms to 75 fathoms would open Nehalem Bank, parts of the Garibaldi Reef north and south, south and in the other map, uh, Coquille Bank or the Bannon Hyde spot. And I just want to say that I'm amazed by the statement in the Habitat Committee report that coral density had increased by 1,400% at Coquille Bank. Clearly, uh, that, that's a really amazing discovery and careful attention should be given to the coral habitats um, in these areas. Also, at Arago Reef there, opening the nearshore boundary from 30 to 40 fathoms in the nearshore would open up uh, that whole nearshore side of, of the reef. And coastwide, about 25 EFH conservation areas would be partially or fully affected by this alternative. So our recommendation consistent with the Habitat Committee report is that if this alternative goes forward, that, there, that it be modified to keep EFH conservation areas overlapping the current non-trawl RCA close to bottom contact gears, at least as a temporary measure until there can be a comprehensive analysis of the effects on priority habitat features and why while yellow eye rebuild. Next slide. So regarding yellow eye, um, as you see in the, the map on the, the left, we're looking at modeled um, at predict, predicted abundance of yellow eye off of um, Hecata Bank area. And this, you know, deeper shelf and upper slope waters are really important yellow eye rockfish habitat. Um, also, you know, this is also an area where many of these EFH conservation areas are that have high relief, rocky features that um, are important yellow eye habitat. And so we just want to, you know, be real careful here and, and any changes that might end up uh, resulting in increased yellow eye by, bycatch. And this particular data set here would, I think, be something uh, that should be included and evaluated uh, if this alternative is going forward uh, to see how those affect, that might affect yellow eye catch. Next slide. Uh, regarding the Calcod conservation area, so under uh, E5 earlier today, it was recommended to consider repealing the Calcod conservation areas under this agenda item instead of doing it in the biannual management measure process. That recommendation came from both the GMT and, uh, and from NIMS. And I just wanted to say that we support adding an additional alternative to, to the non-trawl RCA agenda item here that would repeal the Calcod conservation areas off Southern California while keeping coral and sponge hotspots within the CCAs closed to groundfish fishing gears that contact the seafloor. At the last council meeting, uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife recommended that the council repeal the CCA while also taking steps to protect the most sensitive habitats. And since then, we've been working with the NOAA Coral and Sponge Program to gather all of the latest data on coral sponge presence. We've also uh, had two meetings with representatives of, of the commercial fixed gear fishery and Southern California recreational fishermen, plus CDFW to discuss the available data and to really you know, learn from each other about the areas of interest within the CCAs, areas of interest you know, from the perspective of coral and sponge hotspots, but also um, areas of interest uh, that are uh, places where the fixed gear fishermen and recreational fishermen would like to see opened. Uh, so, I, so far they've been productive discussions and we plan to continue to have these conversations over the winter and we hope to submit a joint proposal, you know, with boundaries for the March or April council meetings that would, you know, ultimately restore fishing opportunities in the CCAs uh, while protecting coral and sponge habitats. So next slide, please. 
And so here's just an, an example of you know showing where the CCAs are located and uh, the latest data from the NOAA Deep Sea Coral Program on the presence and locations of coral and sponge, as well as uh, rocky reef features. And next slide. And this is new uh, habitat mapping data, so high coral habitat suitability from modeling work that NOAA and BOEM have done to identify um, uh, high, high suitability for deep sea corals including the ones we're showing here, which are, are high, re high relief corals that are very sensitive, uh, Gorgonian corals and black coral. Next slide. So in, in conclusion, uh, you know, we support continued analysis of alternatives one and two, um, excluding long line dingle bar pot trap gear, as well as the, the bottom gill nets and the, uh, the vertical set lines and modifying alternative three to avoid EFH conservation areas that are known to be important for yellow eye, but also coral and sponge, and to have an additional alternative to repeal the cow cod conservation areas off Southern California while keeping coral and sponge hotspots closed. Uh, this is important work. And you know, as rockfish have rebuilt, uh, we do think it's important to increase opportunities, but just do it in a way that's careful, protecting habitat uh, and minimizing bycatch. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, question for Ben on this testimony. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, next up is uh, John Kepin. John, oh, Marcy Remco, I see you have a question. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger. Um, not so much a question, but I do want to acknowledge um, Ben's testimony here and his reference to the sidebar uh, meetings that we've been holding in California uh, regarding the CCA um, repeal, as he's recommended here in item three. Just wanted to um, acknowledge the, the work that Oceana's put into um, bringing the, the, the data streams into the discussions. Um, we agree they've been pr productive discussions and want to acknowledge uh, his reference to the plan for a joint proposal. Um, of you know industry and conservation um, that will hopefully be brought forward um, this spring uh, for further consideration. So just want to really acknowledge the the groundwork that's been done here and the commitment by all of the parties uh, to the collaborative effort. So um, thanks, Ben, for your testimony. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thank you, Marcy. Um, okay, next up is uh, John Kepin. Uh, John. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Co-Chair. Let me confirm that you uh, you can hear me. Oh, we can. Thank you very much. Um, I'm speaking on agenda item E6, uh, summary uh, situational summary summary for the non-trawl sector area management measures. Uh, I provided public comment earlier, and I just wanted to reiterate that. But um, but speaking on behalf of most of the uh, small, small vessel fleet in California. Um, we, we, in general, support what GAP's recommendations are, rather than getting into a long dissertation on why. Um, we envisioned a, a three-phase process in, in moving, uh, opening the RCA for uh, the uh, open access non troll sector, and that would be, as they have, as GAP has pointed out, is, is uh, doing the, the spec analysis on the existing RCA lines with which we are terming to be non-bottom contact gear. Functionally, that is uh, a rod and reel or a clapper reel or something uh, that the uh, salmon fishermen would use with their, uh, their, their girdies and their, and their davits. And it's pretty simple and has minimal contact uh, or effect on, 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 the, on the ground line. And so we're figuring, we're thinking that this is the fastest way to allow access to the RCA for the small boat fleet. Uh, I, would, I would go back to Todd's um, presentation. I, Todd, I don't recall exactly which page it was, but you were talking about the social economic um, um, impacts. 
uh, and you did include Half Moon Bay in, in that analysis. And Half Moon Bay is a really critical port to go back and, and review because it is it is the poster child for what uh, uh, a port can do when uh, off the dock sales are allowed, uh, particularly in, in a high population area like the San Francisco Bay Area. It was, it's allowing that port to access the RCA will have a significant impact on that fleet and fleet and the fleets around it, i.e. San Francisco, um, Santa Cruz, Moss Landing, and uh, Monterey, you know, will actually be able to help sustain those fleets. So again, we want to support the gap and uh, and, and their 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 proposal and, and would uh, encourage the council to move in that direction. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, questions for John on his testimony? Okay, seeing none. Um, move on to Daniel Platt, who um, had a, could not uh, testify today. So we'll go to uh, Harrison Eibach. Harrison? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, <clears throat> Brad. Uh, Council, thank you for letting me speak yet again on the non trawl RCA topic. Um, this is a really important issue right now. Um, it was very important before, uh, but now as we have come across these quillback and copper constraints coming up, um, opening up the non trawl RCA to certain gear types is crucially important to maintain opportunity. Um, I devote a lot of volunteer time to <clears throat> really try to ensure that we have opportunity for fishermen and not just all fishermen, but I truly care about the future fishermen, the younger fishermen. I mean, I myself started in an 18 foot skiff and slowly worked my way up through open access fisheries and slowly acquiring a salmon permit up to the little 42 foot boat I have now with a crab permit and whatnot. Um, through the years, I've been waiting patiently uh, many years in California to acquire nearshore permits. Uh, the deeper nearshore permits were unobtainable and not transferable for a long time until recently. And I am one of those fishermen that's going to lose uh, the access to these nearshore fisheries. And I see here that the Quillback ACL in 2023 between the 42 and the 4010, as of now, is 0 0.0198 metric tons. That is, that is literally 15 fish. I don't know how we're going to maintain any near shore fisheries with these copper and quillback constraints. So that being said, we truly need to move forward with this non trawl RCA, and. I understand that I always like to use the word, but it definitely doesn't seem to go along with the council process. Um, we really need to expedite this process in some way, shape or form to ensure that a lot of these guys have opportunities. You know, it may not be, some people may not view this as big money. Some people may not view this as, as a large volume fishery and which it's not, but it's, it's a way to ensure that some of these guys can survive and they need opportunities to survive. Even if it is a small amount of fish and they're fetching a premium price, it allows them to pay their bills, their boat bills. Um, it allows them to pay for their permits. I mean, the cost of getting into this industry for a young fisherman is excruciatingly painful. And we just need to maintain these opportunities. And if we are to continue to take away opportunities, we really need to make up for it by creating more. Um, otherwise, the vast majority of these younger fishermen, they don't have reason to continue to be in this industry. Um, a lot of the people that do have these nearshore permits in California, the active ones, a lot of them are the younger guys. And they paid a lot of money for these permits. And pretty soon, they're not going to be valuable and they're not going to be able to use them. So we need to make up for that loss of opportunity in some way, shape or form. And Myself, among others, truly believe that this is a good way. 
um, to create more opportunity to maintain some hook and line rockfish to hit the market. So um, see what we could do moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Harrison. Uh, questions for Harrison? Okay. Thanks, Harrison. And uh, we'll next go to Bill James. Uh, Bill? Yes, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, thank you very much. Members of the Council, my name is Bill James, and I'm, I'm not a 1997 Toyota truck. But uh, anyway, uh, moving along, um, to speak to a, a few things uh, with the biology, um, specifically to yellow light in 2023. It's, it looks like they're saying it's going to be at um, 0.39 of unfished. Uh, for the last update. Um, and that's uh, going to probably add another 10 metric tons to the ACL, so where we're at now. So um, I think there's going to be plenty of room to, uh, to um, put in uh, what uh, we're talking about into, into uh, being able to get out there. I want to appreciate uh, John Kevin for, uh, thank him for um, basically helping uh, you know, tell what the what kind of a gear we want to use, and it's it and uh, Harrison for um, the idea of the economic problems. Um, the amount of fish, in it, you know, we all know there's a lot that's out there to catch. Um, there was asked of how many how many people on each port do you think are going to use this? Well, our major constraint is developing markets that that buy the premium fish instead of the 50 cents a pound that the draw guys get. You know, minimum, um, our hook and line um, fish is such a premium fish that a $1.50, um, and generally, all the way up to $5 if you're selling out of the, out of the, uh, off the boat in, the, in a, uh, the city area. So that means, and I, I look, it, just conservatively, we have a thousand metric tons of extra fish that's floating around, um, and that's giving uh, plenty to the recreational of this midwater shelf stuff. And that comes out to thirty-three hundred dollars a metric ton. So eventually, it'll start slow, but as the market demand will rise, and it will, that could be thirty-three of uh, three million three hundred thousand dollars for that thousand metric tons. And if you sell it off the boat in the area of the, of the San Francisco up to five dollars a pound, you're going to get somewhere around eleven thousand pounds per metric ton. So that's some real money, eleven million dollars for the thousand metric tons. We're talking some really serious money that we need because we have been held back for years. I've been talking about this since two thousand two thousand and eight, uh, and. We need to restore our historical markets. And if we, you know, um, our port, Port St. Louis, is adding a marketing, a uh, fish marketer's um, um, place. Port Bragg is adding a fisherman's market. Um, there's other places that are getting started. So we need this fish. Um, the quill bath, uh, that eventually that will get turned around because it was just bad science. And we'll, you'll see that it's rebuilt. But... In the meantime, we need to get out there and have um, help our guys. You know, I'm 74. You know, I'm, I still want to fish. I really like to, I haven't been able to fish out there lately. So, uh, and the guys that are 18, or in case some of the people that are now working with their dads that may want to get into it. So it's important we show respect for the fish and the fishermen and the uh, communities, um, restaurants, most of this fish is going to go to restaurants. Uh, and the, the multiplier that a restaurant puts on the X vessel is another three or four times. It's amazing how much money will go to the community. I haven't had time to work it out completely, but um, I would say uh, that 33, uh, $3,300 for a metric ton to the fishermen would probably end up being somewhere around 15,000 to the community. 
So that's just for one metric ton. So um, I want to thank you for allowing me to speak. And hopefully my laryngitis, you can hear me. And uh, I'll get my car stopped uh, putting me in for uh, public comment. But I wanted to be on there anyway. Just my car just jumped in there. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Um, thank you, Bill. Uh, that's, that's my line. Um, any questions for Bill? Okay, no hands. Uh, thanks, thanks again, Bill. And that will bring us to a council discussion. And uh, so I'm looking for a hand. Ah, Maggie Summer. Maggie. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, boy, do I have a lot of discussion I'd, I'd like to get out, but I'm going to start um, with probably an unexpected question uh, for Todd if available, on um, something he said during his the staff presentation earlier. It caught my ear and I made a note about it and then didn't ask. So if Todd's available. Yes, I'm here, Maggie. Great, thanks, Todd. I, I recall that you said, uh, and I, I was on slide 24, but we don't need to pull it up, but you mentioned that uh, there was something that had found that seabirds did not seem to be attracted to artificial gear. Um, and I'm assuming that the implication there is that uh, as we move forward in this, we might be thinking about one potential mitigation measure for seabird impacts uh, could be to not allow bait and to require artificial lures only. I guess my question is is two part. One is is am I is that interpretation correct that that was what that was intended to mean? And two, d can you give us just a little bit more information? What gear type overall was that with long line gear uh, or something else? Yes, through the vice chair, um, Ms. Sommer. Um, so your first question, uh, as far as I understand, that is what well, the statement that I made is accurate. Um, so based on Oh, what is it? the EFP review that National Marine Fishery Service does, and hopefully Keely Kim is listening, that she could probably better explain their review process than I ever could. Um, when they look at uh, the EFPs for impacts to uh, endangered species or species of concerns, particularly in this case, short, uh, short tail albatross, um, it seems to appear that where artificial lures are used, that there is a lower likelihood of seabird interaction. Again, if there is, they're just, they, they realize they're not food, I guess, you know, to be, say it colloquially. Um, under the EFPs, using the uh, artificial gear, which like all of them, as I understand it, are, these EFPs, of course, that I'm referring to are the, uh, the non troll RCA EFPs, known as the Cook. Emily Platt and Lovewell, or Real Good Fish, EFPs. There were no seabird interactions um, noted. Uh, so, uh, looking back at, uh, or looking back, thinking back to my statement, um, I believe uh, that if um, if Keeley can back, you know, uh, reply again to us that. The council could consider a gear type, an artificial lure, as a potential mechanism that would, in theory, uh, if 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 I'm correct, hold true as uh, as non-attractive gear. Well, I, I hopefully that makes some sense to you and to the council. Um, yes, is Miss Kent available? Yes. Keely? Thanks, Todd. Um, I believe you covered it well. Um, yes, when we approved um, those EFPs, and yes, yeah, speaking collectively for the three non troll EFPs, we did evaluate whether or not the EFPs would um, change anything from the proposed action um, that we consulted on with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in that seabird um, biological opinion that we are under. And 
one of the pieces of that evaluation um, specific to these EFPs were that they were all using artificial bait. Um, and, you know, we know that um, baited hooks um, that are within the diving range of albatross um, create a risk for seabird bycatch. And so using, you know, what we know about risk um, for seabird bycatch um, in our fisheries, um, that's how we approach the evaluation of the EFP gear. I think it's important to note that, you know, as part of this, we want to hear from the council exactly what gear configurations we are considering because it will be a different evaluation um, if we're considering, if the council is seeking to consider baited hooks or something like that. Um, and that would be, you know, what we would look at once the council sets an ROA um, is evaluating all of our, in addition to all of the other pieces that we'll need to evaluate in the analysis, specifically evaluating what, whether the changes the council is looking to make um, create any different impacts that will need to be analyzed for any of our biological opinions. Okay, thanks, Keely. Um, for the discussion. Maggie Summer. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I think if I may, I will uh, share uh, a number of my thoughts at this point uh, after listening to all of the reports and the um, public comment and uh, hopefully uh, hear from some fellow council members in discussion. Um, I think overall, uh, to start with, I support the GMT suggested revisions to the purpose and need statement for this action and note that uh, if we add the, uh, the CalCAD conservation area to um, the action alternatives here, then we might need to add a reference to that in the purpose and need statement so that it's covered. I support moving alternatives one and two forward. Uh, without the sub-option for multiple gears on board as the EC recommended removing and the GAP and GMT supported that removal as well. And as the GAP pointed out, I believe the sub-option to fish only inside the RCA or both inside and outside the RCA is not needed. Uh, I, I believe that that distinction wouldn't matter if the allowed gear types were available for use inside and outside uh, the RCA. So um, I hope that someone will correct me if I'm mistaken on that. Um, I am thinking about the gap recommended description of allowed gears uh, and whether that is the best approach um, versus prohibiting specific gears. Um, fully appreciate the GAP's laser focus on um, making sure we have at least some of these action alternatives that can be implemented as soon as possible. And I am, I understand uh, and agree with the point that the EFP authorized gears, um, you know, keeping some alternatives narrowed to those are probably the best pathway for the quickest implementation. Um, I am wondering what happens if we include the GAPS request to consider allowing the EFP gears in the non-trawl RCA in the ground fish specifications and management measures process, uh, which, which I would support as potentially a quicker pathway to uh, to allowing that opportunity. Um, I don't, in my opinion, it does not seem that allowing those specific non-bottom contact gear types, which have demonstrated reduced impacts on yellow eye rockfish, for example, on benthic habitats uh, within the, the RCAs, that does not seem to be a huge analytical lift to me. Um, and I know that we will be uh, probably having some further discussions about that when we get to part two of E5, our ground fish management measures. But I am wondering if 
what that means for what to include in a range of alternatives uh, or not here. Uh, and I, I am assuming that we would include it in an, a range that's adopted here. And then if it is taken up in the specs package, then it can subsequently be removed from uh, this item if it is proceeding on another path. Uh, I'll, let me pause for a second. Maybe, Mr. Chair, I have a few more comments, but I've said a lot already, and I saw Keeley's hand just went up, and I, I wonder if I should give others an opportunity to speak for a minute before I offer my other thoughts. That uh, sounds good, uh, Maggie. Um, Keeley? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, I'd like to respond to, to Maggie's last um, part of her comments, um, and specifically the idea of moving um, the part of this action um, that is specific to the non-bottom contact gear into specs. Um, and I will say that it is very similar to our thoughts on all of the other new management measures um, and in the NIMS report that we pro provided under the specs um, agenda item. And, you know, I recognize um, the concern from the industry with the unfavorable stock res assessment results and the impacts that a rebuilding plan will have on the fishery. Um, and so do, so do not take lightly the, the fear um, that I have heard about what that will mean for the fisheries. But I still don't see a tie to January 1 and remain concerned with the overall specs workload um, and the ability not only for the council to finish the action by June, um, but also for my team to get the rulemaking done for January 1, 2023. I'll note one specific um, that we have not yet run down is that part of this action that has been discussed um, would, as the enforcement consultants has, have raised, potentially require some new declarations. Our declarations are under a Paperwork Reduction Act, um, as I think Everyone knows we have to um, apply for and receive approval to be able to collect any information from the public. So adding new declarations may trigger a PRA requirement where we need to go out and seek revision and additional um, authority to be able to collect that information. Those changes can take a while um, and on the very expedited pathway for rulemaking that specs has to happen on, I am concerned that we wouldn't be able to get those changes done in time, which would mean that these changes could not roll out January 1 and would create additional rulemaking hurdles for us to be able to make this happen. I think I can probably stop there, but just noting my concerns here are very similar to my concerns under specs, which is that you know, the workload really should be focused on what is absolutely necessary for January 1 and would encourage the council if it's something that is a high priority to look at the rest of the groundfish workload and move things around um, as, as is needed to make sure that it matches the council's current priorities. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Keely. Um, Marcy Rimko, Marcy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Maggie, for um, posing that question and Keely um, for responding to it. Um, I I thought I heard Maggie suggest that um, maybe an efficient pathway forward for the non-sector, non-trawl sector area management item in E6, um, noting that NIMS has been clear that this action will trail behind specs uh, by uh, one year, expected one year um, delay in implementation. Um, it would seem prudent um, at this point to keep the range of alternatives um, available to us in this item um, as broad as possible. Um, with regard to the concept of picking up um, some elements of RCA management uh, under E5, um, whether or not uh, they were on a list in E6, I, I, I believe that we have an obligation under E5 to make sure that our management measures are tailored to achieve our specifications. So 
I feel like that discussion um, is is somewhat of a separate uh, situation. Um, I see the the E6 train being somewhat you know a year behind, and that there's really no reason I think to um, be less inclusive in a range that we're developing here today, recognizing that it's uh, November of 2021. Um, I feel like um, there's not a lot of incentive to be removing items um, from this list at this time. So um, anyway, just wanted to, to chime in with my thoughts on this topic and um, appreciate the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Maggie Summer, Maggie. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you uh, to Keeley and to Marcy for the information um, and perspective on that. Uh, given that, I will intend to include alternatives one and two in a motion I develop for non troll RCA action. Um, I will also, uh, I also do support moving alternative three forward, uh, changing the non troll RCA boundaries, uh, but probably with a, a revision from the description in the uh, in attachment one to keep the shoreward boundary at 30 fathoms between 4010 and the Oregon Washington border, as I believe was recommended by the gap and clarified by Harrison in response to my question based on the uh, nearshore rockfish, quillback and copper in particular issues. I uh, will also be inclined to add either as a sub option for analysis or a required element, um, a prohibition of bottom contact non trawl gear use in groundfish EFH conservation areas. Um, I will say I am also considering whether to include an alternative for uh, more complete reopening of the non troll RCA in the range for analysis now, also with an exclusion of bottom contact gear from EFH conservation areas, if analysis and implementation can be phased and it would not delay progress on the previous alternatives, uh, again, the, the phased approach described in the gap, I believe the incremental approach as they called it. Um, in terms of my, my mention of uh, interest in uh, continuing to exclude, or pardon my, my interest in excluding non troll bottom contact ground fish gear from EFH conservation areas, uh, it is my understanding that this could be done through this action. Uh, I know there have been some sidebar discussions on what the, you know, whether that could be included in the scope of this action and how that could be accomplished. Um, and I guess I, I would be interested in hearing a little bit more from the National Marine Fisheries Service on our uh, scope to be able to consider changes to gear types uh, allowed in or excluded from the EFH conservation areas, um, wholly all EFH conservation areas or just those areas, portions of them that overlap with the non troll RCA and could be reopened. Uh, I only have one more comment that might um, be engender some, some further discussion and response. I'll just put my other comment out there on the table. Uh, so, so then I, I'll be quiet for a little bit and would love to hear from others. I wanna acknowledge that monitoring is a big issue uh, in increasing access into the non trial RCA for this fleet with uh, very low, in general, low observer coverage rates, uh, et cetera. And I would be interested in exploring ways to increase observer coverage if possible, understanding that uh, at this time, there don't seem to be new resources available to the observer program, uh, but would 
seek to better understand trade-offs, for example, among increasing observer coverage in, in uh, this sector compared to others or other options for increasing the monitoring and accountability with increased access to these areas. Um, with that, I, I think I've gotten many of my big thoughts out on the table and will appreciate uh, any discussion or, or thoughts that other council members have to share. Um, and uh, I would not be prepared to offer a motion on this item uh, until Sunday. Okay. Thank you, Maggie. And uh, I see Keeley uh, has her hand up in, I think, in response to your, uh, your question. So, Keeley? Thanks. Yes, I do have a response to your question about the um, EFH. Um, we, this has been raised through this a um, couple days ago through this meeting, um, so we have been looking into it. Um, we're not aware of um, regulations restricting all changes related to EFH to consideration during a full EFH review. Um, the regulations that uh, 50 CFR Part 600 sub Subpart J actually do contemplate interim revisions between reviews, um, allowing changes of EFH areas. Our understanding is the potential option contemplated here would be limited to EFH areas currently closed to bottom trawl, which would otherwise be opened up to pot and longline gear through this action. We would view that as within the scope of the action at hand if the council wanted to consider moving those, um, what is currently protected under a non-trawl RCA um, closure to being an EFH closure inclusive of pot and longline gear. Um, Maggie did suggest um, possible other changes, um, and I would want to reevaluate my statements if we were talking about making additional EFH changes that are outside of the scope of what would otherwise be opened up with these non-trawl boundary changes. Um, so I'm, I'm restricting my comments to that, that smaller ask um, that we have heard earlier in this meeting. Thanks. Okay, thanks Keely for that uh, clarification. Okay, um, anyone else? Uh, Bob Dooley, Bob. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Maggie, thank you so much for that thoughtful comments there and many others. I I think we're on the right path of, of considering this for sure. Uh, this sector is, you know, that really needs some help. I mean, we've got a crab season that's a disaster. There's looking to be that way. Have a salmon season potentially coming up again that doesn't look very good, although they didn't do too bad locally here this year. Um, it, we're in our small boat fishermen are in big trouble and we need some help on this. So I think we're going down the right path. I will reiterate that we need to do this sooner than later. I, I, there's been mention of incremental approaches of, of ways to get access to those grounds in a, in a quicker way. But I, but I also agree with you, Maggie, on your comment about monitoring um, we got to remember that a lot of the uncertainty that is attached to not being monitored, not having accountable fisheries is what got us, a lot of us here in this to begin with. That's why we've been out of there for 20 years, a big, big reason, at least in my opinion. So I think we need to revisit that. And I think we need to do it incrementally. We hear about logbooks coming with the, the seabird mitigation. mitigation. The sooner the better, in my opinion, and mandatory. It would help us to understand uh, and compare uh, observed trips to non-observed trips. I think it merits some analysis here to see how we can incrementally uh, approach this. But I think th there's no doubt in my mind that 5% observer coverage is not enough. I think we need to know, you know, this week has shown us what lack of data does and uncertainty with these, with the new overfished designation. I believe we really need to add, to have a full suite of, uh, of alternatives analyzed for this monitoring and how they might be implemented over time to get us where we need to go. 
but I think the low hanging fruit here is is probably increased our observer coverage at least, um, and getting logbooks as quick as we can. Um, so I think I'll stop there. I appreciate it, but I just wanted to make sure that it was being considered, and I was very happy to hear you include that in your in your statement. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Okay, anyone else? Uh, Phil Anderson, Phil. Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I just wanted to offer a few, um, hopefully short comments about uh, Debbie's DFW's proposal. Um, I appreciate the consideration that both the GAP and the GMT uh, have given to it uh, up to this point. Um, I think we are in a we're in a different situation here in Washington um, than than in Oregon and California, and in particular, in my mind, relative to the the need to get uh, something done quickly because of the of the loss of um, really important fishing opportunities due to some of the, the stock assessments that were just adopted and rebuilding plans that are really going to be difficult to meet. We have a couple of, the, of, of similar uh, challenges in the north, uh, but vermilion rockfish relative to our recreational fishery is going to be really challenging. Um, but um, uh, the, um, the recreation, the, what I call the deep water recreational fishery out of out of Ilwaco and Westport and Lapush and Nia Bay has really changed and expanded over time. And so uh, as, as we consider the potential of modifying our non-trawl RCAs, uh, uh, we're gonna have to keep, I believe we're gonna have to keep real close eye on, on doing it in such a manner that doesn't create conflict between our recreational and commercial sectors I think there are some opportunities to do that, uh, but I think there's a lot of discussion and work uh, yet to go before uh, we're gonna have something that's specific that we could bring forward. At least that's my opinion. Uh, I noted both in the gap and as well as the GMT, uh, the thought that uh, the, the WDFW um, proposal would be on a separate track and, and I support that. I don't, uh, would not want um, uh, our, our, our process to slow down um, uh, what's being contemplated in the South where, uh, it, at least in my mind, there's a, um, uh, a need to do something expeditiously, at least expeditiously as possible. Uh, so I just wanted to um, offer those comments and those cautions and, and concerns, at least from my my perspective, um, and I look forward to engaging with our uh, stakeholders off Washington in the coming months if if this uh, proposal is is advanced for uh, future development. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Corey Niles. Corey. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, and, and thanks, Phil, for those comments. Um, and before I lose my train of thought in hearing Maggie's um, speaking to, to needing more time, I think we would also, we would support that and appreciate the time for Sunday. But just adding to a couple of things that Phil said, um, and hear, hearing what the gap, uh, uh, the message of the gap said and uh, the EC, I, I think I think Phil captured it well that, you know, we, um, in terms of the gap, uh, need look, their incremental approach idea. We, my point here, we do not intend to to slow this down, um, to slow the changes down in the other areas of the coast. And and everyone's spoken the importance there. We're contemplating simpler changes, but as Phil just said, we're, we're, these these won't. We're not in a hurry. This will take some time to have the discussion. So, just want to recognize the uh, what, what the gap is saying and and echoing that Washington is a different situation, and 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 the changes aren't as um, urgent and 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 it will take time and we don't we don't intend to to slow anyone else down but yeah, I, I don't have much more to add than what mr. Anderson said at this point 
but yeah, it also would appreciate holding off until until Sunday to 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 get to final recommendations here. Okay, thanks, Corey. Anyone else? Well, I think that the um, going to Maggie had to say that um, the motion, at least for, for Maggie, will probably come on the will come on Sunday. And I assume many other motions probably will be the, will probably happen then too. So I would think that the goal here is to get as much discussion out of the way and get people's thoughts out now, so we can have some nice clean motions to be um, to be uh, given on uh, on Sunday. Um, Corey, writing is Corey. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, just some short thoughts here. Um, in general, this. This really needs to move forward. So thanks to staff who really sunk their teeth in and gave us a good start. Um, and as noted by the gap under this agenda item in the last and by public comment today, including Mr. Keppen and Mr. Ibach, it's critically important that we continue to pursue access opportunities for communities, especially here in California. Um, we need to do so quickly while meeting our conservation obligations. Um, and as noted, this is critical to the small boat fleet, especially so. Thanks to, to Bob and Maggie and others for seek, speaking to this. I'm, I won't elaborate. Um, in terms of meeting the state of purpose and need of this, um, which I, I spoke to kind of tangentially earlier, which includes things like diversifying fishing strategies, providing more stable fishing opportunities, and bringing financial benefit to fishermen and communities. Um, I, I'd like to see more social and economic analysis provided to help um, better understand alternatives that, that come out of this um, this action, um, and, and thanks to council staff earlier for offering to do this in response to my question. Um, specifically thinking about, you know, how do these proposed alternatives impact individual income diversification? Um, how will the pro proposed alternatives impact port level revenue consolidation? Um, I'm hoping to get a handle here on how this might impact infrastructure and community stability, um, and just, you know, in light of how Important. This is likely going to be to California communities really trying to um, speak to how important it is to have this information to provide it to the council to make these decisions. Um, I, I also wanted to speak of the need to be thoughtful about reopening previously closed areas and ensure that habitat that's critical for healthy fish populations and overall ecosystem health are protected. Thanks, Maggie, for, for thinking about including a no bottom contact gear and existing EFH. Um, and as this moves forward, encourage staff to address the concerns raised in the Habitat Committee report, especially regarding corals, um, and utilize the data and approaches recommended in that report. So um, thanks, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Maybe this was a little, little early to, to put out. I look forward to, to seeing the um, draft motion on Sunday, and, and thanks very much. Well, thank you, Corey. Um, OK, anybody else? All right. Well, with that, um, I think the plan here, at least, unless someone, nope, Chuck Tracy, Chuck. Thanks, Chair. Um, just a question on timing, I guess. I've heard Sunday tossed around a lot uh, as far as uh, bringing this back in front of the council. Um, so uh, I guess I would like to, uh, just for planning purposes, know if, the, if we should plan on starting with our administrative matters uh, first thing is and then picking this up with the other ground fish items um, after those administrative items are closed uh, are concluded or if you had something else in mind and I guess that would be um, I would ask so. uh, Maggie Well, Vice Chair, I don't know if you were going to ask me, but it makes no difference to me. So I leave it to your judgment and Director Tracy's judgment. Okay, well, thank you. Be, you're the motion maker, or we're going to at least have one of them. Um, Mark, Chair Grelnick, Mark? Well, I was just thinking that it might make sense to keep the ground fish items together since we, uh, when it comes to a support staff and whatnot um, 
So if it makes no difference to anyone else, I would suggest we start with administrative on Sunday and then um, have the ground fish together. Uh, in other words, uh, pick up E6 um, b before we start the other ground fish items. Just my two cents. Well, thanks, Mark. And this sounds pretty good. And probably while you're chairman. Okay. Um, seeing no hands and saying anything okay, going that direction, um, I would think we're done today uh, on this agenda item and we'll table it until uh, Sunday, sometime afternoon or maybe late morning. And uh, with that, Chair Gorelnik, I will pass the gavel back to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger. Uh, Pete Hasmer has a hand up. Pete. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. But just a point of order, um, because we are uh, ceasing discussion of this and taking up other uh, options or uh, agenda items, uh, is the proper step here to have a motion to table this mm -hmm. or suspend discussion? I don't know what the right term is, or uh, can we just do it with a head shake? Well, we often will table a pending motion. We have no pending motion. Um, and we have precedent for breaking up an agenda item, but maybe uh, Dr. Hansen has a suggestion. Well, and there's no problem with splitting stuff up or taking up at different times, but the motion is to postpone, forget table. Postpone and hopefully to a time certain, but it doesn't have to be. All right, well, if we don't have to, then maybe we won't unless someone feels strongly about it. Thank you, Dave. Um, so with that, let me, uh, before we deem um, things concluded, I'll turn to one or both of our executive directors for any announcements. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, I think, I think we've, uh, um, had the discussions necessary here today. Uh, this agenda item will uh, be suspended until uh, we meet on Sunday and take up ground fish uh, items. So we will start Sunday with administrative items, uh, go through those, and then proceed to uh, the remainder of this item and, and our other two ground fish <coughs> items, and hopefully uh, be able to get through all that uh, by Sunday afternoon. Um, I don't think I have any other uh, announcements. I would just say that uh, uh, I hope people uh, are able to take tomorrow off. Please, uh, please do uh, rest up and um, we'll see you all on Sunday. Well, I hope at least the GMT gets a few hours off. They always seem to be working every day, but all right. So we uh, will see everyone back at 8 a.m on Sunday morning um, for what will hopefully be our last full day of this meeting. Um, and hopefully we won't have to put anything over until Monday, but you never know. All right, everyone, uh, enjoy your evening and enjoy tomorrow. We'll see you on Sunday.